thing as well. Okay. It's not inexpensive to come to Africa. It's mm -hmm. a major um, funds outlay. Mm -hmm. uh, and mm -hmm. so a lot of people find that prohibitive. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing mm -hmm. is we haven't been taught to love ourselves the way that we should. And um, so then you get the attitude, well, I don't want to go there, mm. you know. Um, what do, what do you and, the, and the other part is our inability to make that connection, yeah. okay? Only because I did my mother's DNA did we find out more specifically mm -hmm. that she came from Ghana. Mm -hmm. My oldest sister did um, uh, a DNA report previously and it was just more general. Yeah, that mm -hmm. was earlier that was in the genome project. That was earlier. Right. And the only thing they could give me was uh, a region. A trace, yeah, a trace of the um, migration mm -hmm. across the continent and then but no specifics. Mm -hmm. She has more specifics. Yeah, and now that you have more specifics, you have more interest. Because as I said, you know, I'm able to track it and I'm at the slave journals right now. Yeah. So you have to do a lot more digging and mm -hmm. there are resources there are in the uh, libraries, there are actual uh, societies mm -hmm. and they've done this before so you know you have to connect yourself with that organization mm -hmm. and and just use Freeman's Bureau there's a lot of resources it's a lot of work though it's yeah. it's not easy but the desire to reach out is so much better when you have that DNA and you mm -hmm. can specifically make that connection mm -hmm. so you can go there you know I was approaching it from this part okay. now I can approach it from mm -hmm. the Ghanaian part mm -hmm. and so yes. and, and that gives me a broader reach I, I, yeah, I also feel like the transatlantic slave trade component runs deep. Mm -hmm. And so we've been separated all across the world. And like my mother said, we were literally taught to not appreciate who we authentically are mm -hmm. and where we come from. So therefore, Africa is projected to us in a certain way. So we don't want to claim that's where we're from. Mm -hmm. um, and that has to be renamed and restructured mm -hmm. so that we can begin to have our ancestry trace. Yeah, I wanted to ask you, Cindy, since you are the younger generation, <laughs> wanted to know, so what are you putting in place? Because soon they will be out and then you would start building your generation to what would you do for you those coming after you to have that feel that this is where they belong to and sometimes even resettling to african countries and what do you have in mind what do you plan on doing so my mother when i was in sixth grade so about 12 years old mm. she sent me um to south africa with people to people mm. student ambassador and we program and we spent maybe about a month in South Africa at the time and I was only 12 years old. That isolated um, memory for me has been lasting and it shaped, I'm 35 now, it shaped me into who I am today. So I've always had this quest for Africa. Mm -hmm. I ended up going um, to graduate school to study Pan-African Studies. Okay. Um, I've been to Senegal and now I'm here and so I I have this yearning to find out exactly where I'm from mm -hmm. and to to pass it on to my children mm -hmm. and to end up you know going back or perhaps moving back one day and I think it's my responsibility having had a mother who instilled that into me to pass it on to the children I teach so that they can one day do the same thing so what I do is I am right now actually my students are um, they are studying African fables um, and we've studied Africa um, and the different continents and tribes and we've taken like Anansi the spider yes. and we're reenacting the, those things and we, we we're looking at videos of Africa so that they at I teach elementary age um, children at that age can develop start developing their love for it yes. and then it'll grow as they grow mm -hmm. and so hopefully that little part of um, you know interest I invoke into them they it will follow them the rest of their tenure in school yes. so that's, that's very important mm -hmm. we have in the United States I'm sure you have it here too a canon we yes. call it the canon mm -hmm. Um, and it's been very difficult, first of all, to get 
African American writings into the canon. Okay. And so um, they've been forced into the canon. So now, now that you see what what you must read to be considered educated, mm -hmm. you know, so we have some African American authors there. But we need some African. Yeah. African, Ghanaian, yeah. we need more names yeah. in the canon that are African. Um, one reason everybody wants to go to London is because most of the authors are English yeah. in the canon. Yeah. Okay. And so that's what you're reading. Mm -hmm. you know? And so what Cindy has done is very important because yeah. There are other stories out there, believe it or not. Yeah, that's true. When she was talking about Spider Man, right, exactly. I don't say as, as a very rich history of mm -hmm. folk tale in Africa right, and in right. Ghana, for instance, right. and we couldn't even develop it to the extent that it is now foreignized. Right. Mm -hmm. Spider Man, right? Yes. Of course, these wow. to push us things. a lot of right. things. Mm -hmm. and we right. need the wisdom from Anna and right. all the things that when right. we were young we were taught. Yeah. Yeah. And these are some of the things that they are lacking because they are not here with right. us in right. Africa. And that's that's the sad part. Mm -hmm. In America the children reference Spider-Man yes. but don't equate it with it being a Nazi yeah. the spider. Mm -hmm. yeah. Another thing that was stolen from Africa mm -hmm. that is claimed as something totally different. Mm -hmm. yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. In case you just tune in, this is AU Talks. We'll go for a short break, and when we come back, we'll continue with our discussion. You can watch us live on Association of African Universities on Facebook and YouTube, and also on TV at aau.org. Stay tuned. Botswana Accountancy College is a business school that was set up over two decades ago to contribute towards the human capital development in Botswana and beyond. BAC has over 20 years diversified its product portfolio to offer accounting, business, leisure, management and ICT related programs at undergraduate and postgraduate levels, as well as consultancy short courses to augment professional skills. In achieving this diversification, the college has partnered with UK-based universities of Durban Sunderland and Sheffield Hallam University, as well as professional bodies such as SEMA, Beaker, AAT, ACCA, CIA, Cisco, Microsoft, SAP, ESA, and SIPS to allow our graduates to have a globally recognized qualification and be globally competitive. To learn more about BAC, contact us on 3953062 in Gaborone or 2410558 in Francistown or visit our website on www.bac.ac. Also, you can visit our social media pages on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. BAC, celebrating over 20 years of creating business leaders. Welcome back to AU Talks. We are talking about the diaspora as a resource to Africa's development. Um, we are talking about you coming down to Ghana and we acknowledge that when the full circles came to Ghana, there was a lot of improvement in our economic resources, especially because they invested in the tourist sites mm -hmm. and all of that. And so we wanted to know, are there policies that, that attract you to come to Africa? Or you just come because maybe you found your route that you are coming? So are there existing policies like that to attract the diaspora to come and look into Africa over there? Well, one thing, um, a lot of people will c come to Africa mm -hmm. um, and they'll come back and say, well, my church built a well, yes. or, or my church bought mm -hmm. a generator. Um, one thing I would like to see is some kind of central place. Mm -hmm. For example, when I was coming here, I wanted to find if there was an American church here, you know, the, yeah. some, sometimes Americans come here and actually form congregations. Mm -hmm. And so that was, I was unable to find that. Mm -hmm. um, someone said, well, you have to call every church. I, I wish there was some kind of central place um, where there was a listing of what's been done, mm -hmm. also what needs to be done. Yeah. Sometimes the stars come and they say, oh, I went to Africa and I began a school, I started a school. Yeah. Um, so when they say Africa, they're not it's saying, like, is it Senegal, is <laughs> right. it yeah. Ghana, so is huge, it Nigeria? Yeah. Where is it? You know, I would like to see, and I also would like to see that central thing because I might want to start to, to fund something. Mm. 
So I, I live in the United States. I'm, I'm not sure what you need in Ghana. Mm -hmm. But perhaps there is something in Ghana that I could actually rally my friends around. Mm -hmm. And we could fund that, come here and do that thing. Yeah. Um, we have no way of knowing um, what we can do. You know, we have resources. Mm -hmm. I keep telling people African Americans are not poor. Yeah. There was a time we were poor. Yeah. <laughs> Um, we are not poor, yeah. um, and we can. And there's so many fundraising um, outlets yeah. in America that if we wanted to fund a project, say, like I was thinking about um, the stalls where the the vendors are. Mm. If we wanted to build stalls for them, um, there should be some way that we connect could connect with someone yeah. and say. We want to come there and build stalls. Yeah. Who who do we see about that? How much would that cost? Who will we need? We don't have that kind of resource. I do don't know, know about um, U.S., but I know the foreign affairs have the diaspora section mm -hmm. where they normally organize programs for the diaspora. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether you invested mm -hmm. in that area. Mm -hmm. At least you will know what is going on and how you could help. So right. the foreign affairs session of the um, have a diaspora mm -hmm. session where you can go and there are so many things that we could do you could do to help mm -hmm. yes. because um, yeah as you said you are very rich <laughs> and we know who very you know. rich <laughs> okay, <not laughs> because very rich. Like, black Americans control the entertainment and yes. 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 Wow. Yes, exactly. and that's, that's yeah. a huge investment exactly. right. yeah, so you have someone that like Oprah comes yeah. She says, I built a school yeah. in Africa. Mm -hmm. And in the African American's mind, that doesn't translate to a country in a city. Exactly. It just con it's just it's like Africa. Continent. Right, mm -hmm. the entire continent. You know, it, it, does, it doesn't have the true meaning yeah, of location. I, I find it intriguing when they say, I'm going to Africa. Africa. Yeah, exactly. Right. Mm -hmm. Where in right. Africa? Mm -hmm. Right. We have right. about 54 right. states. Right. 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 Exactly. Right. Exactly. Right. Where exactly. are you going? Mm -hmm. and, and you know what else I would like is if there was a connection like for family reunions mm. to come as a group. Yeah, if we could have a central point here yeah. and for people, especially when they find out their DNA, yeah. you know, they can just come and make a connecting yeah. point. Mm -hmm. And that would just be an excellent uh, long-term, short-term, you know, mm -hmm. trip. Yeah, mm -hmm. and um, I think the, the full circle, I'm, I'm sure it's, it's, it would be a yearly thing. Right. Mm -hmm. I'm sure it's somehow expensive because those who are coming are affluent. Mm -hmm. They right. have their mm -hmm. own money. So I, I'm sure people can get involved with that. Mm -hmm. And so with that, the visa processes and all of that are being relaxed so that they can come and enjoy what is in Ghana. And so since you are here and since you've, you've come here, I would want to ask again, what has been your perception? Has it changed or it is still somehow? Yeah. Well, you know, someone asked me what my expectations were and I told mm -hmm. them I didn't have any. Okay. okay? I didn't want to come with preconceived okay. um, because I didn't know. I had no idea what to expect. Mm -hmm. um, I can make a connection of what's happening here mm -hmm. to any city in the United mm -hmm. States. Okay. Um, just Cindy and I were talking about it this morning on the way in. Uh, you know, there are sections. There are affluent sections. Yes. There are uh, less affluent <laughs> sections. Um, so, I mean, we can just match mm -hmm. apple for apple. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it really is the same. It's just the volume of people. It's different mm -hmm. in the cities, but if we were in New York, it would probably be normal for them. We were comparing to New York yesterday. Okay. Yeah. That would be very normal for New York with that volume. So it depends on just like which region you're yeah. in. Um, coming from, I'm in Charlotte now. Okay. So Charlotte is a smaller, mm -hmm. and Pittsburgh was even smaller. Mm -hmm. Okay. But when my daughter, my daughter went to Columbia, so when I would go in New York, <laughs> it was just like, it was exactly what is happening yeah. every day. Every day. Even the traffic. <laughs> the, the the challenging the traffic here is just like <laughs> I, and that's something I did not expect I expected to come to a city just like because having been to Africa before yeah. you know I, those preconceived notions that a lot of um, Americans or people across the world 
think about Africa. I did not have. So I just expected to be in a normal city. I did not expect yeah. the traffic. traffic. <laughs> oh <my laughs> I, I did not. You're in the wrong city. Yeah. <laughs> yes, you need to go to the smaller region, mm -hmm. which the traffic is quite moderate. Mm -hmm. But this is the capital city, and so it is expected. <laughs> yes. <laughs> really expected. Yeah. It's so bad. The traffic is so bad here. But we are improving our road systems. Mm -hmm. And so I'm sure by the time you come back, we'll be good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So anything to talk on that your perception? Is well, it, has it been positive or negative? Oh, well, this is my third trip to the continent. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the first time in Ghana. Um, mm -hmm. But I was impressed mm -hmm. with the roads. Mm -hmm. um, because... Um, of course, in South Africa, it's a lot like America, but a lot is rural, you know. Um, Accra is so cosmopolitan. Yeah. So I was, um, I was really impressed with. I mean, it's a lot of traffic, but the roads are smooth. There's no yes. potholes. I don't even see accidents the, though. There's, there's very few accidents. <laughs> there should be. I, I'm telling, there I'm should telling be you, we, we are driving and we'll go in another lane and come back. I was just like amazed at how close these cars were, and there have been no accidents the whole time. I'm yeah, just we like didn't amazed. Run into anything. And yeah. also, our driver went around the potholes. You guys might not have seen it, but he went around. He was taking very good care of us. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. people are extremely polite yeah. oh my out gracious polite. respectful <laughs> yeah. it is just oh I'm you know I'm I, okay you know, I mean you, you just it's 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 in, it's it, it's a, it's part of the DNA yeah <laughs> it, and it is it, and it feels comfortable it feels normal it's mm -hmm. a, we should be that courteous yeah all the time it shouldn't even when they're this close yes <laughs> they're courteous yeah. right right <laughs> right so that was how we were brought up I'm yes. Sure that is how you're also bringing up your Jota. Uh, not <laughs> quite. We have something called road rage. Yes. Oh, yes. yes. It's road rage. In the US, road rage. Yes. yes. People actually shoot other people over traffic. Yes. So it's so nice to come here and there's no rage. No. Mm -hmm. No one's giving you the finger. Mm -hmm. No one's hopping out their car and yeah. banging on your window. Yeah. That happens it's one or twice. Well, right? <laughs> but we didn't see not it. <laughs> One they were acting good for the company. One or two, because <laughs> normally when you hit someone's car, you would be in so much trouble. Okay. You don't uh -huh. want to be spending a lot of money, <laughs> right. because sometimes the person has not insured the car. You don't want to take that responsibility. Right. And so you need to be careful, right. extremely careful. And so AAU, the APES of African Education, Higher Education, we are interested in the diaspora because we know there are things that you can do to help universities. Mm -hmm. How can the diaspora help Africa education in your own small way, in your own terms? I'm, How can we benefit? I'm very interested. So coming here, when I left home, a lot of people said, Cindy, can you please get me some fabric? Okay. That everybody wanted fabric. They wanted it from the continent. They wanted fabric. And I said yes. When we go to these markets, so much stuff. So much beautiful stuff. And I think that it's imperative for us studying entrepreneurship mm -hmm. to come to the continent and gift it back. Like, because... In Ghana alone, you guys are selling everywhere yeah. things that we don't have access mm -hmm. to. And if I could at home get on the internet, yeah. look for a specific company yeah. at the market and order my six yards of fabric and have it sent to me, yeah. I think that will, will help with econ economics, right, yeah. for yeah. your country. And so I think... Um, if we're studying it in college, and it's so much um, like programming in D.C. alone for black businesses and small businesses, mm -hmm. if we give back what we've learned yeah. mm -hmm. and help people set up to be available and have access to you guys internationally, mm -hmm. then that would be of major help mm -hmm. to the African region. 
um, you know, my daughter is currently at Harvard getting her MBA, and at the conclusion of her first year, they're going to apply what they learned. They're going to New Delhi. They're going to Thailand <laughs> and Taiwan, and they need to come to Ghana. Mm -hmm. I mean, that yeah, needs exactly. to be one of the one of, the one of exactly that, that needs to be. I, I mean, I will talk to her mm -hmm. and see how that can happen. But if you add your name to that list, because yeah. every class, yeah. that's what mm -hmm. they do. She mm -hmm. said, "Mommy, it's eighty percent travel." Mm -hmm. She did go to Egypt, but it was for pleasure. It wasn't part of the curriculum. Okay. But if it's eighty percent travel, you should be a part in that eighty yeah. percent somewhere. Yes. Yeah, yeah, we had a perception about Egypt that, oh, terrorists, mm -hmm. what can, so you're supposed to be scared, and we had the opportunity to visit there in March, mm -hmm. and it was beautiful. Mm -hmm. We go to the airport and said, are we in Africa? <laughs> because it was beautiful. We thought we were outside. Everything is good. You walk on the street, six-lane street, mm -hmm. flyovers everywhere. So minimum traffic, beautiful buildings, mm -hmm. the architecture is so beautiful. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then we were in our corners thinking that Egypt is scary because yeah. of how the exactly. Western media has painted exactly. Egypt right. to foreigners. And so people are even scared to invest in Egypt. But this is a country where you can freely live and there is no problem. They are an Islamic country. But you are a Christian, you can live like yeah, how exactly. you want to yes. be. There is so much freedom, but they tell us, no, don't go to yeah, Egypt. Right. Right. It's so scary because there has been one or two at the Sinai. But it happens, and where you stay, sure. why is it not painted in that way? And so we would want to encourage, since mm -hmm. you are here, since yes. you come mm -hmm. here, to also spread the good news of Africa. Absolutely, yes, for sure. Spread we definitely have to change the narrative. Yeah. Um, yes. And you were asking what could we do, that. Mm -hmm. but one thing you all could do yeah. um, is make sure we get your literature, sure. you know. Um, I don't know, but there's a New York Times bestsellers list, maybe we need an Africa bestsellers yeah. list, yeah. Yeah. Um, to make sure that we get your literature because that's how we learn a yes. lot of An things. interesting thing is that our literature is only just about 1.2 million of mm. all the literatures in the world. Yeah, wow. yeah. And that is so scandalous. Yes. 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 And you can't reference those mm -hmm. because we are not even interested in that. Mm -hmm. We want the Karl Marxists, those who are dead and then don't even know mm -hmm. what is going on. Mm -hmm. right. Right. That is what we are looking mm -hmm. at. And so it's time now, I think we look into ourselves mm -hmm. and believe in what exactly. we are doing. And exactly. so the African Union has the Agenda 2063. They give a, a guidelines to what we want Africa to be in mm -hmm. the next 50 years. And so they titled it The Africa We Want. Mm. It's such an interesting document mm -hmm. that when you go through a hard seven salient point where you could see that they want to bring the realness of Africa yes. right. into that. And so we are encouraged all of us to go read the Agenda mm -hmm. 2063. And that is what the AAU is doing now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We use the stocks to promote the Agenda 2063, the Continental. We have our own educational <laughs> strategy, right, right, right. right? Yes, which we are doing. But we still talk about the UN goals, the SDGs. Sure. We don't talk about the Agenda mm -hmm. 2063. Mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. And so it's like our priorities are not in sync with what we do for ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so we are glad that you are here yes. and to help us and so before we go we'll give you the last words okay. we will start with Sharon Sharon what do you want to say <laughs> from I, I like that yes yes well one of the things I want to say as, as I listened to my sister and she talked about the information we received yes. uh, we have to research it ourselves mm -hmm. okay we have to be the source we have to take responsibility and get the information ourselves and make the connection because um, it is out there we are connected, and we can't have anyone else be responsible for our history. Mm -hmm. It is our history, and we have to take ownership of it, and we have to make sure it is uh, expressed accurately mm -hmm. and not skewed. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. I just want to say that to Africans and Africans across the diaspora that we are family, yes. and that we have to redirect our narrative 
and we have to love ourselves and love the country that we're from and give back to that country and go back to that country. Yes. And in order for us to do that, we have to tell our stories, we have to research our stories, and we have to begin healing. Mm -hmm. And to do that is to lean on one another. Mm -hmm. So don't overlook each other. <laughs> Reach out, love on each other, grab a hand, come back, and serve. And I guess I want to say that we are Africans and we have the best minds. Mm -hmm. yes. We have the best minds out here and if we could just bring our young along, seeing us be our best mm -hmm. um, and, and knowing their history, we could teach them their history. They are the best minds, they come from us. Yeah. Um, we women, we give birth to greatness, mm -hmm. and if we know that, we'll take better care of ourselves. Mm -hmm. If we, if we if we put that first, you know that we are creating the best the world has to offer, and so if we if we can instill that in our, ourselves and our youth, it would be such a powerful. Thank you so much for coming yeah. uh, and I enjoyed yes. our conversation. We wish you a fruitful stay and we wish that you come during the Christmas so that we enjoy the festivities. Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. oh yeah, that would be great. Yes. That would be great. Interesting. Thank you so much for joining us on AU Talks. You can watch us on our Facebook page, Association of African Universities. Have a good day. Welcome to Event Update on AAU TV, the voice of higher education in Africa. Event Update brings you information about upcoming higher education events happening in Africa. And it is brought to you by the Association of African Universities. I am Isabella Tetahenakwa. I am Alexandra Ampaba Johnson. Please stay tuned for the updates. Accra Institute of Technology is a top-notch private university in Ghana. The university offers world-class bachelor's, master's, and PhD degree programs. IT and management is one of the good courses I think we should offer these days because I realized that on my years of experience on the IT field, I realized that IT guys find it very difficult to cope with the management aspect. And AIT is giving us the opportunity to do IT and management. We dive into what um, programming. We I did HR. I did principal management and all this one is giving me the opportunity to be able to communicate with my manager. So when we are talking about IT, I know that I'm talking about something technical and I can also talk about management which is also another dimension of corporate institution. So with all this, I think AIT is giving us a very nice opportunity. We are AIT, the University of the Future. Welcome back. The Association of African Universities, AAU, is pleased to invite all African higher and tertiary education institutions to apply for institutional workshop for the 2019 and 2020 academic year. This activity is implemented by the AAU in its capacity as the apex body and voice of higher education in Africa as well as the coordinator of the higher education cluster of the African Union's Continental Educational Strategy. CESA 2016-2025. 
interested universities and institutions can kindly apply online via www.surveymonkey.com slash r slash aau works 19 to 20. Contact Frank Asifwa on fasifwa at aau.org or call plus 233-548-8808-55 for any technical challenges. And for more details, please visit www.aau.org or www.blog.aau.org. L'Association des universités africaines, AUA, est heureuse d'inviter toute institution africaine d'enseignement supérieur à postuler pour des ateliers institutionnels pour l'année académique 2019-2020. Cette activité est mise en œuvre par l'Association des universités africaines en sa qualité d'organisation fêtière et la voie de l'enseignement supérieur en Afrique, ainsi que le coordinateur du cadre de l'enseignement supérieur de la stratégie éducative continentale de l'Union africaine, c'est ça 2016-2025. Les universités et institutions intéressées peuvent postuler en ligne via www.servemonkey.com r aaux 19 to 20 Contactez Franck Assefoy sur facefoy ou appelez plus 233 548 88 08 55 pour tout problème technique et veuillez visiter www.aau.org ou www.blog.aau.org pour plus de détails. The Association of Commonwealth Universities, ACU, in collaboration with the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology, KNUST, is inviting you to an upcoming workshop under the theme Developing the Next Generation of Researchers, date 16th to 20th March 2020, venue Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology, Kumase, Ghana. This workshop will provide an opportunity for senior academic staff and emerging researchers to explore innovative approaches to professional development and collaboration. In addition, the Association of Commonwealth Universities will be launching the Circle Institutional Strengthening Implementation Fund for member universities to apply for financial support to deliver activities to improve support for early career researchers. Please email nestgen at acu.ac.uk for more information. L'Association des universités du Commonwealth, en collaboration avec l'Université des sciences et technologies de Kwame Nkrumah, qui est UST, vous invite à son atelier intitulé « Développer la prochaine génération de chercheurs » du 16 au 20 mars 2020 à l'Université des sciences et technologies Kwame Nkrumah à Kumasi, au Ghana. Cet atelier permettra aux universitaires et aux chercheurs émergents d'explorer des approches innovantes de développement professionnel et de collaboration. En outre, Association of Commonwealth Universities lancera le fonds de mise en œuvre du renforcement institutionnel CIRCLE pour les universités membres afin de demander un soutien financier pour fournir des activités visant à améliorer le soutien aux chercheurs en début de carrière. Veuillez envoyer un courriel à nextgen.acu.ac.uk pour plus d'informations. The Western Central African Research and Education Network, WACRIN is organizing its sixth annual conference hosted by the Benin Research and Education Network on the theme Digital Transformation for Development. Date 19th to 20th March 2020, venue Cotonou, Benin. This conference is a call for papers and interested authors are to submit their abstracts on these related subjects. New technologies, innovation and fourth industrial revolution, e-learning, lifelong learning and education strategy open science and open access, as well as ethics and governance. Kindly submit all documents online at WACREN 2020 Call for Papers. And for more details, contact WACREN at cfp2020 at wacren.net. Le réseau de recherche et d'éducation de l'Afrique de l'Ouest et du Centre WACREN organise sa sixième conférence annuelle organisée par le réseau de recherche et d'éducation du Bénin sur le thème Transformation numérique pour le développement. Date 19 au 20 mars 2020, lieu cotonou bénin Cette conférence est un appel à communication et les auteurs intéressés doivent soumettre leur résumé sur les sujets suivants. Nouvelle technologie, innovation et quatrième révolution industrielle. Stratégie d'apprentissage en ligne, d'apprentissage tout au long de la vie et d'éducation. Sciences ouvertes et libre accès, éthique et gouvernance. 
peut soumettre tous les documents en ligne via Wakren 2020 Core for Papers. Pour plus de détails, contactez Wakren via cfp 2020wakrennet كمال محمد عبيد مدير جامعة أفريقيا العالمية أعمل في هذه الجامعة منذ العام 1982 جامعة أفريقيا العالمية كغيرها من الجامعات تؤدي وظائفها الرئيسية التعليم والبحث العلمي وخدمة المجتمع الجامعة الآن دخلت في مشروع جديد بإدخال فكرة الجامعة المنتجة وتقوم بتدريب الطلاب وتقوم كذلك بخدمة المجتمع الجامعة الآن بالإضافة إلى كلياتها في مقرها الرئيسي تنتسب لها أكثر من 17 كلية نظامية في عدد من الدول الأفريقية وخارج أفريقيا يشكل المركز الإسلامي الأفريقي واحد من المؤسسات الرئيسية في الجامعة وهو الذي يهتم بتقديم الخدمة للمجتمع عن طريق تنظيم القوافل والمخيمات التربوية للطلاب لدينا قناتين الآن قناة العالمية العامة وقناة العالمية التعليمية بالإضافة إلى راديو أفريقيا ويديرها الأساتذة والطلاب أن تحصل جامعة أفريقيا العالمية على جائزة الملك فيصل في مجال خدمة الإسلام هذا مؤشر لأن الجامعة تعمل في الاتجاه الصحيح تعليم متميز لتحقيق أهداف الدعوة The Makerere University and the government of Uganda are inviting you to join the international leaders and experts for the 2020 World Health Summit Regional Meetings to address the biggest challenges in global health in the region and around the world. Date 27-28 April 2020, Venue, Speaker Resort and Munyonyo Commonwealth Resort, Kampala, Uganda. Topics to be discussed at the summit are the health of the African youth, Advancing Technology for Health in Africa, Global Health Security, Non-Communicable Diseases, Intersectoral Action for Health, as well as Universal Health Coverage. For more information, please contact Dr. Charles Bate via drcbate at gmail.com or call plus 256-700-800-618. You can also visit www.worldhealthsummit.org. L'université Makerere et le gouvernement de l'Ouganda vous invitent à rejoindre les dirigeants et experts internationaux pour la réunion régionale du Sommet mondial de la santé 2020 afin de relever les plus grands défis de la santé mondiale dans la région et dans le monde. Date 27 au 28 avril 2020, lieu Speaker Resort et Mounyonyo Commonwealth Resort Kampala, Ouganda. Les sujets porteront sur la santé de la jeunesse africaine, comment faire progresser la technologie pour la santé en Afrique, la sécurité sanitaire mondiale, les maladies non transmissibles, l'action intersexorielle pour la santé et la couverture sanitaire universelle. Pour plus d'informations, veuillez contacter le docteur Charles Batté via dr.cbatté.gmail.com ou appeler le plus 256 780 0618 et vous pouvez également visiter www.worldhealthsummit.org. The Association of African Universities is inviting you to their annual school for African student leaders on the theme Quality Student Leadership and Administration in African Universities. Date 9 to 12 June 2020. Venue The AAU Secretariat. This conference will discover and develop the leadership qualities of the student leaders. Assist them to identify the right environment and conditions under which they operate as leaders and seek to equip both newly elected and current student leaders with knowledge through practical exercises and case studies that will adequately prepare them to efficiently manage their peers and contribute immensely to the overall goals of their universities. Interested participants are to register via the link on your screen. And for more information, kindly contact Mr. Kwesi Akwasam via kasam at aau.org or call plus 233-243-298464. L'Association des Universités Africaines vous invite à son atelier annuel des leaders étudiants africains sur le thème leadership et administration des étudiants de qualité dans les universités africaines du 9 au 12 juin 2020 au secrétariat de l'AEA. Cette conférence découvrira et développera 
des qualités de leadership des leaders étudiants et les aidera à identifier le bon environnement et les conditions dans lesquelles il opère en tant que leader. Elle cherche également à doter les leaders étudiants nouvellement élus et actuels de connaissances à travers des exercices pratiques et des études de cas qui les préparera adéquatement à gérer efficacement leurs pairs et à contribuer énormément aux objectifs généraux de leur université. Les participants intéressés doivent s'inscrire via le lien qui s'affiche sur l'écran. Et pour plus d'informations, veuillez contacter M. Kwesi Akwasam via kasam.org ou appelez le plus 233 243 29 84 64. The African Diaspora Nation ADN is inviting you to the Historically Black Colleges and Universities HBCU Africa Homecoming and Recruiting Fair Ghana 2020 on the theme Expanding HBCU Engagement in Africa Date 23rd to 25th July 2020 Venue Accra Ghana This event will connect US HBCU leaders, governments, stakeholders, influencers and C-suite executives with their counterparts in Africa and the African Union along with the Forum for Traditional Leaders of Africa to establish short, medium and long-term collaborative partnerships and solutions for educational, economic and social leadership exchange. For more information, kindly email info at africandiasporanation.org. La Nation de la Diaspora Africaine, ADN, vous invite à la foire des retrouvailles et du recrutement en Afrique des collèges et universités historiquement noires HBCU, appelé Ghana 2020 sur le thème « Expansion de l'engagement des HBCU en Afrique ». Date 23 au 25 juillet 2020, lieu Accra, Ghana. Cet événement mettra en contact les dirigeants, les gouvernements, les parties prenantes, les influenceurs et dirigeants de ces suites des États-Unis, de la HBCU, avec leurs homologues en Afrique et dans l'Union africaine, ainsi qu'un forum pour les chefs traditionnels de l'Afrique, afin d'établir des partenariats et des solutions de collaboration à court, moyen et long terme pour l'échange d'un leadership éducatif, économique et social. Pour plus d'informations, veuillez envoyer un email à info@africandiasporanation.org. That is all for today's update. Event update is brought to you by the Association of African Universities. Please follow us on our social media platforms at Association of African Universities on Facebook and YouTube. AAU TV underscore African Universities on Twitter and AAU TV Official on Instagram. You can also visit our dedicated website at tv.aau.org for more of event updates. I am Isabella Tetahinakwa. Je m'appelle Alexandra Mpaba Johnson.
We are live from the studios of the Association of African Universities headquarters here in Accra, Ghana, and this is AAU Talks. My name is Kusi Sam. Today on AAU Talks, we are discussing sustainable job creation for the African youth. And don't forget that you can join the conversation via our social media platforms, Association of African Universities on Facebook, and AAU underscore 67 via Twitter. We will go for a short break, and when I come back, I will introduce my guests. Stay tuned. This is AAU Talks. Sacred knowledge is at our very fingertips. Knowledge that can illuminate our lives and the lives of our children and our families. So what are you waiting for? Join the Islamic Online University today and fulfill the prophetic command seeking knowledge is obligatory on every Muslim. You may join the diploma course, which is absolutely free with no hidden costs at all, or the BA in Islamic Studies based on the curriculums of the Islamic University of Medina as well as Al-Azhar University. And join the collective effort in changing the nation through education. Welcome back from the break and viewers, this is AAU Talks on AAU TV and today we are discussing sustainable job creation for the African youth and don't forget to join us send us your comment send us your your views what do you think about the topic for today um, sustainable job creation for the African youth and we are privileged to have two young gentlemen who are brilliant and they are very innovative to help me discuss this subject and the first to be introduced is the chief executive officer of um, Platinum Africa Solutions in the person of Mr. Derek Vomao. Derek, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. Welcome sir. to AE Talks. Thank you very much. Great. And the second um, resource person, or the second guest to be introduced, he is in the person of um, Mr. Prince Apa. And Mr. Prince is also the head of research and public relations at TANO. TANO is the African network of entrepreneurs. Prince, you are welcome. Thank you very How much. How are you? Very good. Great. So, gentlemen, finally, you are welcome to a talk, and Thank we you. are glad that you could join us today Thank to you. discuss um, a very important topic that has to do with job creation for the African youth. For the past few weeks, I've been interviewing vice chancellors and some seasoned academics on the continent. We are looking at how we can revitalize African higher education to suit the current demand of, of industries and then the, the, the continent as, as a whole. And the basic thing is that we must ensure that our students are entrepreneurial. We must ensure that our universities are running programs that are in line with, with industry. Let me first take your, your view on, mm. on that assertion from our academics. Mm. So um, a warm greetings to everyone watching. Mm. Um, so I think when it comes to this subject matter, I mean, mm. it's, it's one of the areas that are very, very important. And is raising a lot of concerns, I mean, in our system right now. Sure. When it comes to bridging the gap between education or the classroom and then industry. Sure. You know, and last two weeks, we were at the event together and I told mm -hmm. people that the gap is, is you. But then now let's look at redefining that gap again. Mm. Okay, what is what do we mean by someone being entrepreneurial? For me, it's just the ability to solve problems mm -hmm. and being paid for it. Good. You understand me? It's as basic as that. It's being able to solve problems and then being paid for it. And I keep sharing on most platforms I get a chance to sit on that. Mm -hmm. Ghana is very rich or Africa is very rich because we have a lot of problems here. Sure. So, um, an, an undeveloped continent. Exactly. Has a lot of so yeah. every problem poses a business opportunity sure. you know, for, for entrepreneurs. And the, the moment you, you make a move to solving a problem, then you become entrepreneurial mm -hmm. because even in, in the workplace, I mean, I, one of the, my jobs, my job role is to recruit for companies. Okay. And even in that lane, I don't hire CVs. Okay. I have people that have the potential of solving many okay. of the problems that my clients are facing. Okay. You understand me? So that is what even um, people are looking for. So for me, entrepreneurial, being an entrepreneur doesn't mean necessarily starting up a business, a business, but it's just the ability to solve a problem and being paid for it. 
which is a very very important thing that we have to address mm -hmm. and make our students aware of exactly that we are not just supposed to sit in the classroom and then uh, at the end of the four year period you got it with a certificate which probably costs like three cities to print <laughs> <laughs> you understand sure. then it's not enough but during the four year period what have you built yourself into, into? okay what 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 has the program that you've studied um, how has it immersed into you? How have you immersed yourself into the program to be able to solve a problem? Mm -hmm. You know, and what are the problems you've identified? So mm -hmm. I think I buy into that that we have to make our students understand the need for them to be entrepreneur from the perspective that being entrepreneur is the ability to solve problems, identify not necessarily problem and solve it. as a, not necessarily starting up a business like okay. we think entrepreneurship is somebody who started a business. Okay. There are people who are. We call them intrapreneurs mm -hmm. within an organization. Exactly. You understand? But the way they perform their roles at, I, I, in the organization is just like they are solving problems mm -hmm. innovatively. Mm -hmm. You know, innovation plays a key role here. Mm -hmm. So if you've gone to uni for four years or, or whatever it is for four years and then you are just coming up with a certificate and you've not been able to become innovative, what is the process of innovation? Mm -hmm. How do you innovate? You understand me? Then there's a problem. So I think it's something that we really... We, we need to delve into make into. people understand the redefinition we are giving to entrepreneurship. Great. Let me take your initial comment, especially the difference between uh, buying and selling and then uh, real entrepreneurs, that just as he has said. I mean, like, now. first of all, it's good that maybe our academic, uh, uh, our academic is now getting to come to terms mm -hmm. about the job creation or the job creation that uh, is currently facing the continent mm -hmm. and trying to see the importance that young people need to start creating not necessarily businesses but uh, creating activities that make them independent maybe after school or that can really sustain them uh, as maybe um, role models to other people as well mm -hmm. uh, but we also have to examine the context in which they are also preaching their exactly sure. Do we have the enabling environment that is going to make sure that all these people that are coming out of school are going to be entrepreneurial? Mm -hmm. Are we sure that the curriculum that we have in school that we are teaching every single day, it's kind of enabling or can give the potential to young people to go out there and create jobs instead of seeking for jobs? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, like, we'll commend the, uh, the uh, academia for what they are preaching, mm -hmm. but we'd like to put it to them that they also need to start working on their tools. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, I've been in school, and uh, I know people who are reading business administration, but even in their first year, second year, they don't know anything about business. Mm -hmm. They've not been to the field to study or understand any entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. The only thing that they have to them are resources from, I mean, I mean Europe or in, from America. Exactly. We do not even have resources to even understand the entrepreneurs on our continent to even know how they thrive or how they even start their business. Mm -hmm. So for me, if the academia is trying to preach and um, this message for us to get students to become entrepreneurial, I think we need to do more on their side in helping the students to become entrepreneurial because students are in school to learn a course. For example, I'm in school to learn um, communications, but the school should be able to teach me how successful other people have started companies out of this mm -hmm. for example who are the best communicators in the country and okay. who are the best business people in the country down into communications but the school never teach you that the school is going to teach you about how uh, to get the your cv very well how to get um, the knowledge to just go and be employed but i think if they really 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 want us to to become entrepreneur after school they need to start working on our curriculum, which is very important because that is what is shaping us. Without that, I mean, we'll not go anywhere. And the, the perception also that entrepreneurship is some sort of fashion also has to be demystified when it comes to we preaching it. Okay. Um, I see a lot of young people trying to be Bill Gates, but you never see anybody trying to become in their spites mm -hmm. because they don't want to start how they started. They want to start with Bill Gates, starting getting the resources and getting other things. We need to... I mean, change the concept in, in which we even preach okay. entrepreneurship to young people now. Because I think it's not helping a lot of people. Okay. Because they see it as a very nice thing, they jump into it, and all of a sudden they get to realize that, wow, it's a hell. <laughs> and the, the reality is, is Yeah, and then they are trying to see ways in which they can dodge it. But mm -hmm. I mean, you're already inside, and you're, you've already told your family members that you are CEO of this and that. So <laughs> they, want, they want to see you to produce results. And sure. you know, in, in this part of the continent, it takes you five years to produce the same result that somebody would take somebody a year mm -hmm. to produce somewhere else. So I think 
for me, I'm excited that they are preaching that message, mm -hmm. but it still comes back to them. Okay. They have a lot of work to do because we don't have any say when it comes to our curriculum or we don't have any say when it comes to what they teach us in school. Mm -hmm. We can demonstrate against it, but I think if it has come to them that yes, what they are teaching now is not good mm -hmm. or they need to maybe advance it, I mean, they need to do a lot of work for that. And we'll be very grateful if because be the, the, the future of the content is actually us. Yes. So if you're not able to train us now, that means the future that you want your grandchildren to enjoy, I mean, will not be there. Okay. Uh -huh. Now, let me, both of you started your businesses or whatever whilst we're still in school. Yes. Um, let me start with you, um, Derek. How difficult or easy for you mm -hmm. to just juggle your academics and still start, start up your own business? You are in school. What? How did how did you start it? And mm. what was the the drive, the passion for you? Okay, so let me make it very relatable for everybody watching. Mm. So I, uh, right after senior high, I did my diploma in mm. business studies, which was supposed to be for two years. Okay. I tried for one year, and I, I got a distinction, mm -hmm. and I applied for a job. Okay. okay, my dream job as I then was to work in a bank. Mm. So as at between nineteen twenty, I got my first bank job. So I, when I got into the bank, then I applied for studies. To read banking and finance, Bachelor of Science in the evening school. Okay. So I was working during the day. At where? And then, Which yeah, school? Um, UPSC. UPS, okay. Exactly. So I was reading Bachelor of Science and banking and finance. All right. So I was doing that. And then now, second year, I got out of the bank and then I had to start my, my company. Mm -hmm. How did I start? I was really passionate about the fact that um, I had a lot of ideas. Strategies came to me naturally. So it just comes to my mind and I just know, I just knew how to work with money. I just had a connection to solving main, some of the many problems that businesses are facing in, 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 in the world, focusing on Ghana. So I found a need there that, okay, I have these ideas. I could come up with a good plan, good strategy, good marketing, and all of those things for another company. They would be willing to pay for that. So why don't I start this? And I didn't, as, as I did, I didn't have anything. So I, I started with a broad laptop, okay. you know, and then I, I brought my best friend's laptop at the time um, for three months. I, 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 it was tough because no no interest no 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 <laughs> thing. i mean I, I i said i really and i love the whole process i mm -hmm. i keep telling people that if i had the chance i would i would love to go back to when i started and like i would not take each day for granted mm -hmm. because i felt like that was the time that they, i was built into a resilient entrepreneur mm -hmm. that moment of my life defined has defined me okay. has made me who i've become because i i went through the process of building this company which we say is, is um, my company we are preaching that is uh, we, are, we are hoping to become the most reliable business consulting firm in mm, africa sure. you understand and we, we are running the company here in ghana and kenya as well yeah. so being able to build it from a broad laptop into what it's become right now that process has been priceless for me mm -hmm. and for me it has taught me the principle of resourcefulness you understand a lot of patience a lot of lot of consistency you know, and uh, being able to put your business on the path of sustainability mm -hmm. that years from now, because it's not just about starting. Mostly when I go to events and I have to talk about starting a business, I get off because I'm like, starting is not the message I will be preaching. It's about building this for life. Mm. Yeah, because anybody can just start. I, you could Google how to start a business. And I don't like to talk about things that you can find on Google. Mm -hmm. It should be something I have done, I have felt, I have experienced. The passion. Exactly, the that I can give out to sure. someone. So for me, it was the, the one, and one of the difficult things that I faced was the fact that I was young. Mm -hmm. I mean, this was consulting. You had to do with people that are in this for like years. Exactly. But then, some way, some, I don't know, this thing just kept coming. So there, I know there are times, like Prince said, I was not the kind of entrepreneur that, that was looking for an office and all of those flashy mm -hmm. stuff. I'll, I went out, I'll work in the hot sun, I'll go to Osu, I'll go to companies, restaurants, tell them that, hey, we do this, we do that. Some of them really treated me like, so bad i mean at times i just woke up and when i'm like today i want to be broken let me just go out there <laughs> go to companies i don't know about just tell them i'm here some of them will look at you like where did you come from mm -hmm. i mean how old are you, Who are you, know, you? exactly mm -hmm. and so that was a major challenge i faced the fact that I, I was young and that's one of the problems here in ghana if you are young it looks like you are incompetent you can't do anything until you are 40. you understand me? and we are the same people preaching that young people should do this but when the same young people come to you they will start acting up like they are, they are too young. But I'm glad that right now um, some of us have been able to redefine that narrative. Okay. I mean, that, that thing that used to be there. I have companies that have been here for over 50 years that are 
coming to us for services. Mm -hmm. You know, they are trusting us with their money. Mm -hmm. They are trusting us to deliver to them. And I see some of the young people really doing amazing. And mm -hmm. it's always, it's, it shows that we can be trusted. Sure. We are not too young to be trusted. You know, so that was one of the major challenges. And also, I think one of the challenges was, um, I think it was one of the challenges I overcame was the fact that I had to really see a vision for this company. Mm -hmm. You know, where are we heading to? In the next five years, what do we want to become? What do we want to become years after now? What is the brand perception mm -hmm. that we want people to have about us when our name is mentioned? Okay. You know, and these are things that most startup entrepreneurs do not think about that a brand is not actually the colors or the logo it is the perception it is the promise okay you understand me? Right, let me take you back to yeah. the, the the school days mm -hmm. that is where we have a lot of the problems. Mm -hmm. i have young people who come to me I, I i sit down with them go to their business plans and proposals and i i tell them look in the next two years if echo bank should employ you you just mm -hmm. throw this business plan somewhere mm -hmm. What was your motivation? You see, mm -hmm. how were you? Did you have a lot of us go to school and we are so much bent on making the first class mm -hmm. excel academically? Mm -hmm. And if we want to combine anything with it, we are thinking of, oh, will I be able to make it? What was the dilemma for you? That, for that, that, that point is very important. Very. I mean, I, I kept, I, I shared with some students last, last week and I told them that when I was in uni, this is what I did. I personalized every course that I took. Okay. I saw a reason for me to take that course that okay i'm running this company so i'm doing um if i'm doing a course in insurance mm. i should understand this for me you understand me and that's one of the things that sometimes we we, we fail to understand as students that mm -hmm. this shouldn't just be about studying to go and write an exam, exam. and passing mm. my goal was not to make a first class okay. my goal was to make sure that i become a first class person here that i'm not paying school fees for a, a paper I'm paying the, the lecturers to teach me something I don't know. Mm -hmm. So if, if it's something I already know, then my expectations from them will be high. Because okay. they need to really show me something. And that's one of the problems I have with most of the units, that some of the lecturers are actually teaching courses they haven't done practically. Mm -hmm. Like, you cannot teach me entrepreneurship when you've not started a business. It's the truth. Okay. You won't understand what it means to be an entrepreneur if you've not been there. So you, mm -hmm. you are teaching me theories. But I want something more than what's in the book okay you understand me so i had to personalize my courses and that's one of the things that helped me like i read programs and i had to like understand it from my perspective that okay so if we are doing um finance i mean a business finance is this so for me this is what i will I'll need to apply and that helped me to explain myself in examinations and stuff okay. you know so i i personalized the courses for myself make sure that i understand what they are teaching if it's not something i would want to know or possibly something i could get on google i wouldn't want to be there Great. you understand yeah i think so. i have a lot of questions to ask you but let me go to praise <laughs> sure. praise how was your personal experience combining the idea the passion the thought of start, starting a business in school vis-a-vis uh, -vis your academics as well so i mean i mean like i would like to encourage every young person that <clears throat> whenever any opportunity of you starting a business come take it and grab it and use it because mm -hmm. at the end of the day it's one of the key things that is needed is the experience mm -hmm. uh, you know even you know even if you're applying for a job everybody wants experience you now before you can give you something mm -hmm. uh, my, my first business that i handed was not my business okay. but this is one, one of the things that person preached to me it was uh, pastor jude he said prince i'm glad i'm teaching you how to make money at this age and i was 19 mm -hmm. and he wanted to start a newspaper and then he wanted a young person to champion it so he selected me and i didn't have any business experience i didn't the only thing that i did was in high school then was being an editor in chief we started a, a news club on campus so every monday and friday we we're going to read news at assemble to students so i picked up some experience from there and then we started a newspaper so at the age of 19 i was editor in chief of a newspaper okay and what he told me was i'm glad i'm trying to teach you to make money but when I started, I didn't have the thing in me that I was in this to actually make money. Mm. I was there just because I was there because of passion. Yeah, I'm passionate about this. And one of the things that we as young entrepreneurs need to, to note is that it's not only about passion that will make you eat in the evening. Mm. It's about adding sense to the passion and making money out of it. Sure. Now, when, when it comes to combining maybe our lifestyles as students and entrepreneurs, I can tell you that it's not easy. Uh, for example, I run a company called Advance Media, mm. and we are into the ranking of young people and then trying to celebrate them every year. 
So this year, young people in business or what yeah, no, you? young people in general. So general, from okay. business to I mean politics mm. oh. to lifestyle to entertainment. Mm. So one of the key things that I mean this year I was really discouraged to still continue running my business. Mm -hmm. Because it came to a point where uh, the point was supposed to be announcing our winners. It was the same week that I'm supposed to write exams. Oh. So imagine if I didn't have any commitment or I didn't have any experience to this, I would have filled my paper, my papers, mm -hmm. and I said I filled in my business as well. So as young people, we need to really grow the strategy. I mean, we need to grow ourselves with a lot of strategies mm -hmm. as to how we can survive in business because. As he said, it's not easy combining being in school and then running a business. It has a lot of clashes. Mm -hmm. And for example, the school doesn't care whether you're in a business or not. All that they care about is you're paying school fees mm -hmm. and you're coming to sit there and write paper or coming to that and sit in, uh, coming, to, uh, coming to school to sit in a lecture room and then listen to them or do whatever thing that they ask you to do. Mm -hmm. So, but for me, I think we need to encourage more young people to, to combine, to take challenges. Mm -hmm. I mean, Yes, you have to take challenges and, and see how best you can manage it because you never know what big opportunities that you have in the future that, yes. I mean, will need the same sort of experience for you to, be able to overcome. To overcome. This. So I think young people should, should get the opportunity. If, if, they, if, they, if they get it, they should grab it and try and see how best they can motivate. I, mean, I don't think there's any defined formula of how you can juggle maybe entrepreneurship and then, I mean, schooling at the same time. It comes based on your own commitment. Mm -hmm. And that is how you can be able to stand, stand out okay. in academics and both in your business. All right. Mm -hmm. now, so listening to the two of you, <laughs> there, there's a simple message um, that you are putting across that has to do with the fact that you can't leave your passion out of it. Mm -hmm. And that is what drives you even to go to the lecture theater. Mm -hmm. I, I, I've been in that situation before where I sit um, doing lectures and my mind is somewhere else. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking of what the lecturer is teaching and what I can make out of out of it right from the classroom. Mm -hmm. Now, let us situate passion mm -hmm. very well with bus with as in business success. Okay. Do, do we have any correlation passion mm -hmm. and business success? Yeah. Yeah. For me, I think um, I'm very blunt when it comes to this. Mm -hmm. I'm so passionate about business that it's so obvious. I mean, any any time I'm talking about it, because I feel like passion is not enough. Okay. It's just like love not being enough to maintain a relationship. Mm -hmm. You understand passion is passion if you don't take care you end up running something out of passion and out of passion and trust me you years down the line, you would, exactly you would you would you would you wouldn't be remembered okay. you understand yeah because business is, is, is a it's a tough ride mm. and i shared in my book what they don't tell you about entrepreneurship in, from my perspective right. and i made people understand that it's not it's not a fun ride like we think i mean you are going to be dealing with a lot of drama mm -hmm. a lot of things so if passion is just the only thing that's going to drive you that's then the yeah then you should you should you should, you should just find something as well but it, 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 passion is, is is key you know it is a starting point to solving a problem and that makes you a true entrepreneur mm -hmm. a true entrepreneur is someone that is connected to the problem that he or she is solving mm -hmm. so because of the problem they wake up at 2 a.m cooking up ideas how do i solve this problem mm -hmm. how do i make money out of this how do i make pe people's lives better out of what i'm doing mm -hmm. that makes you a true entrepreneur because there's a connection to the problem and that's yes one thing about passion when it comes to that stage when you are um, connected to the problem because of the primary connection you have there'll be secondary problems you'll be identifying exactly. um, i mean other problems you'll be identifying around the major problem mm -hmm. for example Someone is starting a food business because people would be hungry to eat. But then again, because there's a connection to the business, the person thinks that at a point, people wouldn't want to come out to buy food. They want to sit at the comfort of their homes in their offices to buy food. So I have to do free deliveries. Out of that, I can start a delivery firm. So of course, other restaurants would want to have that service as well. Mm -hmm. You understand? Now, they wouldn't want to call me to, the, to order anymore. They want an app. Let me partner with an uh, IT guy, mm -hmm. create an app, people can buy the food online, you understand? Now at a point again, they wouldn't want to eat meat, that people want to be health conscious, sure. so now they want to eat more greens. So because of the connection, you get to have other ideas around the problem, and that makes you a true entrepreneur, and that makes the difference between those that are preaching entrepreneurship to be fancy and flashy, and the role of a CEO to be bossy and mm -hmm. all beautiful, mm -hmm. to those that are actually on the ground solving problems. That makes them true entrepreneurs. And now, passion. So passion is a key, it is a key thing, fine. But then I think it takes a lot of discipline. Okay. Where does it start from? 
do you lay in your bed when you wake up in the morning? Mm -hmm. Do you have a routine that you adhere to every day? Because mm -hmm. that's where discipline starts from. And that's one of the things I did to be disciplined, to, just for my business. That I, when I wake up in the morning, first thing I do, if I don't leave my bed, I don't leave the house. Mm -hmm. I have to read my Bible. I have to read my Bible before I sleep. Mm -hmm. You understand me? This is something I started myself to keep me this way. So I know that, okay, um, the rule of um, business entity, that me being a separate entity from my business, that makes you disciplined that you know that, okay, when 10,000 is coming to the company, it's not my money. Right. You understand me? I get paid this amount of money. Maybe every contract I work on, I get paid 20%. The company takes 80%. Mm -hmm. It's discipline. And that is how we run the business. That at a point when you are broke, the company is having money. It doesn't mean it's your money. Mm -hmm. You stay disciplined and true to the cause that this is the company I'm running here. It's a business. People are owing you. They, they've got to pay. People need to pay a price for the solutions you have. Mm -hmm. and so if it's just about passion, people will be having it for free. All right. And that is not a business. Mm -hmm. That is a passionate activity. Mm -hmm. That is a project. That is like a service. It doesn't but bring any money. It, it doesn't mean it's not a business. Mm -hmm. A business is an activity where somebody is willing to pay a price for another person's solution to their problem. Okay. So until that link has been established, until that grounds has been established and it's fertile, mm -hmm. then you're not running the business. Until somebody is willing and able, willing and able mm -hmm. to pay a price for what you have to offer to them without doubting your competence, without doubting your delivery, mm -hmm. Then you are not a businessman or a woman. All right, let me take your, your your comment on uh, this, and then I'll go for a short <laughs> break. I, I think passion is that thing that just keeps you going. Okay. But for your business to really survive, it takes a lot of other factors. Mm -hmm. And I think Derek has mentioned a lot of them because I was discussing with a, a, a young man recently, and he was so focused that he is so passionate about his business. But when he started mentioning his figures, how much he was making, and I started laughing at him. I'm like. Passion alone cannot make your business become successful. Make you the Warren Buffett sure. today, because you have to know that even Warren Buffett studied, uh, did a lot of investing, did a lot of spending, did a lot of mistakes before finding himself in where he is today. Yeah. And I think there is this perception where every young person is doing business because when you ask them, yes, I'm so passionate about this problem, I want to solve it, mm -hmm. and it takes a lot more for us to be able to understand that. It's not only about the things that we perceive that will make us successful. There are environmental factors that can also make us successful. successful. So okay. if you need to partner with somebody to do it, go ahead and do it. Mm -hmm. If you need to go and take a loan to do something, go ahead and do it. But for, for a lot of young people, I think the idea, I mean, it also happened to me. I was so passionate about, my, I was so passionate about things that I wanted to solve. Mm -hmm. And when I started, I got to realize that no, I can't continue, I can't con continue on anymore. I have okay. to get people on board. I have to get money on board. I have to... Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of factors will definitely contribute okay. to making sure that uh, you are able to really sustain your business okay. beyond passion. But I think as young people, we should be able to demystify our, our mindset that passion is, a, is, is the only thing. Okay. It can be the key thing that can keep you going, mm -hmm. but it's not the only it's thing the only that thing. can it's make like your... It's like it's a basic thing, but mm -hmm. it's not the... the, the I mean, I, 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 mean I, I like the example he gave about relationship. I mean, yeah. there's love, but like, it's not love that's going to keep <laughs> exactly. you going. <laughs> 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 right. yeah. Thank you very much. We'll go for yes. a short break, and when I return, we'll look at are there different types of entrepreneurs? Um, mm. Are we all supposed to create businesses and then look at why some business startups fail? Mm. Yeah. Okay. All right. Viewers, this is AU Talks and today we are discussing sustainable job creation for the African youth. After the commercial break, we will still have our, our guest here to discuss this issue into detail. Stay tuned. Join us on our social media platform. Send us your comments and your views and let's read them for you.
Welcome back, viewers. This is AAU Talks on AAU TV, and we are discussing um, sustainable job creation for the African youth. I still have the two gentlemen in the studio. They are doing amazing work. That is Prince and Derek. Um, let me start with you, um, the, uh, Prince. Let's look at this issue in, in detail. Do we have different types of entrepreneurs? Um, sometimes I get a bit confused. Everybody parades himself as, a, as, a, as an entrepreneur. Do we have different types? Are we all supposed to create businesses or what are we all supposed to do? Okay, so I mean from, from our perspective, uh, it's not different type of entrepreneurs, but mm. maybe different type of business owners. Okay. Uh, there's this idea of everybody needs to start a business, mm -hmm. but from, from there's, a, there's a perspective that says that it's people that solve needs, right. that are entrepreneurs, and people who solve problems that are businessmen. Mm -hmm. So it tends to create a lot of um, misconception or mis uh, the perception a lot of young people have when it comes to that is different. Okay. Uh, when you're talking about solving need and problems, for example, Facebook is never a problem. Mm -hmm. Facebook is not solving a problem. Without Facebook, you can still live your daily life. But if this chair is broken, it becomes a problem. Without it, we cannot, we cannot sit here. Okay. And it's those people that are rather the businessmen that we see on the streets and all those kind of stuff. Uh, they are the people who are not really the fashionable businesses that we all want to enter into. Right. But when it comes to entrepreneurship, we are all trying to see how we can solve a need. Okay. But the thing is, the need we are solving, how many people have that need? Mm -hmm. that, that's when, for example, you see a lot of Ghanaians creating apps similar to Facebook, and they're kind of surprised why their apps are not thriving. Because basically you're solving need, but you're solving it to only 25 million people. Okay. And even for you to even, uh, I mean, market it, it becomes very difficult because it is not solving any peculiar need within like our locality. Mm -hmm. But for example, if you think, uh, if you take a lot of uh, business, a lot of young people are starting today, if you study it, you could see that they are becoming more innovative in their thinking. Mm -hmm. For example, you take a company like Haptel. Mm -hmm. Everybody is not sending text message. Okay. But think about how easy and how fast you want to send a text message. Mm -hmm. So they came up with an idea that they want to create a platform where people can just upload contact and send a text message to lots of people. Mm -hmm. And they got it right. And because of that, other people are also copying them. So as young people or as uh, people who are eager to start businesses, mm -hmm. We're willing to sit down and really study what kind of business do we want to st do we want to start? Mm -hmm. Do we want to solve a problem or do we want to solve a need? So and I think the, the, the issue has to do with identifying a business problem yeah, and coming or a up need. with a, a need and coming up with a solution. Exactly. And until you do that, you can just be doing shadow boxing. Yeah, I mean like there are a lot of young people who are doing it, <laughs> but like it's not really working for them. All right. They are they don't have they have some some of them know the need and they know the problem mm -hmm. but they don't know the kind of solution that the customer will actually need mm -hmm. that that will make the person satisfied so i mean when it comes to play um and one, one of the key things that i've also noticed i've also noticed is uh when you are solving when you're an entrepreneur you tend to make more money than when you're a businessman mm -hmm. so a lot of young people are focused on trying to become entrepreneurs than businessmen but one of the things you got to realize that there, there are a lot of businessmen who are rich in Ghana mm -hmm. than entrepreneurs who are actually solving problems that we want to have as, as our fashion because most of the times we are reading things like from Europe and from America and other stuff. Mm -hmm. We are not taking time to really study our local ecosystem. Okay. And that's the reason why you see a lot of people starting today and then the next time they are failing because they've not been able to really come to terms into what can actually make their business survive here mm -hmm. or what kind of problems or needs that are peculiar that people over here okay. need. And even before you scale up, I mean, there people, people start companies and they are thinking, I want to go global, I want to go this. But the thing is, are people in your locality even accepting what you're doing? Mm -hmm. Because if they are not able to accept what you're doing, and identify with, identify your with service, you, yes. you don't have any story to go and sell anywhere for mm -hmm. people to be convinced that, okay, you have an, an idea that, that can solve a problem because you solve it somewhere. Okay. So I think young people should really put into terms if they are if they, if they solving a problem or a need, and if they, their locality mm -hmm. really understands what they are solving, because if your local market accepts you, okay. you can go anywhere. That, and that, uh, that, I mean, that, most of the times we well, we also use the ideas of Facebook and Twitter. Mm -hmm. But you have to you have to think of it that before even Twitter came to Ghana, it was successful somewhere else yeah, it before, before it came here. Okay, okay. So as young people, let's try and see how best 
and see where we can really fit ourselves because all of us have strengths and weaknesses. weaknesses okay. Are you, is your strength in becoming an entrepreneur? Because for becoming an entrepreneur, it takes a lot of time mm -hmm. for you to, even to make the money that you want to make. Mm -hmm. But if you are a business person in Ghana, you are, I mean, you have the enabling environment to make enough to actually spread for yourself. Maybe it might not be as big as somebody who will become an entrepreneur. Okay. How easy was it for you to move from the space of Ghana to Kenya with your business? <laughs> Um, in, in my case, I think um, that move was it was first it was scary. Mm. And, and, and each time I get asked what has been my greatest achievement on earth, it's not the awards I've been nominated for. Mm. It's the fact that I've won over my fears. That was the first thing I had to conquer. Mm. It was scary, but it worked like that, you know. So sometimes, really, it's, it's not all the time that it will take so much time for it to work. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you may get lucky, you may be graced, I mean, it's favor of God, mm -hmm. and then boom, it catches fire. I was able to hold an event in Kenya, and preparation stage, I was not there. I did everything online. Mm -hmm. And the ticket prices for the event in Ghana, is we charge more in Kenya. Okay. And we had people attend, and I go to Kenya, and my first live television interview was on their biggest TV platform. Mm -hmm. Great. I mean, right. so just that move was, was, was worth it, you know. But just to buttress what Prince said, which is very important about um, that. Uh, for me, I, practically, I've come to identify various types of entrepreneurs and quickly I'll share. Yeah. I mean, I have sectioned them into, we have true entrepreneurs and regular entrepreneurs. Okay. Out of the regular entrepreneurs, we have the social entrepreneurs, we have the business entrepreneurs. Exactly. You understand me? People that are focusing on solving a societal need, okay. you know, NGOs, foundations and stuff. Mm -hmm. And the people who are actually into business. You understand me? And one thing he said about need is, one powerful thing I've come to identify with business is, I take my company as a case study. You have to be careful when you are choosing a need to solve or a problem to solve. Mm -hmm. Some needs today may not be needs tomorrow. They may be wants. The question is, will people be willing and able to pay for wants? I mean, yeah. wants or they will want us to focus on their needs. Okay. You understand? And I like the fact that we are talking about sustainable job creation. Mm -hmm. We are thinking about how to start on a path of sustainability. Mm -hmm. Sustainability is not decided today. It will happen eventually. True. It is the fact that 10 years from the day you start, you will still be able to look back and say, yes, I built this business mm -hmm. for 10 years. It's still running. You understand? Even that, you don't get complacent because in business, anything can happen. Right. You have to continually be on that path and mm -hmm. put the, I mean, sustainability principles or strategies, you have to implement them in your company, you know, your, in what you are running. So, I mean, one of the things I've been preaching lately is true entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. True entrepreneurship. That's what we need. We need, we need, I would like to walk into, and that brings me to the question of asking people that, what is your Ghanaian dream? Mm -hmm. Everybody needs to have a Ghanaian dream. My Ghanaian dream is that I want to walk into shop right and I want to see made in Ghana milk, fresh milk. I want to see made in Ghana conflicts. I want to see made in Ghana sausage. Because we are facing a balance of payment deficit as a country because we are importing more than Everything. we are exporting. Exactly. Everything we eat, we import. Even fruit, fruits, vegetables. What is the problem? So what happens? We are going to have a lot of houses, a lot of money, and no food to eat. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the primary areas we can be focusing on. And anybody that is focusing on solving one of these many problems we are facing in Ghana becomes a true entrepreneur because we are, we are really solving a problem mm -hmm. and a need at the same time which is a problem and a need. And that need will always be a need tomorrow because people will always want to eat. People always want to look good. People always want a good place to sleep. People always want to run their businesses. So you have to be able to be smart with choosing a sustainable path for what you are going to start that. Okay. Would this thing be necessary five years from now? Do you understand me? So yeah, for me, that is my thoughts on um, um, the various types of entrepreneurship and then I mean, how but, but, but do, you, do you think that true entrepreneurs are born and not made? <laughs> are they made? Yeah. Or they are born. I mean, I mean, it's it it depend. Uh, for me, I mean, some people are born entrepreneurs, and mm -hmm. some people have to be made. Some people have to be taught. Mm -hmm. Definitely, yeah. Uh, I mean, I don't know. I'm not. I'm not sure. It's genetic. Entrepreneurship is not <laughs> in, in the genes. I mean, there are people who have given their businesses to their children, and the business have failed. Cool. It's it's not inside. Cool. I mean, it's something that you have to study. Mm -hmm. uh, it's something that you have to experience. If you don't experience it, I mean. If you don't, if you don't, I mean, get into it and learn the nitty gritties because it, it comes down to a lot of strategy. It sure. comes down to a lot of talk. It comes down to a lot of talent. I mean, you have to take a lot to be able to like run a business. It's not just about I'm the C, I'm the son of the CEO of this, this, this. Though I can also run a business. Mm -hmm. I've seen a lot of young people trying to do that, and 
I mean, if, if you look at the statistics, most people, most successful entrepreneurs mm. don't give their business to their children to run. They rather allow them to even go and start their own thing or get employed somewhere else. I mean, just do a case study about mm. how many entrepreneurs that you've seen, even, even locally, mm. that's handled by their businesses to their children. So I don't think it's genetic. Okay. You have to be made. You have to go to the meal. I mean, yeah. you have to, to develop it. If you, if you don't do it, I mean, you end up failing. And it goes down to a lot of people that even though, if, even if it's in your gene, mm -hmm. try to take experience from wherever you are studying under. Okay. I mean, if, if, if you don't, I mean, I know, for example, like uh, Kwame Despite, the son is currently the one in charge. But if you go back to really understudy the guys, you go, you're going to realize that from when they were young, they've been in the business. Mm -hmm. They've been understanding someone. They've, they've, they've gone to serve someone. Yeah. But we have, we have a lot of young people who think like, okay, no, I can, I can go to Harvard. And the next moment, I made CEO, yeah. sure. I made CEO without going through any experience. Okay. And that's the reason why we get to ad advise a lot of entrepreneurs that mm -hmm. even if you want to involve your family in your business, don't give them top leadership positions. Mm -hmm. Let, Let them, them go, through the, go through the process. Let them get to understand that, okay, this is how it works from the grounds. So Before mentorship, um, grooming, training, everything is important. Definitely. Right. I mean, if, if you don't get it right, mm -hmm. I mean, you're you going to get right. it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to get it wrong <laughs> at, the at the top. And yeah. it will be very scary. Okay. And uh, we've seen a lot of business collapsing, in, even in Ghana, mm -hmm. where we've seen f uh, the founders' children handling them at the forefront. Mm -hmm. And you, ne you never hear of them handling any branch manager position. Mm -hmm. But all of a sudden, they are CEO, CEO yeah. of the company. Yeah, and this, and, this, and, and this, at the next moment... Yeah, at, at the next the, moment, it's a very, it's a very uh, crucial thing. I mean, it's something we really need to make people understand. Like, it's, exactly. not, it's not a fancy thing. I it's, the boss. Yeah, of, uh, I'm, I'm the boss of, and and one of the problems of with these people is that the reason why uh, one of the, one of the reason why they fail is the fact that they are not good with people. Mm -hmm. You know, you are in to solve problems for people. If you are not good with people, you cannot do anything good for people. Exactly. And that is when the business starts to fail because mm -hmm. that moment you've lost connection with your audience, mm -hmm. your market. Your market are not machines, they are human beings. Mm -hmm. You understand me? So once you are bad with people, you cannot be good as a business person. And yes, um, I believe that entrepreneurs are great. It's just like greatness. Mm -hmm. uh, you, 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 fine, you may be born, born into in royalty, world. but yeah, some may be born, but I, I believe that the, 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 the really um, strong ones, like resilient ones are made. There are people that have grown into the process. Okay. They've been through the process, and it, it, the process makes them mm -hmm. a great entrepreneur. Okay, yeah, that, that's beautiful. Let, let's go to the last part of our mm -hmm. segment where we are looking at sustainable mm -hmm. businesses. Mm -hmm. I, I I can name or list the number of young people who started and they are nowhere to be mm -hmm. found because of the fact that I mean, you you share your experience, mm -hmm. the the kind of hardship or the the. The, the limited resources you have to work yeah. with. Not everybody can go through the yeah, process because they want to be seen flashy with all the cars and yeah. money and everything. <laughs> How do we ensure, and I don't want us to go with the government, um, the government, government, government. As, as a young person, how will I be able to make sure that I create a business and the business is sustainable to even employ others? Let me start with, with Prince. Well, I mean, starting a business, first of all, is like, I mean, I always keep saying that it's an experience. Mm. Um, but in starting a business, you need to have a vision. Mm -hmm. And we tend to see a lot of businesses in Ghana not surviving beyond five years, beyond 10 years. Mm -hmm. And we have to ask ourselves why. I mean, even though it's beyond government, we, we need to f like really phantom the vision. Mm -hmm. What is the vision of the company? Because that's what carries the company wherever it to go. Mm -hmm. But you can see that there are a lot of businesses in Ghana that do not have a vision. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of young people who are starting businesses because they are passionate about it but they don't have any vision for it. So for us as young people, in starting a business, we should try and table. In the next five years, in the next 10 years, where do we want to go? But it's not only about having a dream, by having a vision. Mm -hmm. It's also about doing the work. And you have to come to terms to it that doing the work is not going to be smooth. It's going to be very rough. Mm -hmm. And I like what Derek said, that uh, starting a business is like giving birth to a baby where you know that definitely the people will fall sick. Mm -hmm. But you tend to see people whenever their businesses are in shambles or their business are experiencing some small problem, then they tend to give up. Okay. And that is what really yeah. affects other businesses growing beyond even their vision or growing beyond mm -hmm. how long they want to survive. So for us as young people, uh, I always tell people that it's very good and we are very blessed 
that as young people, we have come to this time where we know about how to start business or how to even run business. Mm -hmm. It's not even just that maybe we'll run business for the rest of our lives. It's possible that sometimes we just need it to go and run somebody else's business. Because I see a lot of young people in Ghana now who have business, who, are, who have run businesses and are giving up sometimes for the good reason, mm -hmm. sometimes also mostly for the for bad the reason. Business, yeah. And, and I, I, as I said earlier on, it's not just about starting a business, but it's about gaining experience. Mm -hmm. Because you have to know that we want, we, want to, we want to have thought leaders on business and entrepreneurship in the country. But how are we going to get those people? Is the people that have gone through the mill? Is the people who have, who have failed, have started again? Is the people who have failed and have stopped or have given up? Mm -hmm. I, I, I recently shared a story of uh, my first failed business. I want to start a barbering shop mm -hmm. uh, back in my village. I want to employ young people. I had this big idea. Mm -hmm. I mean, like in the next two years, I will open shops all over <laughs> because we make a lot of money. Mm -hmm. But I came to tell that, no, I didn't have things in place to really even keep my dream going. I didn't have a team that would take me forward. I didn't have money that I'm sure that, okay, even if something fails, I mean, I'll be able to. And we realized that even after setting up the whole business, putting up the structure and everything, there was nobody that we could even employ. And nobody was willing to work with us. <laughs> and for me, it was not that, just, just that we gave up on our business. Mm -hmm. For me, I realized that it was also a good moment for me to learn so that I can be able to get handle other businesses, businesses very well. Great. Thank you so much. Prince, let me, let me take your Derek. Uh, Derek, yeah. let me take your view. Yeah, so um, I think um, building a sustainable business, mm -hmm. right? Yes, um, one, like Prince said, the vision is important. So that's well said. And the second thing is uh, I believe in corporate culture. Mm -hmm. You know, a corporate culture. A culture is, the, a, 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 is, is a way of life. Yeah. Okay, it's the reason why you become what you become mm -hmm. and you get what you get. Because if you keep doing what you always do, you keep getting what you always get. And that is one of the things that uh, most startups mm -hmm. do not think about. That what is my culture? How do I respond to emails? Mm -hmm. How do I respond to telephone calls? How do I? How do the people that work with me represent the company? Mm -hmm. Do they understand what we are about? Do they understand the meaning of our logo? Do they understand the meaning of our colors? Do they know why we say cheers? Mm -hmm. Do they know why we say no? Mm -hmm. You understand me? And these are the, it's, it's, it's like a, it, the team. You know, if, if it's going to be sustainable, I always use God as a best example. Mm -hmm. Like I said, he, there's a man that created the world in six days and now has over 7.5 billion people working for him. What did he do? He duplicated himself in us. So we have been made like him. Mm -hmm. We are creators just like the creator. Mm -hmm. And that is one of the principles of sustainability. That don't, it's, it's not, the vision is not just for you. When the vision is just for you, then you're not in a path of sustainability. Sure. Then when you die or when you leave the, vision the scene, dies also. exactly, it, things, things slow down. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's, it's powerful that you are not in the country and your company is still running, clients are still coming in as though you are here. Mm -hmm. Do you understand me? And that should be the goal of every startup entrepreneur, that how do this keep running even in my absence. Okay. Would this still make sense five years from now? What is the culture that I've put in place that myself and the people that I work with would grow into? Because just like the role of the CEO, mm -hmm. a corporate culture is not just adhered to, mm -hmm. it is grown into. into. Okay. It takes time, people grow into it, and then it grows into the people. Right. And why do teams win? Why do teams lose? Mm -hmm. Because of the culture, because of the way they do things. So once there's a way that, a structured way of doing things, then you know that you are positioning your company in the way of um, sustainability. And the second thing, um, getting ready for sustainability, you have to look at even your, aside your team, your clients. Because mm -hmm. the kind of clients you render services to, or you sell to, will determine whether you are going to be here for the rest of the uh, for the rest of the, the year or the rest yes, of the years the ahead of you. Okay. You understand me? So you have the power to choose. And I always make people understand that there is a natural power we have. Mm -hmm. The power to decide what we want, when we want it, how we want it, and who Where? we want it with. Mm -hmm. You understand me? So that natural power must be applied in, in your business here, even as on, you are on the path of sustainability, that you have the power to decide what product am I, what product am I bringing out? Mm -hmm. When am I releasing it? When is the right time? Who is this meant for? Because one of the things that is also killing business is the fact that people are targeting the wrong people for their products and services. So Not make, everybody on social media is important. for you. Exactly. You understand me? Mm -hmm. What is my target market demographics? What does my potential customer look like? Mm -hmm. What What is his, his or her possible name? Where would he be hanging out on a Friday night? Where, mm -hmm. where would he be spending more time on social media, Facebook or Instagram? If it's a makeup business, your customer is on Instagram. Mm -hmm. If it's a product 
product you are selling. People are on Facebook. You understand me? So you have to get your market right because that is one of the key drivers of sustainability. Mm -hmm. The reason why you be sustainable is when you are needed. Why will you be needed? When you are relevant. Mm -hmm. Why will you be relevant? Because you set a need for a certain targeted customer range. Do you understand me? And just like ice cream, not everybody likes ice cream. Mm -hmm. So not everybody is going to like what you do. And sometimes people need time to accept you. So it may take a year, two or three. You, don't, you just don't give up. It's like a relationship. Mm -hmm. You have to take time to know the person. So it's just like that. People need to take time or they need some time to have a connection with, with your you. business. Because the reason why somebody will buy a Chanel bag costing $25,000 over a locally manufactured bag is because of the perception, because of the connection they have with the product that mm -hmm. I want to have the feeling of knowing that I have a Chanel bag. It's customer loyalty and it's, it's brewed from perception. Mm -hmm. You understand me? So also now we come to the matter of perception. If you're going to be sustainable, what is the idea people would have about you? Okay. You have to define that idea. Mm -hmm. You have the power to define your brand. Because what you say your brand is becomes your brand. Just like life. What the meaning you give your life becomes your life. So the meaning you give your business becomes your that business. Becomes your image as well. Exactly. Thank you so much. Let me take a final one. Very quick one. Um Oh, okay, so um, as young people, for me, I'll keep on saying it again, that experience is very important. Mm -hmm. Don't be afraid of starting. And when, when it's very necessary for you to give up to, I mean, try and wait and see whether it's for the good or it's for the bad. And I mean, we have a lot of things that we have to share with the future. And mm -hmm. we have a lot of things that we cannot give us excuse because we've not done. Mm -hmm. This is a task. As far as we are young, we have the energy, we have the time, we have the resources now to be able to make, make mistakes the and correct them. Exactly. And to make the best out of whatever we do. If whether we're going to commit mistakes, whether we're going to fail, we're going to succeed. Mm -hmm. And I want young people to have story. If you grow up one day, what story are you going to tell people? Sure. So I see a lot of young people trying to I mean not start anything at all because they are afraid that something 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 might happen. But I think that we all need a story so that one day we can look back and tell ourselves that we've done well or we've not done well. So as young people, not give up and let's just keep on doing uh, what we are passionate about. And I mean, even though we know that passion alone will not take us there, so we add more things passion to it. Passion is a basic thing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me take your... Yes. So uh, final words, uh, I'll look into the camera, so I'll talk to them directly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so final words to everyone, I, I mean, I'll go back to the basics, okay? Why did God make, make man? God made us to take dominion over the things that he had created. Yeah. Okay, so God expects us to continue on creation. Mm. And I connect entrepreneurship or even starting anything to, I connect it to like um, living your best life. Mm -hmm. Am I living my best life? What is my best life? Is the one I define it to be. Life is too short for you to not live your best life. Mm -hmm. Life is too short to live in the shadows of people. Mm -hmm. And funny enough, sometimes people love you because you are in their shadows. Mm -hmm. People love you because they are in control of your life. But like I said, there's a natural power to decide who you want to be. There's a natural power you have to decide what you want in life. It's just one life. Don't live it um, thinking it's one life. You only live one, so mm -hmm. you have to go all, all out there and do all the nasty <laughs> stuff. But it's just one life. Live your best life. Mm -hmm. Define your life and live it the way you want to live it. And I know that um, people should know there's a charge on our lives as not just young people. I know old people are watching this as well. Mm -hmm. There's a charge on our lives as humans. What is the return on investment that God is making out of your living? Why should God give you the next minute, and the next minute, and the next hour, and tomorrow, and the next day, and the day after, okay. and the years after? You have to give him a, a, a correct reason why you are relevant to mm -hmm. his sustainable development plan, plan. for yeah. the world. That this person is going to draw in a lot of people into this and win these kind of souls for this purpose. And also linking it to entrepreneurship. Maybe your entrepreneurship may be your album you have to release. Maybe your book you have to write. Maybe it's, it's something you need to start. Maybe it's a project you need to start. It may not be necessarily or an business. idea you need to share with somebody. Exactly. Mm -hmm. You know, just, just know that it is time. The perfect time is now. And now is the perfect time. And the time is right because you make the time right. Mm -hmm. And so take charge of the time you have. We have as young people, as old people, whatever it is that you are, whatever it is that you want to do, do it right now. And also lastly, fight your fear. I mean, nothing should scare you. You should rather be afraid of one day sitting on heaven's lonely bench and looking back and thinking, I could have done this. Oh my God, I could have done it. And then God will tell you that, if you had released that book, you would have made 10 million sales okay. and you didn't release it. If you had started a business, you would have made that sales and you didn't do it. Yeah. That should be your fear. That one day you will be lonely on heaven's lonely bench 
and look back and regret. And lastly, you should get a copy of my book. Everything <laughs> is in there. Everything is in there. Good. I mean, I've shared in here um, the principles that I've applied as a young CEO, you know, and um, in this one is Testing the Paint, is the first reel I've released. And it's a subtitle, Growing into the Role of the CEO. I've shared in here how to even sell your business to a potential customer investor in 60 seconds. I've shared in here the principles I've applied. Principle of patience, consistency, principle of purpose, principle of sustainability for your business, growth and expansion. And I've shared in here my whole experience of starting my business in Kenya okay. as a young Ghanaian entrepreneur. You should All get right. a couple of 15 cities back. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much, um, gentlemen, yes. for uh, for coming to the show Thank and uh, sharing your knowledge and experience with young people on the continent. I know greater works are, are, are with Amen. us and a lot of things. Uh, I know tomorrow um, we will take over the continent, sure. and create sustainable businesses, employ more people, and make sure that Africa becomes the best continent globally. Definitely. Thank you so much for Thank coming. Thank you very much, yeah. Viewers, this is AU Talks. Thank you so much for staying tuned. My name is Kwesi Sam. See you soon. I'm here with the Association of African Universities Television, AUTV. I just want to say that uh, without the media, you won't know what's going on in the world. Even with the media, you sometimes don't know what's going on in the world. So you need to tune in to the reliable sources who are really on the front lines, who can give you the information you need and give you facts, uh, not conjecture, give you real news, not fake news. And this is the place to find it, AUTV. The voice of higher education in Africa. a spirit where people who take part in the activities are sensitive to do so because they believe in the will of aiding their country to develop. With the highest volunteerism in the country, there is no connection, there is no correlation, there is no relationship between volunteerism and development. You presented your position, in other words, your thesis statement was very well couched and clearly presented. Welcome once again to Osakrum, the garden city and the capital of the Ashanti region. We are live in the Alote Auditorium of the College of Science in KNUST. We are still on the Yaz Intellectuals and today promises to be electrifying. We shall be seeing our uncompromising moderators come up with rapt attention as they take into account every word that slips out of a debater. The royals of Jean Aka Nelson shall come up against the vandals of Commonwealth Hall, both from the University of Ghana. Once again, you warmly welcome. My name is Emmanuel Edujefi, and of course, I'm here with Nanaba Amwa. And today, we have great teams that are taking part in this Yaz Intellectuals Bay show. Of course, we are in this beautiful garden city of Kumasi, and you're all warmly welcome. Okay, so we are coming live from KNUST yeah, in Osaikum, and we are going to have a very heated debate today. We'll go for a quick commercial break, and when we come back, the show continues. Twenty first century design made with durable materials. Bristles crafted to reach in between your teeth. Flexible allows easy control. Introducing 
Yaz range of toothbrushes, made for every pocket. For bulk purchases, call 0302-235294. Yaz toothbrushes, clean teeth, confident smile. All right, so thank you very much and welcome from the break. First of all, we have John Nelson from the University of Ghana, Legon. John Nelson, as our name predicts, we are the royal. We have diversity when it comes to capacity. That's why when it comes to education, too. trust me, we are on top. If you come debate, to just watch out for my guys. I can promise you this all is one of the finest. Of we have the men, we have the women, and we are the next batch of leaders in Ghana. We are not coming to joke at all. We're going to blow your mind. Because Nelson, our standards are just up there. Other halls may be shouting, jumping, doing any wild thing you can think of. But Janelle, so we come cool and quiet. But we give you the best that will blow your mind. The intellectual debate 2018. Watch out! You are coming with the bang! Royals! Nelson! Royals! Nelson! Ah! Royals! Nelson is competing against Commonwealth Hall. Here is where everything starts from. Here is where everything ends. And that stood for the truth because when you are coming into the hall, you can see our stance, truth stance. We have excelled in every single position we found ourselves. We are taking over. Vandas have never lost. If we want to get it better, want to get it down, they involve the Vandas. We are spoken for the silent minority. We have been the voice when nobody was ready to speak. We come out home as history holds it have been able to produce a lot of big brains. The former president, Mahama, was a good communicator because he was in our debate team. So when you are talking about debate, where else do you look at? It's just common water. Hall. So wherever you are, whoever you may find yourself, get to know common water Hall is in the race. We don't only talk, but we prove it with actions. They can shout, they can make the noise. But wait, let's get to the battlefield. The intellectuals debate, we are ready as vandals, and we make sure truth stands. We win, we win, we win, and that is what we know. We made. Okay, let's not forget that this show is proudly sponsored by Yaz and supported by Capital O2 and Access Bank. It's going to be quite an interesting one. We've already had very, very, very heated debate right here. And I'm sure uh, we have supporters of John Nelson right here with us. And of course, Commonwealth Hall, uh, popularly known as Vandal. So we're going to get very much started with this particular program. Okay, Kwabna. So um, the debate topic for today is volunteerism is an interest that is lost in the Ghanaian. This is a contributing factor in lack of developmental growth in the country. Before we move on to the debate, Pabna, kindly introduce our moderators. All right, so for our moderators, we have Dr. Oseni Adam. Shall we uh, welcome him with a round of applause? <laughs> and we also have with us here Professor Goski Alabi. A round of applause for him. <laughs> we also have Professor Martin Ousu with us. So they are going to make sure we have a very wonderful time right here. Jean Aka Nelson Hall of University of Ghana is speaking for the motion. And Commonwealth Hall is speaking against the motion. Jean Nelson will start it off for us. The Honorable Chairperson, the judges, fellow debaters, ladies and gentlemen, I am Kumasa Molara and I speak for the motion. According to the former UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, volunteerism is a feature of all cultures and societies. It is a fundamental source of community strength, resilience, solidarity, and social cohesion. It can help effect positive change by fostering inclusive societies that respect diversity, equality, and the participation of all. Such contributions are vital to promoting peace and security, advancing development, and protecting human rights and dignity. Now, to establish the context of this debate, we argue that volunteerism for the purpose of this debate would denote activities undertaken by a person or group of individuals by free will for the general public good without expectation of remuneration for whatever services are rendered. 
Emphasis will be placed on volunteerism by nationals directed at meeting the country's needs and the general promotion of the welfare of citizens. However, we will not overlook voluntary activities that are undertaken by nationals for the benefit of an international region of which Ghana is a part and is also applicable in this debate. Now finally, we we'll seek to reveal the absence of volunteering, of volunteering spirit in the Ghanaian and how this contributes to the country's state of underdevelopment. Now we start. Ghana is a developing country and we all agree and this characterization is almost inextricably linked with, un with high unemployment, inadequacy of relevant infrastructure, inefficient public structures, low literacy and poor access to vital health services for the majority of the nationals. While measures are being put in place by the government to address these problems through education and improve production, there still exists a large percentage of individuals experiencing no immediate alleviation from these urgent challenges. Since the improvement of the standards of living of these people is extremely important for the general national development, an efficient measure that is sensitive to the limitations of the system is required to address these needs. And this measure we pose to you is volunteerism. Now, for the proof of our premise, we, we are going to present you two case scenarios which buttress our point that indeed volunteerism should, is, a, is necessary and is a contributing factor to the development of a country. According to the annual report of the Ghana Health Service, a lament on inadequate volunteers and low commitment of volunteers in rural districts leading to poor health status of those indigents. The failure of the village volunteer system, which was introduced by the Ghanaian government in the 1970s due to apathy of trained volunteers and misappropriation of resources, brings us to this present situation. That is why we are having this debate. Now, these cases occurred in the presence of a sizable number of capable youth with access to training and flexibility of service. The absence of volunteerism is unjustified because aside the poor, unemployed and incapable, there exists a large number of nationals with free time and resources to volunteer their skills to aid the less fortunate in areas including but not limited to health, education, agriculture and social activism. Now, to the thematic cases and evidence that we provide you, we start with volunteerism says serves as a means for basic equity. Although there exist state machinery and systems run by governments to enhance living standards or grant access to basic necessities, the nature of Ghana as a developing country within an equally developing sub-region demands a plethora of wants to be met with limited state funds. As such, the government on its own is under intense pressure to deliver these goals to the benefit of the society. It then behooves on individuals or groups of individuals who are in a capacity and are themselves beneficiaries of the state investment to share some of their good via voluntary social aid like outreaches, programs, and, um, and any other activity that will help reach the set of people who remain destitute or underdeveloped and in disadvantage in the society. Secondly, we present to you that volunteerism acts as an instrument of change in a developing state. The manner, now let, let me set this right for the understanding of all of us, the manner in which a theory can be assessed with regards to its relevance in a state is by identifying the actual areas where this can be utilized and showing how this is relevant to required growth. Within Ghana, there are loads of pressures on our government and in fact we all do in every single way place pressure on our government to provide equitable access to social services to all the peoples but then we tell you that this is a limitation because it does not reach to, the, to serve the immediate needs of the victimized sex. Let's consider the scenarios of accidents, of floods, and where we have the National Disaster Management Organization being contacted to help salvage the situations. Now, when we observe that, when we look on as citizens and we tend to refer our duties to the government and say that, oh yes, whatever this problem is, it's up to the government to solve it. For example, flats, we leave it to the government to come and solve it for us. That is where we tell you that we need to develop the volunteering spirit in each of us as individuals and as patriotic citizens of this country. But let's reconsider these scenarios realistically. Before the government can contribute to, before the government can serve its purposes, before we get up to hell insults at the authorities, we should first recall that we are immediate patriotic citizens and we do have a quota to play to the development of the country. We should not overlook that part. Thus, the differences in social equality that inevitably plague human, humanity better place us all to aid one another at points in which 
a point in time when our abilities come in handy, which brings the theory of volunteerism. We move on, volunteerism as a factor for enhanced leadership. The motive of volunteerism is fueled by free, by free spirited will for service, which places the interest of those being served at the fore of the activity. Unlike monetarily incentivized activity, which has remuneration fueling the service being rendered, voluntary service subtly inculcates the spirit of service in individuals and causes them to be sensitive to the needs of the people first and further aids them to realize the greater good of service. Noting that leaders emerge from the population itself, we must realize the caliber of leaders we would have if volunteerism was at its peak in the country. Leaders whose sole motive is to address the demands of the people with issues like money and benefits being subservient to this cause, thus directly tackling the root of corruption which emerges from self-prioritization. Now, we we'll also present to you international cases which buttress our point. In Ireland, Volunteer organizations such as Poor Poverty Initiative perform free services and donate goods to poor and impoverished communities, which improves the quality of life for the less fortunate in society. For the benefits of the disabled minority, which is often left out of the major government policies, the MenCap LiveNet Volunteer Group offers and organizes teaching and training sessions complementing the existing measures to create more equality in the society. Let's take South Africa. The Child Welfare South Africa Initiative is responsible for creating, for catering for the immediate health, safety, and educational needs of the underprivileged children in rural South Africa. This has boosted youth literacy and welfare in the country, with positive effects on the country's development. Finally, in conclusion, volunteerism is not the only determinant of national development. Many others exist. However, in a country like Ghana, where other Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Can we have the principal speaker speaking against the motion? Distinguished panel of judges, never have we been so proud to oppose a motion like this one because we think that in order to truly liberate Ghana from the shackles of underdevelopment, the right factors that inhibit our underdevelopment should be identified and mechanisms should be put in place to address those factors. In this debate, we are not the side that says volunteerism has no benefits. So all his analysis about volunteerism has some benefits here and there actually falls flat. That is not what this debate is about. This debate is about accessing the impacts of volunteerism and accessing the benefits of volunteerism and analyzing whether those are significant enough to prevent Ghana from developing. That is what this debate is about. Not necessarily you telling us that volunteerism is down uh, because uh, volunteerism has benefits. We have two basic stance in today's debate. First, we are going to establish to you that volunteerism as an interest is something that is not lost in Ghana. And we'll show you why that is particularly important in today's debate. Secondly, we are going to analyze you that even if we were to assume that volunteerism in Ghana, why its impact is insignificant for us to consider it as a contributory factor to our underdevelopment. A couple of clarifications in today's debate. Yes, we say that this motion is in two parts. There is a first part that says volunteerism is an interest that is lost in Ghana and this is a contributory factor. So there exists a premise and there exists a conclusion. The premise part is that volunteerism is an interest that is lost in Ghana. So their burden is to establish to us that volunteerism is actually something that is lost in Ghana. And because volunteerism is lost in Ghana, that is why we are not having development. If we can prove to you in today's debate that in Ghana, volunteerism is not an interest that is lost, they lose this debate. This is basic logic 101. This is critical thinking ABC. First. So let me give you an example. Let me give you an example to clarify. If I tell you that the reason why I failed mathematics was because, one of the reasons why I failed mathematics was because I had no calculator, and you are able to actually prove to me that I actually had a calculator, then that means you deny me my ability to use my lack of calculator as one of the reasons for which I failed math. So we also deny them their ability to use the fact that Ghanaians don't have volunteerism and actually show that the conclusion that they drive from it is actually flawed and doesn't stand in today's debate. So what proposition side in today's debate wants you to believe is that 
millions of Guyanians are not having health care because Guyanians are not helping each other. They want you to believe that the reason why we have a vibrant unemployment graduate association is because Guyanians are not helping each other. We think that these are very, very ridiculous. First thing is why volunteerism is not lost. First argumentation is on the level of the existence of empirical evidence. We think that the very existence of this uh, competition in and of itself is somehow indicative of the fact that Guyanese are always willing to volunteer. We don't think YAS organize this thing solely because they want to make profit. They recognize that they need to groom the next generation of debaters. They recognize that they need to volunteer for their nation in this particular way. So if you have the existence of these things, if you have the existence of companies, of groups, for example, on com campus here, there are so many volunteer groups that are there. We think that all these are indicative of the fact that people are increasingly engaging in volunteerism. Why? For two reasons. Because a Guinean value system recognizes that volunteerism is something that is important. We recognize that we should help each other. Volunteerism is basically about help, and they are accepted to this definition. So if Guyanians we help each other, and it is preached in Guinean value system as an acceptable thing, that pushes people to set up volunteering companies in Ghana, and we have a plethora of them in Ghana. He will give you examples. A second thing is because we get a sense of personal accomplishment when we volunteer, and this is why people continuously engage in volunteerism. And on another level, we have people doing personal volunteerism. When we were coming here, we got lost on the way. Someone volunteered and brought us here. All these are indicative of volunteerism being in existence in Ghana. The third argument is, the third argument on this particular point is, the existence of things that motivate us want to volunteer. We tell you, the religious organizations, for example, increasingly tell their members why they need to be good to their neighbors, why they need to help others, why they need to help the less privileged. We tell you that these things drive people to want to volunteer. A second thing is because, because of the visual feelings the media creates in us, uh, as the pictures of images, uh, schools and the trees, we want to volunteer all, all of these things. So, their premise that volunteerism is lost in Ghana, who led them to the conclusion that this is a contributing factor to our development, actually falls and they fall flat in today's debate. The second argumentation that we bring into today's debate is talking about the fact that even if we were to assume that volunteerism is lost in Ghana, which is not true, I've proved to you why, let us tell you why volunteerism is not a contributing factor to Ghana not having proper mechanisms and Ghana being underdeveloped. Two argumentation in today's debate. First, it's an examination of the global trajectory for development. We tell you that nations like the United States didn't develop at a particular point in time whereby they were blaming things like volunteerism and saying we are not developing because volunteerism is there. The global trajectory shows that nations develop at a point whereby they provided platforms for the thriving of capitalistic ideas, one, a two, when states actively supported science and technology, when states invested actively into the economy. Nations like the United States and the global hegemonic forces that we are now seeing today didn't get to their extent case because they were blaming volunteerism. We don't think that volunteerism Anyway, if volunteerism was a significant uh, determinant of development, then it should have been significant in the development of the United States. Uh, uh, Japan mentioned the, these companies. We think that the very fact that these were not critical in the formation of these nations, we think that we can't attribute, uh, we can't say that uh, this thing is actually a significant factor. But then the second reason is the argument, the argument that is based on the impact of volunteerism. Panel, we argue that for you to consider something as a contributing factor to development, when it is a high number, impact should be something that is so significant so that you can now make the argument that because it is not there and because you are denied of these impacts that is why you are not developing we are going to in and take them at their best let us assume that every single person in ghana volunteering we will tell you that the impact of this volunteerism is going to be very very minimal and we can't really consider volunteerism as something that contributes to our underdevelopment here's why because if people want to volunteer in ghana because they lack access to capital because we are poor you don't expect an unemployed uh, graduate to go and volunteer and get anything meaningful from it so the impact of his volunteerism is going to be basically minimal secondly you don't have the structures that will support his volunteerism so even if i want to go to ponta Mala and teach because i don't have proper roads to get to ponta Mala, i won't get there so my volunteerism is very very minimal so the fact that we are not getting volunteer, uh, so much impact from an increased interest in volunteerism, that automatically shows that we are not being denied of anything special. If we are going to assume that volunteerism is, uh, if we are going to assume that volunteerism is as high as that is, assuming that every single person is uh, volunteering in Ghana. But then let us do some um, engagement to these people. They say that the Ghana Health Service says uh, that people are falling sick because people are not volunteering first level of argumentation is it is never the job of volunteers to provide health care for people. It is the job of governments to do it. So if they are basically saying that the Ghana Health Service has done that, that was never the job of uh, volunteers to begin with. Governments need to invest capital and government needs to do this. We think that there are more fundamental things and when we are talking about volunteer uh, development, let us not kid ourselves and let us not focus on things that are very, very periphery and things that are not fundamental in the determination of our development. We should focus on more things. The global forces do not get there because of development. Secondly, we've taken, a, we've taken away the, the 
are primed to make that uh, conclusion that we are not developing because of volunteerism, because volunteerism is actually there. This competition is very, very much indicative of that, and several other examples that we gave you. And the third analysis that we gave you in today's debate is the fact that the impact of volunteerism is not so nice. If you are going to have a high interest in volunteerism, and panel notes, interest, a high interest in volunteerism, that interest will not automatically translate to a very beneficial thing because of the two factors that I analyzed to you. So interest in volunteerism, which is what this debate is about, doesn't do anything because people are constrained by these two forces. We are incredibly proud to oppose. Thank you very much. I'm sure we appreciate the fact that we have critical thinkers and great speakers right here with us on the YAS Intellectuals Debate Show. And of course, let me quickly say that this program is sponsored by YAS. And I've told you about a toothpaste which kills or very harsh on gems and very mild on the gum. So make sure you get a toothpaste. And YAS has already promised us that they are going to give each and one of us here something to take home. And so we should be very expectant of that. And so that's the situation. And again, we are also supported by Capital O2 and Access Bank. Wide wings and leak guards. Yaz sanitary pads give you maximum comfort, hygiene, and protection in a resealable pack. We've got Yaz protection. Yaz sanitary pads. Maximum protection, maximum confidence. No worry. We've got Yaz protection. Thank you very much and welcome from the break. On this note, let me call on the first supporting speaker for the motion. The Honorable Chairperson, Panel of Judges, Accurate Time Keeper, ladies and gentlemen. Now, what opposition fails to realize in this debate is that this debate doesn't seek government to prove that volunteerism is the savior of the Ghanaian, of the Ghanaian economy, or that volunteerism is the thing that will save us from the shackles of underdevelopment or whatever. What it asks us to do is prove that one, volunteerism is indeed lost in the Ghanaian culture, which I'll prove to you as he fails to see, and two, show you how that in itself is going to be requisite to help salvage development and aid in little ways that in themselves are requisite to push a developing nation like Ghana to where we seek to be. Start off with some rebuttals. One, Ziyad claims that volunteerism doesn't, is, um, is not lost in Ghana and we have people who donate to worthy costs in their life. We agree, but these are singular cases that show like, volunteerism going on in the system. But let me prove to you on a large scale, how there's number of interest going on in the country. Now, take a classic example of the National Service Scheme, where students are posted after their teacher education to go out there to work. You have majority of students who come out trying to find areas where they can go in there to loot money to, to, to aid themselves, showing a spirit of not only less to work voluntarism, but rather a monetary incentive being what's at fault of what they want, as opposed to uh, the, the main aim of voluntarism being them going out to work to aid the populace. Now, this last section of students who come out of the population are, 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 are evidence of how the populace is not getting towards volunteerism off late, and how the majority of us, even though we still have single instances of volunteerism, are not willing to aid in the status quo to aid volunteerism and showing how we need sensitive students to do so. Also, on how volunteerism is relevant to liberating the Ghanaian economy. Now, as I said early on, it's not up to us to prove how volunteerism is going to be the sole savior of saving the Ghanaian economy. And evidently, like, we think it's true that there is no way volunteerism will be a singular way or means of aiding an economy to reach them, uh, to reach whatever goals they want to reach. But however, what we have to prove to you is how volunteerism itself is going to be a requisite tool to aid development. Now, why do I say this? On two levels. One, we tell you development begins with a sensitized, a sensitized populace. Now, we tell you that with volunteerism, Volunteerism possesses a spirit where people who take part in the activities are sensitized to do so because they believe in the will of aiding their country to develop. That itself is the fulcrum of any country's development since them being sensitized to like, aid their countries is the very start of genesis of any country developing. So without the spirit in there, you have no, you have no country going on since the people themselves aren't willing to be sensitized to go on. Which is very that thing is in, found in volunteerism and we push for and believe will aid the country to reach where we want to reach over to our goals. Secondly, on the nature of developing countries and governments and how volunteerism will aid to push us wherever we want to reach. Now we tell you that within every developing country, governments are hard pressed since all around, all people are asking them to aid them in various ways, building roads, schools, hospitals. Now we tell you that since these governments are hard pressed, they can meet the demands of each and every single one of the populace at a point in time where they will need to do so 
use the majority of people who need help, and the government being hard pressed with funds and time to do so and reach out to everyone simultaneously. And no, it's a hard pressed teaming demands like flood victims, like monetary issues and the like. So, what then do we do as citizens who can aid? Within communities, we have people who are wealthy and the rich who can aid, like, who can aid these causes by giving out to the poor and the, and the vulnerable and helping them to save their immediate situations as opposed to waiting for the government to in the, in the latter times, bringing it to my third rebuttal on unav unavailable structures. Now, we do believe that in the there could, there could be unavailable structures in developing countries which could even be volunteerism. Now, but why do we still think that volunteerism can still work in these countries? Or again, on two levels. One, we think that within developing nations, the nature of the economy allows a wealthy class to still have enough resources and money circulates in that state. And so the, the wealthy class in, in societies can be able and competent, able to aid development by volunteerism, by donating to courses and helping them to, um, to do to do via certain courses like donating for said and like work in time of like, insurgents. Secondly, limited to just say monetary given. But the volunteerism goes beyond those frontiers and goes to communal, communal and other stuff which just require normal energy and normal uh, time and resources that people have um, have for them. And so we believe that even within the poorest in the in the district area, they don't need money per se to be able to volunteer to aid courses. But simply giving time, money, energy, and the like for issues like communal labor and the like are all forms of volunteerism, which you think will go on to help the country, considering our poor sanitary conditions within, the, within um, our country. Now, matter, I'll add more flesh to what the Prime Minister said with regard to volunteerism. One, on volunteerism being an instrument of change in developing countries, we tell you developing countries need a dire sense of urgency with regard to solving their problems. And the governments are hard pressed and cannot reach out to all these at, at simultaneously. As such, what would the world do to aid these situations? Do they all sit back and wait for the government to reach out to everyone? Which will be impossible due to the log logical nature of this. And, or, secondly, do they aid by coming out voluntarily to aid courses via donations, by outreach and like, which people do, like for example, doctors, um, Ghanaian doctors, up with human doctors to go out to the north to reach out to um, the sick out there to help them in the north, as opposed to for doctors to reach them and um, to put it to the, the northern areas to aid them. Thank you very much. All right, can we have the first supporting speaker against the motion? Chairperson, panel of judges, accurate timekeepers. My name is Safo Kwame Oheneba. Greetings from the Vandal City. The chair of the house, government loses this debate when they characterize us as the side who is saying we shouldn't volunteer. We are for volunteerism. What we are saying is that if you are to blame our lack of development in Ghana, you can't say volunteerism is that cause or a contributory factor to that lack of development. That is something they miss in this debate. It is very ironic for us to stand on a stage where we argue, yes, uh, sponsors a program about promoting great leaders in the future, something which is voluntary. They are not going to get any monetary gain or anything from it. They sponsor people to come here and sit down. And at the end of the day, you tell me volunteerism is an interest which is lost in Ghana. We feel this is a disregard to voluntary groups like Destiny Child Foundation, which is made up of the social works of Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology, which comes together to make sure that they go for charity and make sure they alleviate poverty in our society. We believe that you disregard this when you tell me that volunteerism is an interest that is lost. We believe that is false. Volunteerism is not lost and it's in the status quo. Now, engaging Solomon. Solomon, to use a point to win, talks about national service scheme and the way people use national service scheme. We believe national service scheme is not something which is voluntary because if you don't do your national service, you can't become an MP. They check all these things. These things are prerequisites to become big people in the future. So it's not something which is uh, vol voluntary has to be free will. It is not something which is free will. You are obligated to do it. So don't come and talk about national service here. He comes here and he also talks about the agency and the need to sensitize people. People in the status quo are already sensitized. That is why people who can't contribute in their any way goes on, uh, goes on radio and bring out their frustration and how they feel that the country should develop. These are always people are volunteering. So I'll come to my point where I show you that volunteerism as an interest is not lost, but it's because of something constrained like monetary factors and lack of resources. That's why we can't see it. Now they characterize voluntarism again as something which is supposed to be grand, like building Dia tells you, even in helping us get here, the person indirectly has volunteered. We give you an example of even Kwame Despite when he built a, a child maternity ward for the 37 military hospital. All these are voluntarism acts and they should close, they should pay close attention to it. Now let's take them. Please who has heard of Turkmenistan in this book? 
no one has heard of Turkmenistan. Turkmenistan is the first country which has the highest voluntary rate. Turkmenistan rates ahead of US, they rate ahead of the UK. They have the highest voluntary rate. Yet still, Turkmenistan is so impoverished and it's underdeveloped. Turkmenistan has gas natural resources, but cannot make good use of that natural resources. Then what is the need of this voluntarism? Voluntarism is high, they surpass America, they surpass UK, and yet still they are impoverished. We tell you that voluntarism, there is no nexus between voluntarism and development. I give you the second most contributing country to voluntarism is Myanmar and we all know what's going on in Myanmar with the Rohingya Muslim and a lot of ethnic cleansing. It's a place which is a living hell to live in and yet though they are the people with the highest voluntarism in the country. There is no connection. There is no correlation. There is no relationship between voluntarism and development. Now on the impact, we tell you that even if voluntarism, every single person in this building volunteers, we are still not going to feel the maximum impact on our development because you may have the interest to volunteer but because of constraints like let's say you are going to build a school you might have the capital sometimes all right but that money to maintain that school you have built you will end up having schools which uses stones as mounds and stuff like that we believe that this capital this constraint people have the interest but they lack that constraint and if you say we have gained something then if we have lost voluntarism you have to pay logic that means we had voluntarism in the past and now we have lost it but we tell you that when we had voluntarism in the past, if that's what they claim, then Ghana should have been very developed because we had voluntarism. But research shows that our HDI level and our GDP level has risen even in a year which you are saying voluntarism is lost. So comparatively, 1990s or in the past where you said we gained voluntarism, per this status quo which you claim we don't have voluntarism, our development level is even higher than the times where you said we lack voluntarism. The chair of the house, we need to make something very clear in this debate. We tell you that for something to become a contributory factor, that means it has to be very significant. We believe that the contribution of voluntarism is insignificant or not that much to be classified as a voluntary factor. An example is if I go to the Agbo Bolushi market and parliament wants to solve something like air pollution, uh, excuse my language, but let's say Ziad fat at Agbo Bolushi market, but Ziad fatting at Agbo Bolushi market is not going to be something parliament has to stand on to say we are going to ban air pollution. The things they will look at are the drain gutters and stuff like that. We have pressing needs like corruption and all other stuff. Thank and you. Terrorism is not the cause of our lack of development. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Shall we have the second supporting speaker for the motion? Panel, fellow debaters, ladies and gentlemen, before I focus on the contribution of opposition to this debate, we would handle some rebuttals of the cases of opposition. Now, first, on the argument on how voluntarism is not a contributing factor, giving examples of Turkmenistan and Myanmar, we tell you exclusively from proposition that states truly improve mainly by capitalism and all that they say. Now, Ghana is doing all of this. Trying to and I is trying to improve by putting in all places to ensure that we are industrialized and we capitalize and we need to develop. Yet, the progress is extremely slow and we are facing very urgent problems in Ghana. So, in the absence of governments with certain regions, what do we do in the meantime to save thousands of lives who are suffering? You volunteer by offering free labor to help these people to alleviate their problems so they can also contribute to national development. Secondly, they tell you that this debate is about voluntarism and as, a, as a significant contributing factor. Now, we tell you that Ghana is a developing country. That means that our needs are very, very urgent. People are dying from malaria, aside from urgent problems. Now, let's take them at their best. Even if voluntarism would help only 1% of citizens, that is hundreds of thousands of individuals who will now be capable of contributing to the national development of the country. So their arguments on that basis is very ludicrous. Thirdly, we tell you that voluntarism is lost in Ghana for the following reasons. Now we tell you that proportional to the wealth in Ghana, proportional to the youth size of Ghana, statistics which we show you from proposition, they just tell you about an individual who escorted them to this place. We give you statistics from GHS, we give statistics from the four, from the four poverty initiative, etc., to show you why statisticians have brought our reports to prove that voluntarism is on the low. They give you only assertions, and hence we can't take them at their best in this debate. Now, on our fourth point, we show you how production and productivity as the way forward even better helps our part. Now, production of goods and services 
is a capitalist world that they cherish on their side. Now, by providing free labor from voluntarism and reducing the amount of capital spent on paying individuals, you have even more money to capitalize and industrialize because then you have more money left over to build more factories to industrialize and capitalize as they see on their side. Now, on their fake argument that government should take more responsibility, we tell you that government is faced with so many limitations and plagued with the evils of politics. Now, citizens should not be spectators, should not be spectators as given by our own president. So we as citizens should be the change that we want to see in the country by volunteering. Now, they also tell you that people cannot volunteer because they can, don't have the money, they don't have the ability, they don't have the etc. So people live in plush hostels. Students own Range Rovers. Politicians and businessmen own a lot of wealth. If the poor cannot do it, these select people have the ability and the placement to volunteer to help a community. We are proud to propose. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, second supporting speaker, for the motion. We would still like to acknowledge our sponsors. And the show is proudly brought to you by Yaz, range of products. Yaz, pads, sanitary towels, great for the month. Every lady should be able to get their Yaz sanitary towel for very comfortable feeling during the month. All right, we'll take on our second supporting speaker against the motion. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Ankoma Kelvin from Commonwealth Hall. The first question in this debate, we talk to you about voluntarism not being lost. As against they telling you that voluntarism is being lost in the status quo. We gave you instances about like the narrative being preached in a society. We needing to prove and like educate people. Already in the status quo, we see people are volunteering because that's the stance, right? They paint a picture that voluntarism is only about giving grants and giving money, right? But students, even in the tertiary institutions, as Safo told you, creating NGOs, trying to do a little step to help, it's all about volunteerism because they're not doing this for any monetary reward. They're doing it to help society. As against them telling you that the Ghana Health Service, right? They give you a, a, something about Ghana Health Service and saying that because people are not healthy in the health sector. That's case, like. It's a burden on government as they had proof to you in this debate, right? We are talking about little things that individual citizens do that contribute to development in the country. So on that clash, most importantly, we show you and taking them at their best and saying that even though volunteerism is lost, it's not a major contributing factor. We tell you that for something to be discussed as a contributory factor in the country's development means that when the thing is not there, right, like we should have a high impact, right? We gave you analysis of a country like Japan and China. They invested in science and technology and all these things, created the basis for their development, right? It was not issues about volunteerism or whether volunteerism is lost or not. We think that it's very problematic. So we tell you that volunteerism, even though in the status school, let's say that even if it's lost, we say, it's not a contributory factor we should concentrate all our efforts on to solve, right? Then we tell you, giving you the, like, the parallel relationship between voluntarism and development, we tell you that looking at countries such as Myanmar and uh, Turkmenistan, as we give you, right, there's voluntarism upright, there's voluntarism going on in the status quo, but what correlation has it got with development? We say that concentrate on the key factors that lead to the development of a country other than these things, right? Then we tell you on a realistic case, like most importantly, let's say um, the impact of voluntarism. So let's say even if voluntarism is on the high, but no, we see that there are structures that inhibit people so let's say we all here have the moral obligation we are all intrinsically motivated to volunteer but we talk about there's no development because the people don't have the capital to actually make the move as this people say secondly we tell you that the structures are inhibiting in themselves so we say personal like self-preservation is very important if i want to go and teach people in some village in ayawa so and like uh, there are bad roads there i think of myself first right these things are inhibiting factors and these things like inhibit the impact of volunteerism so we consider to the fact that yes indeed if every single individual in the country wants to volunteer and hence there are structures such as capital and structures inhibiting these people to volunteer we find that very problematic in the status quo doesn't mean like volunteerism falls flat in this bit but lastly we talk to you about like thank you round of applause for all of them they've done a wonderful job they've done a great job right here and I'm sure we are all very much appreciative of what they've been able to do. Great minds at display. Very, very much intellectual. The Yaz intellectuals. Grooming the next generation of great debaters. The Yaz intellectuals. Grooming the next generation of great debaters. <laughs> all right. So we are proudly sponsored by Yaz. And they've told me they are going to give each and every one of us a present. So uh, don't go just yet. Uh, just, don't go just yet. And we are again supported by 
Capital O2 and Access Bank. All right, so we'll go for a quick break. I love food frosted flakes because it's so crunchy and full of nutrients. All you need is milk. As usual, mom. Nine nine minus three two two. That's it. Yes. Ninety. With cereal flakes has nine essential nutrients with no artificial additives or colors. Yes. Food frosted flakes is rich in vitamin E, B twelve, iron, high in carbohydrates, fiber, protein, sodium, and it's very affordable. Call for him. Down for three variants Frosty Flakes, Choco Flakes, and Corn Flakes. Each bag has 10 mini packs of 50 grams, and each box you buy comes with a free exercise book. Hooch is available in all supermarkets and retail shops. Hooch Frosty Flakes. All you need is milk. Welcome back from that break. All right, so the Yaz Intellectual is fostering national cohesion through dialogue exactly so. and we can see that exactly being displayed here on the stage okay our moderators are ready with their data and then we'll find out which team did justice to their topic the judges scored independently we put our totals together and here are the composite overall totals. One side scored 54.5. Another side scored 71.8. The one side has scored the winning number of 71.8 is those against the motion that is commonwealth and g nelson is scored 54 5. it is the opinion of the judges that these two sides have presented excellent excellent debating skills Let's give them all a round of applause. Once again, congratulations to all the competing teams, to Jen Nelson and also to the winning side, that is the Commonwealth Hall. We would like to say again that in this competition, there are no losers. There are only contributors. So you have all contributed well to the motion. We made a few observations and would like to touch on those observations. We believe that this team has presented one of the most exciting and very academically sound, intellectual and critically well taught competition or presentation and we say congratulations to that. The Jen Nelson side was very poised and very calm in their presentations. They actually sought to establish a construct of volunteerism. They constructed volunteerism from their point of view as it relates to what they were about to present and that we thought was a very good thing they did we didn't have that from the opposing side they also came up with some case scenarios which they wanted to use to establish their point we however found that most of the time the presenters were reading rather than presenting so it's something 
that we hope you would improve upon the next time. We also note that few instances, one of the presenters was pocketing, was putting the, the, the hands or the palms in the pocket. And sometimes we do recognize that is a way of gaining one's composure to be able to flow on the whole. We believe that you did a great job and the points you made attest to that fact. On the side of the um, winning team, that is Commonwealth Hall, it was very intellectual. In fact, the most intellectual that I have observed so far in this competition. This is because you first established the premise and assumptions of the debate or the topic itself. You presented your position. In other words, your thesis statement was very well couched and clearly presented. You raised arguments for and against, and your work was very well researched with good supporting evidence to every point that you sought to advance. The first presenter did a really great job for the team and we say congratulations. The second presenter did very well but occasionally was a little bit quite emotional. Excellent exposition. Thank you very much. Okay, this show was proudly brought to you by Yaz Range of Products, supported by Capital O2 and Access Bank. We'll see you once again. Bye-bye from us. The Association of African Universities, AAU, is an international non-governmental organization set up by universities in Africa to promote cooperation among themselves and the international academic community. Uh, my name is Professor Etienne Ewan Eile. I am the Secretary General of the Association of Universities African Universities, which is based in Accra, Ghana. I will talk about the creation of the Association of Universities Africaine. Euh, il faut remonter dans les années 60 pour pouvoir comprendre le processus. Déjà en 1960, nos dirigeants estimaient que l'éducation est l'outil majeur pour pouvoir lutter contre la pauvreté et assurer le développement. I am not too much a mini. I'm the director of ICT services and knowledge management at the Association of African Universities. The Association of African Universities is a network of 400 universities in Africa. The biggest value that the universities benefit from being members of the association is this big platform that allows them to collaborate, allows them to work together, allows them to teach together. Through this platform, a university in North Africa can work with a university in Southern Africa, and also those in East Africa can work with those in West Africa. Founded November 1967 at a conference in Rabat, Morocco, by heads of African higher education institutions, the association is currently headquartered in Accra, Ghana. My name is Maxwell Amohoit. I'm the Director of Finance of the Association of African Universities. The association sustains itself from contributions from member universities and also from other development partners. Some of our development partners include the World Bank, other governmental agencies like the Swedish International Development Agency, 
UK Department for International uh, Development and other partners. We also receive a lot of support from other governments, especially the government of Ghana. Other partners include the African Union, which is more or less the parent organization of the Association of African Universities. The Association of African Universities hosts the Secretariat for the uh, African Union's Continental Education Strategy. And by so doing, we provide coordinating roles for the African Union in helping members achieve their targets. Déjà en 1960, nos dirigeants estimaient que l'éducation est l'outil majeur pour pouvoir lutter contre la pauvreté et assurer le développement. Et rappelons-nous que les années 60, la décade 60, a été une décade où la plupart des pays africains ont obtenu leur indépendance ou ont, euh, disons, pris les dispositions pour être indépendants. C'était donc aussi l'année de développement, dans la mesure où tous ces pays indépendants devaient se retrouver de temps en temps pour parler de comment mettre ensemble leurs problèmes et trouver une solution commune à leurs problèmes. Et dans ce contexte-là, l'éducation était une priorité pour eux. Surtout l'éducation universitaire. Et sur ce plan-là, les universités aussi se sont organisées grâce à l'UNESCO qui a parrainé plusieurs réunions depuis euh, Madagascar jusqu'au Maroc. My name is Jonathan Umba. I'm the director of research and academic planning. The programs and projects that we run at AAU are consistent with our strategic plan and they are implemented for our higher education stakeholders, namely the higher uh, education institutions in Africa. These programs are implemented in such a way that our stakeholders will get the benefit of membership of our association. And our programs also are aligned with uh, a number of uh, global and uh, international agendas on higher education, including the Continental Education Strategy for Africa and the Agenda 2063. So these programs are aligned with uh, a number of uh, international agendas with a view to promoting higher education in Africa. The AAU is the apex organization and principal forum for consultation, exchange of information, and cooperation among universities in Africa. I am Professor Nkusa Mahao, Vice Chancellor of the National University of Lesotho in the Kingdom of Lesotho in Southern Africa. There are roughly uh, 77 universities that uh, are affiliated with the AAU uh, in the region. But as you might be aware, there are a lot more universities uh, that are as yet to take the membership of the Association of African Universities. Well, universities that are not members of the AU are missing quite a lot. First of all, let's appreciate this one point, that uh, the AAU is a main driver from the angle of training and capacitating the human resources of the continent the agenda of the African Union 2063. So if a, an institution is not on board, it is missing the opportunity to leverage on uh, the uh, opportunities that are provided by the association in the area of uh, training, uh, human resource capital, training their own staff and students, um, the opportunities uh, that are provided by uh, the universalization of quality management uh, on higher education uh, on the continent um, and many other opportunities that are provided. Et en 1963, 
Il y a eu une réunion à Khartoum, au Soudan, où les chefs des institutions d'enseignement supérieur ont décidé de créer euh, l'association des universités africaines. Finalement, la création va se faire à une conférence qui s'est tenue à Rabat au Maroc et la création de l'association des universités africaines a eu lieu le 12 novembre 1967. Plasma University. Mogadishu, Somalia. We really like to give a call for universities in in Africa, especially in East Africa, those which are not members still in the Association of uh, African Universities. Uh, be, we are calling them because we feel the organization is ours. It represents the voice of higher education in Africa being seen all over the world. Are you an institution or individual? Do you intend to organize a memorable event to be archived for future reference? Then look no further than AAU Studios because it's your best bet with our spacious studio and state-of-the-art media equipment such as 4K Panasonic video cameras, Kinoflow lights, assorted microphones, live streaming equipment, among others, you are sure to get the best of productions. Visit us at Trinity Avenue, East Legon, adjacent the National Accreditation Board, or contact the AAU Studios via the following email addresses, info at aau.org, aautv at aau.org, or ransford at aau.org. Alternatively, you can call us on plus 233-244-736280. in addition of the CGC show, The Trusted Pathway to Your Dreams. We are coming to you live from the headquarters of the Association of African Universities of Ghana, and I am your host, Aja Omi. The CGC show is a career guidance and counseling show that seeks to promote or make you know the various career opportunities available in various fields of study, and of course, demystify your thoughts that some courses we study in our universities are not marketable. Do follow our social media platforms at AAU underscore TV on Twitter, Association of African Universities on Facebook and YouTube, and AAU TV official on Instagram. I have two beautiful guests with me today, but before I introduce them, let's go for a break. When we come back, I'll introduce them and tell you the topic to be discussed. Are you an institution or individual? Do you intend to organize a memorable event to be archived for future reference? Then look no further than AAU Studios because it's your best bet 
with our spacious studio and state-of-the-art media equipment such as 4K Panasonic video cameras, Kinoflow lights, assorted microphones, live streaming machines and others, you are sure to get the best of production. Visit us at Trinity Avenue, East Legon, adjacent the National Accreditation Board or contact the AAU studio via the following addresses. Info at aau.org, aautv at aau.org, Ransford at aau.org. Alternatively, you can call us on 0244-185-998 or 0244-693-342. Welcome back. If you just tuned in, you are watching the CGC show on AAU TV. My guests for today are two beautiful women that I have. Betty Adam, who is a graphic designer. She's worked with GH1 TV and Vasat One and currently working with GH Music Live. And also I have Ophelia Aqua, who is an illustrator and of course a graphic designer. And they will be helping us, they'll be discussing what graphic designing entails. All that it is you need to know about graphic designing. We'll be delving into the issue right now. So welcome on the show. Thank you. Thank you. Tell me, um, let me start with you, Betty Adam. Can you tell me what influenced you to choose in graphic design? Or wait, basically, um, tell me what graphic designing is to you. Okay, I think graphic designing is my passion. Like to me, I grew up loving art. I grew up loving anything, color, anything I can draw. Like I used to draw when growing up. So when I got to the level where you have to pick on what you want to do. People were choosing signs and I stood by like visual arts. And everybody was wondering why visual arts because it, it, people thought when you go to school, they don't, you don't choose visual arts. They give it to you based on your grades. But I had good grades and I chose visual arts. So people were surprised. Like, oh, so you chose visual arts. So I think graphic design is basically something I wanted to do or I want to do. I didn't just get up and say, oh, things are not going on well, so at least let me try graphic design. I grew up loving it, so yeah. Miss Ophelia, tell us what really influenced your decision. Um, I guess it's similar to hers. Um, I love color too, very much. And I love beautiful things. I didn't exactly choose graphic design, um, or at least visual arts in uh, secondary school because I didn't know there was a cause for that kind of thing. <laughs> I just loved to draw color. I drew anything I saw too. Um, my teacher chose that for me and I had a friend whose mom advised me that that is a cause to do because in Europe art really sells a lot. And so I did visual arts and then after getting into the class I realized wow this is everything I really loved. And so, yeah, I spent all my time in the library reading about art, art history, and it was everything I loved. Um, personally, I don't see myself doing anything else. I'm art, that, that is me, so yeah. Um, tell, tell me, Ophelia, um, what do you think a good graphic designer should have? I mean, we're looking at the world right now, a lot of people just take up some to, um, designing software or whatever and then they just learn something and they feel okay I am a graphic designer what makes a graphic designer a very good one or um, if it's not the most important thing it's to be very creative so you need to think differently and artists are very creative people Personally, when I'm looking for a good graphic designer, I look for someone who has a good eye and a very good understanding. Because um, apart from art, what graphic design truly is, is the ability to communicate simply. So you communicate in a way which is simple for everyone involved to understand and appreciate. And so I really look out for people who are very creative people who have a good eye to see things and pick things and people who have very good understanding of what must be. But if you have the first one and you're very creative, it's possible you have the others too. So it's, it's, if it's not the most important thing, creativity, that is. Um, let me come to you, Miss Betty. What, what do you think um, um, a graphic designer 
like okay let me put it this way a lot of graphic designers tend to be advertisers or marketers in a way why is there a linkage or a relationship something that links them with them together okay personally i am a graphic designer at the same time um let me see a social media manager and has to do with marketing so graphic design most at times it's about branding like a company bringing you okay like you say i'm a company i've come to you or oh, i'm starting this job or i'm doing that you are the one who is going to make the company what it is let's take coca-cola for example people know coca-cola for their logo and their color and whatever it has to do with it their adverts everything all is graphic design all is art so i think yes graphic design like really involves advertisement too and if you go to the tertiary institutions most um graphic design courses they have advertisements under them so i think they have a link yeah ophelia yeah um like she's saying ad advertisement is one of the types of graphic designs around here people usually solicit for designers when they need adverts mm -hmm. there are other types of graphic designers too um she touched on branding so that covers visual identity designers okay. you could find a ui graphic designer he designs user interfaces for mobile apps and that's all they do they are environmental graphic designers they are a motion graphic designers and they are also um i already touched on visual identity yes. design yeah editorial graphic designers so they are people who decide that okay this is all i'm going to do and that's all they, they do i know someone all he does is design logos and that's all he's good at mm -hmm. and that's and all he's he good does. at it can so it. yeah it depends on the jobs you are getting and the area you are where you live so yeah that is why it may seem like most graphic designers are designing advertisements but it, it's the terrain yeah okay so like i said earlier you know this um unprofessional people that are coming up they learn a few things at their own disposal and then they feel or they get they think they are also as good as the people who have attended the universities they've done visual communication and that is what they're doing is is that not affecting anything your business in terms of work and all that is it not affecting it um, Ophelia no I do not feel challenged by that because graphic design is not knowing Photoshop or Corel Draw any of those things. I take graphic design like my sketch pad and Corel Draw is like a sketch pad. If I give you one and I give her one and I take one, what I put on it is what shows who I am. So I don't feel challenged by that because the clients see the differences. Mm -hmm that okay this person tried this thing for me but the person lacks a certain depth and a certain understanding that is where you realize that knowing the software is not enough you really have to know something more and graphic design is about solving problems so what problem are you solving i get that all the time i i have people who bring jobs that someone else did that they didn't like and it happens often it happens so so i don't feel challenged at all miss betty anything? not at all because if you put up a work that was done by just a roadside graphic designer i'll say a roadside graphic designer and somebody who really loves it who really went to study it you totally see the difference mm -hmm. right, right yeah you, you see the difference vast difference i mean this group where it's made up of graphic designers and most people put in works they've done like to show off Oh, I did this work. Is there any correction? And you realize that this person who plays this particular work in the group didn't really, really study about graphic design or didn't really have the passion about it. Maybe the person just got up and said, Oh, everybody is into graphic design now, so I'm also a graphic designer. Because how the person plays objects, text, mm -hmm. like, like it was yeah. off. Sure. So I think, um, yeah. I'm not challenged by the roadside graphic design because I know what I bring to the table and clients know the difference. They really know the difference between a roadside graphic design and somebody who is professional about it. Yeah.
So you are saying most of the time that people who want quality work go to the professionals like yourselves. They don't just go to the roadside people. Most people too, it's about their money. I love money. You can't <laughs> just bring me a work and expect me to charge you the amount the roadside person charge because I put, uh, I, I, I tell you to bring me a brief. I make it professional. I don't do, oh, okay, call me. Uh, please, I want a design. I'm making a cake. I want a design or this, that, that. No, you bring me a brief of what you want. Put it down in a written form. Then I go ahead to analyze, brainstorm, and all that. But the other people, I've seen people copy my artworks a lot. The things I work with, we also have a graphic designer there. The, uh, we saw a post and it was just the same thing. And you realize that how the other person did it, it's not like how the guy at my workplace did. You get, it was total. It was the same position. Like the texts were the same, mm -hmm. colors the same, but it was different. Although it was the same, but you see, it was different. So you see that there's professionalism somewhere in mm -hmm. the is. So most clients, I love money. So when you come, I'm going to give you. Yeah, I told you I love money. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to. I'm going to. Give, you give me a brief of what you want. We deal with it professionally. That's how. Um, what yeah. are some of the challenges that you face um, with, in, like, in the profession? Do you okay. think... I actually have problems with clients. I don't know about you. <laughs> I have <laughs> problems <laughs> <laughs> with clients. It's my job. But on the other hand, the client feels she knows what she wants. But I know what can be best understood by those you are targeting mm -hmm. maybe you bring me a food um a, a brief on, on food like you want something done about food and i use the colors that best explains or describe food supplements or something and then you go like oh me i want like they have a favorite color in their head the one black <laughs> i've had um um, an experience on that. The one black, but black doesn't really match with food. If you want food, if you want to um, communicate food stuff, green. If you want to communicate water, blue. Like colors have meanings and all that. But my eye is different from the client's eye. I always have. I don't have problem with graphic design itself. I don't have problem with my softwares mm -hmm. or anything. It's the clients I have problems with. <laughs> they are very troublesome. <laughs> so I may do something and I know this is this is just like I've killed it. But you send it then the client has this long um changes they need to do. And one funny thing is that when they make changes and you send it, like the exact changes you made you send it. <laughs> They come back mm -hmm. different, like different from the ones you made. Then you send it. Then they come back. Then they they now want the one you did first. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I the just one you I just encountered you did in, in consult. Yes, them on the one you did first. I I had one encounter with um uh, one client. I'll mention the name. It's a huge association. I'll mention. It. They wanted something done for something. Then. I used, they sent me a sample that is what they need, like, so okay, I picked the color samples and all, that is what they need. We did everything, went back and forth, they, they never spoke about the color. After I have made all changes, the last one, that's when they spoke about the color. <laughs> <laughs> so like, graphic design, I don't know if you have other things, other issues, but my basic problem is my clients, they don't see what I see. It's the okay. same problem. <laughs> it's the same problem everywhere. Um, I feel that you know most clients are not trusting, mm -hmm. and the solutions you offer them sometimes really the best because you know you've had time to think about it, and you you've experimented and you realize that no, this is going to work. What you're saying is not going to work, and they tend to always lean to their own ideologies. And well, for me, when it gets too far beyond what I can tolerate and the work is starting to look like something which is not me. <laughs> I just let them know that, you know, I cannot continue to work on exactly. this.
sometimes I, I go like, okay, I'm going to do the work for you, but please, I'm not the one who did this work. <laughs> 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 like, it's true. I'm not the one. Don't say anywhere that you did, it. did this work because I didn't do it. I followed your steps. I didn't use mine. I use your brain so to you do the So you give the, your clients the credit. Not that I give the kind of credit, but don't say anywhere that <laughs> no, I No, she did doesn't it. associate with the work. Yes. <laughs> but you did say, it. I did it, but I didn't do it. Do you get me? <laughs> I, I held the mouse. I held the pad. Yeah. I looked at the screen, mm -hmm. but I didn't do the work. You did it from wherever you were. You said, oh, you want this color, but I prefer another thing. You want this text, so I prefer another thing. So when it becomes something that can really sell me, I tell you, yo, I didn't do. I didn't do this. When someone asks, I, I can do it for you. When someone asks you, don't just tell them I didn't do it. And one of my colleagues was coming up with something that this, this is what actually we put in our invoices now. I do the work for you. You have only just two chances to change anything after those two are done you are paying for the next changes oh i already have that because you can't <laughs> waste my time seriously Sweet. you can't wait especially what happened like i did everything changes 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 then you prefer the one i did first mm -hmm. you wasted my whole time yeah. and people think graphic designers like take time to work i do my things on work even if you yeah you go like oh i need it in two weeks I won't work two other to me, but I'll make sure I provide it mm -hmm. to you. So you've basically wasted my whole time. The time I could have used to get money, and I'll say it again, I love money. Mm -hmm. So the time I could have used to get another client on board, yeah, you've taken the whole... And, you, and you're comfortable because you're not paying for it. <laughs> you That's it? another problem too with mm -hmm. graphic design. You meet a lot of people who are unwilling to pay for your services. And that is why many people would also choose a road sign yes, designer. Exactly. The truth is that they're not actually looking for quality. They're just looking for free. And they'll, they'll get the closest thing to free, which is cheap. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So, many people do not really capitalize on good design. There are few people who know what they want and where to find it, and they go for it and pay any amount. But many people just want to take things for granted. So, yeah. Wow, this is getting really interesting. <laughs> Let's go for a quick break. When we come back, we'll delve into the issue more. Stay tuned. Four years ago, like most young people, I was clueless as to what I wanted to do and which institution would help me realize a great career. What better place to pursue this dream than Blue Cross College, with state-of-the-art lecture halls and experienced lecturers, as well as equipped computer labs, Blue Crest is indeed the right starting point. With certificate, diploma and degree programs in information technology, business administration, journalism, oil and gas, Bluecrest is the one-stop institute for everyone who is looking to have a great career. Enroll now. Visit www.bluecrest.edu.gh or call any of the numbers on the screen. Bluecrest College. Education for life. Welcome back. If you just tuned in, you are watching the CGC show on AU TV. We've been discussing graphic designing as a professional career. And my guests have already spoken about some of the challenges they face and the experiences so far. Let me ask this, Bethlehem. What are some, um, what is the expertise required in this field? Okay, as she said, creativity. <laughs> Say no, that again. Want creativity okay yes yeah you should be creative you should be able to brainstorm quickly because some clients when they approach you for a job they come like i want it tomorrow mm -hmm. and like thinking is so so stressful i hate stress but thinking is so stressful so you must be creative if you are creative you easy you easily like come up with ideas and you easily put up stuff together because mm -hmm. you are dealing with texts you are dealing with colors you are dealing with an image some clients send you images that you know oh it won't match it or it won't do this but you still have to think and more creative. and also like patience yes and then you suck all your clients away <laughs> and you suck all your clients away if you can add up miss yeah. sophie yeah tell um, us. apart from creativity and patience i think also a good mastery of your tools your softwares that you use is also 
very necessary. Because um, what's the use of being creative if you cannot translate it for it to be used? So you need to learn what needs to be learned. And I think a lot of people already have that base covered. They just need to cover the creativity bit. So your illustrators, uh, photoshops, coral drawers, light rooms, and whatever other software there is to be used. If you have that base covered, it's also very necessary. And as she's saying, you have to have good people skills. Um, once again, it's a job for people and about people and to people. So kind of like democracy anyway. But <laughs> yes, you need to know how to communicate well with people. Attitude is one thing which won't get you far in graphic design. Because when you're good to the client, even though they may be mean to you by not paying, still being patient and good to them sort of brings them back. Because, you know, someone may not readily pay for your services, but they may bring in a bigger client. Because yeah. people have links, so you need to have very good people skills. And, yeah. And as you're willing to learn, you mm -hmm. can't stay at one place. When I started graphic design, I was doing coral job. Then I moved to Photoshop. I stood at Photoshop like I was just there. And people were advancing. Like people were learning. And I was just there and I, I saw that I was lacking. Mm -hmm. So if you have the learning ability, you want to learn, you want to push more. Yes, you also go for in graphic design. So you must be willing to learn. Yes. And also you must be willing to accept corrections and critics. Like if someone says your work is not bad, you must stand, you must smile <laughs> and want to correct it. Because mm -hmm. people criticize your work any day. Yeah. It would be nice for the topmost designer in the world, but a mere someone will see it and be like, yo, it's not nice and blah blah blah. Mm -hmm. So you must can um miss betty can someone take graphic designing as a job and do it um, say part-time and um, some people you know people have these side jobs and all of that but we are talking about graphic designing as a profession what um what will be the difference between somebody who has taken it up to his or herself to do um graphic designing as a full-time job as a career and then somebody who is doing graphic designing as a part-time job Okay, one thing I like about graphic design is you can work from anywhere. I've worked in a Chosky before. Wow. My boss just called me, blah, 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 my client. I had to open my laptop to do something because it's a client you are dealing with. She doesn't care where you are. She said she wanted it at five. Produce it at five. No excuses. That's how we work. So I feel part-time and someone doing part-time can show you his or her work and it will be like is the person's major something. Mm -hmm. I can say I'm doing graphic design part-time. I can say I'm doing it as a major something. So I think graphic design, it de and also it depends on the passion. I can sit somewhere and be like, I'm a professional. I've been hired to be a graphic designer for this company, but my passion is not there just because I like the name graphic design. And I'm sitting in an office in a big chair behind a big um, <laughs> PC. I'm a graphic designer, but someone doing part-time may over the person sitting at one place doing graphic design. Mm. I think graphic design is, helps you be like, how do they call that word? What is the name for it? Versatile? Yes. Versatile. Um, my boss has this word for it, because when I first signed up to the company, he was like, you can work from home. Flexible. Exactly, flexible. He was like, you can work from home. But I chose to go to the office every day. Yeah. So will I say it's part-time or it's professional? <laughs> it's, it, so it's, it's that way. It's flexible. It's flexible. You can do I'm it doing full-time, full but I'm, I'm doing it from anywhere I feel comfortable. Yeah. yeah. And so you're saying that even when you're 
let's say you're in the washroom and someone asks you to do something <laughs> you have your laptop and you're working <laughs> oh yeah if you it happens every day you can send it to the washroom and wait. then your job is, is quite interesting you oh, know it's very interesting <laughs> because some people have the challenge that they would have to be rushing to the office especially when your workplace is actually far from where you live mm -hmm. and so if i think graphic design is something that is a profession that people should a major tool is actually, actually yeah and the whites have made it mm -hmm. really like easy for you to carry about it's not like a pc that is at one pc you have, yes. to, work. You have to go to work you know that mm -hmm. carry a laptop around anyway all you need is a good laptop it's got, it's and okay. a mouse in the mouse but but now if you even have the surface pro the ipad mm -hmm. pro forget all of that you can wow. work on the go so Thank you need wi-fi <laughs> very necessary that's why i go to work how how do you how do you get to know of the apps that are coming up in the in the field like graphic designing like you mentioned you have photoshop you have um, like um coral yeah. draw how do you get to know that okay this is an advanced um um this is an advanced um, type of photoshop or this is an advanced type of coral draw how do you identify that this app is good for this kind of work that i want to do so i said if you're a graphic designer you must be willing to learn mm -hmm. and explore don't just sit down and say oh okay i went to school i've been taught photoshop that's okay <laughs> that's why i follow she also yeah. does i follow design human i follow so many designers mm -hmm. and they post so many things so if they post it i'm willing to learn oh what did he post yeah and i go search for it and i find out oh okay this is what you can use this for oh there's a new software in town or something yeah, yeah. so it's by learning following mm -hmm. researching I mean, once you're interested in the field, you need to learn everything there is about it. And yeah. I mean, every year a new iPhone is released. So every year they upgrade they the software. So you just need to know that you, it's oh, time to get Oh, they'll need it. graphic designers to do all those stuff. Come again. Do they need graphic designers in updating the software and all of that? No, those who made it update it. Yes. Those who created the software update the software. So they just like just who created yeah, yes. iPhone. They make yes, another one so for you. So we have our people who put up the software. So they are saying, oh, maybe we can make these changes or we can mm -hmm. input this or oh, this is not working because sometimes you have problems with Photoshop, kicking uh -huh. all that crashes, yeah. all that. So they make. There are different communities. Okay. So like she's saying, it's all about following and mm -hmm. learning, and. Once you keep tabs, you will not miss an update. Yeah. yeah. Just like fashionistas. Mm -hmm. I love fashion. <laughs> Album is follow someone who is in the fashion industry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. You will not so, miss an update. Same as us. I follow so many designers and they post a lot. So if you see me on my phone, please, I'm not just. <laughs> 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 well, I read somewhere that um, graphic designing is not really an art but a science because you guys go through a step-by-step -step approach into arriving at a specific design miss sophie tell me about it how um i don't know who wrote that but i will counter it and say that every art is a science because there isn't anything that you do without thinking but yes graphic design is not it doesn't just happen because for you to be a very good graphic designer, you need to be um, a good politician. <laughs> you need to be um, a good dietitian. You need to be, um, I don't know, um, somebody who's good with geography. Yeah. You need to be a good economist. You need to know a lot about everything. Thing. So. You need to know a bit of architecture, a bit of science, a bit, because you are going to design for these people and others to easily understand what they do. So if you don't understand it yourself, how can you translate it for others to understand? So yeah, people um, do not understand that. They feel it's an easy thing. Oh, um, um, I want to put a car on, on, on my billboard. Then there's an app. There's a software. When you open it, you just press car on a billboard. And then they bring some nice car that you're imagining that you mm -hmm. haven't told anyone. And they suddenly reach your mind. It doesn't do that. 
you have to think deeply and bring from within you what you want to communicate so it's it's that sort of thing mm -hmm. it's that sort of thing where you need to think a lot you need to reason a lot so you need to be a very reasonable person mm -hmm. to know that okay this is for this group of people this is how they live and these are their dreams and their aspirations what can i sell to them how can i sell it to them how can I frame it so that it gets them, it touches them? You need to think about all these things. And now when you start thinking about it, you're going into psychology. And <laughs> so, yes. yeah, it, it's that kind of science. Yeah. I see. Um, Betty Adam, can you tell me your biggest contract so far? Hmm. My biggest? My biggest always comes from my, uh, where I'm working with. So basically from my... My biggest is with Ghana Music Live. It's actually an app. Oh, yeah, okay. an app that um, sells music. But we don't really sell music. We, we try to um, sell artists who basically don't have that recognition yet. So it's like we help, and also we help the public too, to easily get music on the app without oh. um, having to buy or do other Apple stuff yeah. like that. Yes, and also we, we do news on the graphic, um, on the GH Music app. So there's news, there's music, there's events, and you can find all of that on the app. Oh, I that's think it's smart. the first ever in Ghana. Oh, wow. wow. Yes. That's Ghana Music nice. Live. <laughs> wow. Congrats yeah. to you guys. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay um i guess my biggest project yet is definitely yet to happen yeah. um i can think of three things that i've done in the past which um two of which were were like a big dream come true for me so the first one was getting to work with um umb um when the they rebranded and launched to umb they needed um, a ufs campaign and so I, w I got the chance to work on that. And wow. I got the chance to meet their MDs and their bosses. I got the chance to meet um, Mila. Um, she was the MD of UMB and then she left. But, you know, after that job, I got to work with her again on Capital Bank. And it was such an honor for me. So that was wonderful. Um, the next thing I would consider very big, it was always a dream for me to do something branding in like in relation to Ghana and during Ghana Assisti um, my boss got the contract and I got the chance to work on the branding the visual appeal for the whole campaign and that was very satisfactory because it was like one big dream I had I mean it didn't expand the way I imagined that it would but just the fact that I got the chance to work on something like that was very pleasing to me. And the third would be GCB. Um, wow. I did the Dear Money. That was the only thing. Okay, well, I did an internal campaign, but I, it, it wasn't a big deal for me like the Dear Money. Because with the Dear Money, you know, you get to meet the boss himself and... And those are the moments which, you know, make me feel kind of like special because they walk in the room and they see a lady and they're thinking, um, is that your secretary? And then, <laughs> and then they get to say, no, she's the head designer on this. And they wow. were like, wow. wow. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, my biggest thing, I guess, is yet to come. I see. Um, we have the segments called the Do You Know segment. And on this segment, we take a jargon or a technical term on based on the subjects that or the topic that we are discussing and so we are going to put the the, the word on our social media platform so do follow at au underscore tv on twitter facebook youtube association of african universities and on instagram at au tv official so you fill in the blank spaces find the letters the missing letters in the word and provide the answer the first three people to provide the answers correctly will win some souvenirs from aau so, um, Betty, give me your final words. What would you like to tell somebody who is reading graphic design and, or, and is confused as to whether he or she will get a job to do or somebody who 
would want to join, uh, would want to do graphic designing? Okay. What well, I'll say is, graphic design is a nice um, thing to take up. At a point, I also had this feeling that is graphic design really for me? Like, I wanted to stop graphic design, but then I mastered the courage and took it upon myself that this is what I want to do. So, please, graphic design is a big deal and it's, it's getting there because now technology is fast taking over. And if you're a designer, you're dealing with technology and all that. So, please, don't lose hope. <laughs> Keep up. Miss mm -hmm. Sophie. Okay, what I would like to say is um, be committed. Learn all that you can and don't give up. There are always people out there who have done what you want to do and you can just look at them and learn. And like everything else in the world, don't give up. Never give up. Yeah. So thank you so much for joining us today to help us to discuss um, graphic designing and I hope you at home also enjoyed today's episode do follow us on our social media platforms at AU underscore TV on Twitter Facebook and YouTube Association of African Universities and on Instagram at AU TV official so you'll be updated on all that it is if you have any questions you can leave the questions in the comments box and we'll respond to them on the next episode so till we come your way next time bye
Africa, welcome to Event Update on AAU TV, the voice of higher education in Africa. Event Update brings you information about upcoming higher education events happening in Africa, and it is brought to you by the Association of African Universities. I am Isabella Tesahinakwa. Je m'appelle Alexandra Mpabajanswane. The World Bank Group is calling for applications for the World Bank Group Young Professional Program, WBGYPP, a two-year leadership development program at the start of a five-year employment contract with the World Bank, International Finance Corporation, IFC, or Multilateral Investment Guarantee Agency, MIGA. This program will recruit and develop future leaders to collaborate effectively across the institutions on joint WBG solutions to development challenges. 
Young professionals are recruited from around the world with various academic and professional backgrounds relevant to the World Bank, IFC and MEGA. Interested applicants must be qualified individuals from diverse professional, academic and cultural backgrounds and must demonstrate a passion for international development, a graduate education, relevant professional experience and the potential to grow into impactful leadership roles across their institutions. To be eligible for the WBG Young Professional Program, applicants must be born on or after 1st October 1988, have a master's or doctoral degree, specialize in a field relevant to YPP business areas, demonstrate relevant professional experience or continuous study at the doctoral level, and be fluent in English among others. Applications for the inaugural WBG YPP cohort are open from 1st June to 30th June 2020 for all profiles and will reopen from 17th August to 21st September 2020 for IFC and MEGA profiles only. Interested applicants should apply online by submitting their CV, academic credentials, two short essays, short summaries of thesis or dissertation for World Bank candidates only, and three professional or academic recommendations. For more information, please visit www.worldbank.org. Le groupe de la Banque mondiale lance un appel à candidature pour le programme des jeunes professionnels du groupe de la Banque mondiale WBG YPP, un programme de développement du leadership de deux ans au début d'un contrat de travail de cinq ans avec la Banque mondiale, la Société financière internationale SFI ou l'Agence multilatérale de garantie des investissements MIGA. Ce programme recrutera et développera de futurs leaders pour collaborer efficacement à travers les institutions sur des solutions conjointes du GPM au défi du développement. Les jeunes professionnels sont recrutés dans le monde entier avec divers antécédents académiques et professionnels pertinents pour la Banque mondiale, la SFI et la MIGA. Les candidats intéressés doivent être des personnes qualifiées de divers horizons professionnels, universitaires et culturels et doivent démontrer une passion pour le développement international des études supérieures, une expérience professionnelle pertinente et le potentiel de devenir des rôles de leadership percutants dans leur institution. Pour être éligible au programme WBG YPP, les candidats doivent naître le 1er octobre 1988 ou après, posséder une maîtrise ou un doctorat, se spécialiser dans un domaine pertinent au domaine d'activité du PJP, démontrer une expérience professionnelle pertinente ou des études continues au niveau du doctorat, parler couramment l'anglais, entre autres. Les candidats pour la première cohorte WBG YPP sont ouverts du 1er juin au 30 juin 2020 pour tous les profils et ouvriront du 17 août au 21 septembre 2020 pour les profils IFC et MIGA uniquement. Les candidats intéressés doivent postuler en ligne en soumettant leur CV, leur diplôme de cours essai, un bref résumé de leur thèse ou dissertation pour les candidats de la Banque mondiale uniquement et trois recommandations professionnelles ou académiques. Pour plus d'informations, veuillez visiter www.wordbank.org. The management of the University of Rwanda is pleased to invite interested and qualified candidates to apply to study PhD programs offered by the African Center of Excellence for Innovative Teaching and Learning Mathematics and Science, ASITLMS, which is based in the College of Education, University of Rwanda. ASITLMS is one of the four Africa Higher Education Center for Excellence supported by the World Bank and it seeks to strengthen human capacity in the delivery of quality teaching and learning of mathematics and science in Rwanda and across the region through collaboration with regional and international institutions. Interested applicants can apply for PhD by research in chemistry education, biology education, mathematics education and physics education. Applicants must have a master's degree in mathematics or science with an undergraduate degree in education or master's degree in education with an undergraduate degree in mathematics or science. Applicants must also have sufficient knowledge of English, should submit a PhD research concept note clearly mentioning innovative aspects to mitigate current local and regional challenges in teaching and learning mathematics and science and in application of STEM knowledge to real life experience. All applicants should submit a detailed CV, notarized copies of certificates and transcripts, a motivation letter, 
two motivational letters from lecturers from your previous institutions, an abstract of master's program dissertation, a PhD research concept note, a sponsorship letter from an organization if applicable, or two recent passport size picture to the link on your screen before 26 June 2020. For more information, please contact Mr. Kiza William via kizawilliam2013 at gmail.com or asitlms at uw.ac.rw or call plus 250-7808-397778. You can also visit www.asitlms.ur.ac.rw. La direction de l'Université du Rwanda est heureuse d'inviter les candidats intéressés et qualifiés à postuler pour étudier les programmes de doctorat offerts par le Centre africain d'excellence pour l'enseignement et l'apprentissage innovant des mathématiques et des sciences ACE-ITLMS, basé à College of Education de l'Université du Rwanda. ACE-ITLMS est l'un des quatre centres d'excellence pour l'enseignement supérieur en Afrique, CEA, soutenu par la Banque mondiale et il cherche à renforcer les capacités humaines dans les prestations de l'enseignement et de l'apprentissage de qualité des mathématiques et des sciences au Rwanda et dans la région grâce à une collaboration avec les régions et les institutions internationales. Les candidats intéressés peuvent postuler pour un doctorat bas recherche en éducation en chimie, en biologie, en mathématiques et en physique. Les candidats doivent avoir un diplôme de maîtrise en mathématiques ou en sciences avec un diplôme de premier cycle en éducation ou un diplôme de maîtrise en éducation avec un diplôme de premier cycle en mathématiques ou en sciences. Ils doivent également avoir une connaissance suffisante de l'anglais, doivent soumettre une note conceptuelle de recherche de doctorat mentionnant clairement les aspects innovants pour atténuer les défis locaux et régionaux actuels dans l'enseignement et l'apprentissage des mathématiques et des sciences et dans l'application des connaissances thèmes à l'expérience réelle. Tous les candidats doivent soumettre un CV détaillé, des copies notariées, des certificats et des relevés de notes, une lettre de motivation, deux lettres de motivation des enseignants des établissements précédents, un résumé de la dissertation du programme maîtrisé, une note conceptuelle de recherche doctorat, une lettre de parrainage d'une organisation si applicable et deux photos récentes de format passeport vers le lien qui s'affiche sur votre écran avant le 26 juin 2020. Pour plus d'informations, veuillez contacter M. Kiza William via Kiza William 2013.gmail.com ou acitlms.ur.ac.rw ou appelez le plus 250 78 08 39 778. Vous pouvez également visiter le site www.acitlms.ur.ac.rw. The Organizing Committee of the International Research Initiative Conference, IREC 2020, has been postponed to 18th to 19th November 2020 due to the novel coronavirus and its accompanying restrictions. The new format for the conference will now be solely virtual and the details of participation in the virtual format will be provided by 1st October 2020. IREC 2020 has extended the deadline for submission of abstract to 24th July 2020. To facilitate your participation, please visit www.iric.us or contact Prince Darko at pdarko at ait.edu.gh for further information. Le comité d'organisation de la Conférence internationale des initiatives de recherche ERIC 2020 a été reporté du 18 au 19 novembre 2020 en raison du nouveau coronavirus et des restrictions qui l'accompagnent. Le nouveau format de la conférence sera désormais uniquement virtuel et les détails de participation au format virtuel seront fournis d'ici le 1er octobre 2020. L'ERIC 2020 a prolongé la date limite de soumission des résumés jusqu'au 24 juillet 2020. Pour faciliter votre participation, veuillez visiter www.iric.us ou contacter M. Prince au point d'arco à pdarco.it.edu.gas pour plus d'informations. That is all for today's update and it is brought to you by the Association of African Universities. Please follow us on our social media platforms at Association of African Universities on Facebook and YouTube, AAUTV underscore African Universities on Twitter, and AAUTV official on Instagram. I am Isabella Tetahenakwa. Je m'appelle Alexandra Johnson.
and then it goes off at 5 or 4 30 when people are supposed to close so i mean so that we know there is nothing to be alarmed about um we are we are we are in a safe place so we we will uh spend the next um one hour or thereabouts um thinking through this this topic um we will talk about the, the question of causation um, <clears throat> and and why we think why it it is such a big issue uh in this training and um by the time we finish we want to be able to uh, differentiate between descriptive and causal research that is fairly simple uh, we, we should be able to talk about the concept of cause within a research context and describe or discuss different causal notions and, and their implications or applications for modern uh, research and then talk about general uh, ways of analyzing a cause um, we will deal with with the first uh, two in this session and after lunch the next uh, the one hour after lunch we will deal with the, the other part um, we were hoping that well so this is another way of stating the the, the outcomes but let's let's um, let's go on straight to work um, so generally speaking we have two types of research in 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 the social sciences in the humanities generally uh, that is the the descriptive type of research and there is the causal uh, uh, type of research and you would agree, I mean, we, we know that each of these calls for a different kind of thinking, a different kind of design, a different kind of analysis, and a different kind of inference. Uh, sometimes problem begins when the design is descriptive, and then the findings are sounding like causal, and then the inferences are sounding like this causal, if there is anything like that, merging descriptive and causal together. I mean, I don't know. Yeah, so, yeah, so it's, um, it can be a problem. And I think this problem occurs because people don't even remember, if they ever knew, that there are, these are two kinds of, 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 of research and that the way we go about them, uh, once we start on, on, on one note, so we, we then, we have to remain loyal to that note up to the end. Um, but then again, you know, um, Susan talked about trained incapacity, borrowing across disciplines, and so on and so forth. We also want to be uh, flexible about this. We need to know this. We need to know uh, um, Then we also need to know if there is, you know, we want to run away as much as possible from making some of these ideas look like laws that really cannot, cannot be bent. Um, so we, we, we have these two, but we need to just, we need to ask, I want to know where, which of these has been your main, you know, your main kind of research, going back to the research that you have done, which one have you done more than the other? Okay, descriptive, I think for most of us it's descriptive. Huh? Descriptive simply says, this is what exists. This is what we see. Um, I see people at Dandora uh, adapting to their environment. That is description. I see that men are quicker to adapt than women. Uh, that is description. I see that there are more young people on Dandora dump site than we have on Ngong dump site, which is another a uh, serious dump site in Kenya where I have also uh, done field work with my colleagues. Some of them. Uh, so all of that is just, is just description. But then Koza says, I can see that this, yeah, is the reason that that exists. In other words, this is the cause of that. 
or this is the product of that. And you see, that, that, which one do you think requires a lot more work? The causal, isn't it? Because I am telling people, you can stake your life on this. And that I am very sure, and, and on and on and on. But we don't want to go away with the impression that descriptive and causa are always fighting and they never meet. You see, this is where the problem sometimes is. We teach this kind of thing with so much evangelistic zeal that people think you have to swear allegiance to descriptive and stay on that road forever. Or you have to swear allegiance. We even make laws about it. We don't do causa study because we don't in our tradition. We don't. It, it shouldn't be like that. Let me ask you a question. What is the cause? When a system stops to, stops to work, what usually causes it, right? Don't say it out. Don't say it out. When a system stops working, what usually causes it? Write it somewhere, where you can easily cross it out in case you are not happy with your answer. <laughs> when a system stops working, what usually causes it? Write the answer. The question is not here. Just answer it. Okay, write, write electricity. Like write electricity there now. You've written it. This, this cohort is likely to be one of the smartest cohorts on the surface of the earth. You, did you remember the question you asked me? Which system? You want me to do what? To describe. Then you can begin to say this is the cause. We cannot do good descriptive uh, causal research where there is no good descriptive research. <laughs> so I was joking with Susan. Yesterday I went somewhere uh, on our campus and I was supposed to do a mock presentation. And they asked me, bring out your system. I said, hey, wait. The reproductive system or the respiratory system or the, I mean, I don't mind, but I mean, if I'm going to bring out the reproductive, it has to be in the toilet. Yes. And they say, no, we mean computer. I say, yeah, you see, now, now, we, you have to tell me exactly what you mean. And we're going to spend some time just talking about concept formation uh, sometime later. The, the danger in just assuming that everybody understands what you are talking about is always there. So the point I'm making is there are descriptive studies, there are causal studies, yeah, and, but we cannot do, we cannot do causal studies if the situation has not been described. How can we say uh, democracy brings better economy if we don't agree on what democracy means? What really does it mean? Is Nigeria a democracy? Is, is, is Rwanda a democracy? Is Uganda not a democracy? It is. Yeah, are they the same? You know? So, by, so description, we, we need to understand what we are talking about before we can say this is what it causes or this is what causes it. The second point that you have taught me here is that most of us have always been on the descriptive plane. And you went ahead and said, maybe it is because it is a lot easier to describe than to explain this is the cause of that. Right? I have been working, running this same uh, 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 training with three of my colleagues. In, in Lagos, but I'm the only Nigeria of, Nigerian among the three. And every, almost every day, one person is complaining about stomach upset. So we say, okay, let's begin to do regression analysis. <laughs> All right, so today we'll ask for food without pepper. Then we asked, and then somebody is running to the toilet an hour after. Okay, his problem is not with the, let's ask for food without oil. So they put pepper, there no oil. Then two people are running to the, I mean, you just, you just so ex ex establishing causality can be really, really tough. But then to say, how many people have stomach upset? Three, two, one, none. It's easier, right? But if that is the case, why don't I stay forever 
on the on the descriptive plane. Hmm? We will talk about why we need causal studies in the next couple of slides. Why do you have to bother our head about that? But here we will first talk about. I, I'm sure the distinction and the connection, not just the distinction between these two types of studies, are clear now. Yeah. Yeah, and we can have this in near in any discipline that we have chosen, whether it's sociology or political science or political economy or media studies, whatever, or agricultural economics. We have descriptive studies there. We have causal studies there. But there are conditions. Just as as you can see now, I did say, and well, you you were the one that started it, that we need rich description before we can do causation. So there are conditions under which we choose what type of work we do. And we, one way of looking at it is just to say, we don't want to reinvent the wheel. So how much do we know right now? There are situations where the issue we are dealing with has been fully theorized. You know, and the theory, the explanations, uh, you know, by theory I mean the broad explanations, seem to explain the phenomenon where we are explaining very well. There are other situations where, hey, I'm seeing A, B, C, and this scattered all over the world, all, all over the place. I can't find any theory that is holding this together for me. Situation number three is where there is plenty of data there. You, there are, you know, data is available. And we can spin this around and, and make studies with it. But then there are also situation, situations, which let's call situation four, where data is not available. Now, we, before I can say I want to do causal work or descriptive work, I need to look at these four and say, in which environment have I found myself? Is my environment data poor or is it data rich? Is my environment theory poor or is it theory rich? And when we put this together, then I say, okay, it looks like if I'm going to design a research agenda for myself here, it looks like first I have to actually start with description do a paper, do a publication on that, or do some basic work on that, and then move up to something else, maybe cause a study, and so on and so forth. So we need to really recognize where we are, the environment in which, in which we are working. This table, uh, maybe we'll come back to this table down the line, uh, down the road sometime later, but sort of, it's a guide, and there is, it's, it's just a way of summarizing something. It's really not like foolproof, don't touch it, don't change it, table, no. So we're saying the theory environment of, the, of, of where I work may be either poor or rich. The data environment may also be poor or may also be rich. And there are situations where, you know, fingers are not equal, where the data environment is poor and the theory environment is also poor, right? So that's that kind of situation we see, it is, it is be best we start with description to even say, what do we see? You know, for instance, in Nigeria, I will explain very well. <clears throat> uh, we, at some point, we understood the insurgency in the, in the Northeast. We knew this was mainly religion. So religious explanation, I put theory in quotes, helped us to understand what was going on. We can even predict who the next victims would likely be, you know? There was some kind of understanding there. We had some kind of theory, right? Ethno, religious, lenses. We may be wrong, we may be right, but at least it sort of explained things a bit. Then the insurgency or whatever, I don't know the name, in Katsina began, which is northwest, another part of Nigeria. We just knew people were being killed, you know, tens every day, people's... So who is really killing whom? 
we don't know. Katina is heavily uh, mono-religious. The people doing the shooting are also of that religion. So, okay, so now it just didn't make sense. The theory collapses at that point, right? And the data, how many people have been killed? What, who is, what is their gender? No idea. So I can't go, if I then begin to explain causality in Katsina, it's going to be problematic because we don't even understand the situation. In a situation like that, we want to develop real descriptions, true, full descriptions first. But then there are also situations where the theory or ex existing, existing explanations are, are good. But then the data environment may be a bit problematic. So we have, we have rich theory environment, but then we have poor uh, data environment. In a situation like that, we need to begin to understand descriptions in different contexts. I'll give you an example. I am from communication studies. So my examples are mostly uh, uh, in, that, in that area. There is a lot of work that has been done about how community radio stations promote development. Right. There are, yeah, people have looked at how they hold government accountable, how they break hegemony, how they subvert evil things, and so on and so forth. All right. We have read all of that in literature. And the theories seem to explain situations in the places where these stations exist. But for a long, long time, Nigeria did not have a, a community radio system. Our first community radio stations were, were approved in 2015. So they are, really, they are really new. Data about how community radio functions in Nigeria's peculiar situation are rare because they just didn't exist. How would we have studied them? But then global theories and Latin American experiences and all of that exist in literature. Now I can't begin to talk straight about community radio in Nigeria because we have reached theory elsewhere, but then in our context, we do not have data. So you know what we usually do, you and I usually do, is to borrow these um, theories, right? and then to try to ground them in the realities that we have found ourselves. Again, very often, it is usually uh, quite descriptive. Then there are situations where the theory environment is weak, but the data environment is, is rich. And we have a lot of data there, but then we don't have we don't have theories that explain them. I, I, I'm sorry, I'll bring another example from Nigeria. I don't, I, I don't, my Kenyan examples have all disappeared. I think it's because <clears throat> typically I start with the, my first cup of coffee in the day is from Kenya, <laughs> but today it didn't work out that way. Now, some of us here will know what we call mix in Nigeria. <coughs> The, not only in Nigeria, but we have it all over in some African countries. Mix is multiple indicator cluster surveys. Mix, it's done once in two years. Uh, and it's, it's done by UNICEF in, a, in, in alliance with Ministry of Health. I think sometimes with the uh, Federal Office of Statistics. Federal Bureau of I always, FOS, FBS. It used to be FOS, yes. yeah. Federal Bureau of Statistics, they come together and then they, they, they generate this data. And the data is about literacy rate in Nigeria, infant mortality rate in Nigeria, child mortality rate in Nigeria, maternal mortality rate in Nigeria, life expectancy, all of, you know those things. And you know the kind of stories we read there. They are all songs of sorrow for, for most of the time. But you see, so we get that once in two years. That's data. But who is processing this data to give us broad explanations? 
we, we have a poor theory environment, but then we have a rich data environment. I mean, I know somebody can say, but even that data, you can't rely on it. And I say, all right, yeah, let's, let's assume you can't. But then you have not even opened it to see whether it makes sense. So when, when we have this, we have, we have rich data, but then we don't have theories that, exp that make sense of this data. We say, let us explore causality. And on the last day of, of this module, day four, day four, we are going to be talking about, we'll do more of this kind of table, and we are going to be talking about how we can theorize based on this, this kind of situation. How do we make, they call it typological theories, how do we theorize in situations where, when we find ourselves in this kind of, this kind of situation? Lots of data available there. We can plot them on the graph. We can separate them up and down. But then we do not have some broad theoretical explanations that help us to make sense of this data. Then the final one is where we have rich data and rich what? Rich theory environment. Both of them are, are rich. This is where we can choose to test what they call causal hypothesis. Uh, we have very nice theory, we have very nice data, but then now we want to test further what they call causal hypothesis. Again, this is a, like a foreshadow. Tomorrow, we'll be talking about research questions and, and hypothesis, and we are going to deal with this uh, a lot more. Now, as I said, this is uh, our, just an attempt to make sense of to help us begin to think about the environment in which we have found ourselves. It is possible that right now you are still thinking, am I here, am I there? Am I here, am I there? It's okay. The more we, we think about the, your concept notes, the clearer uh, these things are, are going to be. Yes, uh, Valence. Yeah, I'm wondering how to measure the richness of the <laughs> Is it the number of theories? That exists. Okay, good. Good, 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 good. How do you measure the richness, or otherwise, of a theory environment? Yeah. Did he answer a question that was bothering all of us? And why didn't you talk? <laughs> yeah, how do you measure the richness of a theory environment? How do you know this environment, the theory is rich or the theory is poor? Maybe we don't have, maybe we don't have problem with measuring data in terms of availability, rich or poor, but then theory, how do you? Me. Yes, I'm still trying to learn people's name. Crispin. Yes, Crispin. Uh, earlier on, we were told that you need to find the background to the study, where we mm. have to research mm. to find out what others mm. have done in that, mm. mm. that process. Mm. 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 Done. Yeah, perfect. I think. Perfect. Perfect. Let's just imagine. I mean, we all are adults now. Let's imagine the f the time that new media came. I mean, really hit us. You could search for. You know, new media and um, educational performance. And Google will say, we do not have any item for your, yeah? Yeah, it was new. Literature was little. And when we say theory, let us remember we're not saying like a big theory that has a name to it. Aha, uh -huh. theory, generally speaking, are existing explanations for a phenomenon. So it is difficult to say if you find X publications, then if that is all you can find, then theory is poor. Until you find X plus one, then theory is rich. No, we cannot do that. But you will have to use your understanding of the discipline to say, okay, I think I have a robust body of explanation for this phenomenon that I'm studying. It's difficult to prescribe a fixed number of studies or theories that exist there. But there was, I mean, there, 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 there would be questions where to even find a very good reading would be difficult. Yeah. Yes, Edwin. I'm noticing, is it, it's sort of like implied the richness of data 
has something to do with how quantitative I Ah, okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so let's, uh, we can, we, we should also think about that. When we say data, I know, traditionally, our minds go to, yeah, figures, you know, with charts, with, and even, I am also guilty, the example I gave is almost all quantitative, yeah, but we, now we know that we really need to come out of that explanation, yeah, data can also be, data is usually, is not only in numbers, yeah, so, yeah. And so when we talk of richness of data environment, it is both quantitative and, and, and qualitative, yeah. Excuse me? Yes. Using your example, that is uh, the richness of poverty of... <laughs> <laughs> data poverty. <laughs> well, I'm talking of the theory. Okay. You know, you made mention of the fact that uh, in the North is sorry for Nigerians, you mm. understand easily. We are trying to explain mm. the mm. crisis or the instability there based on ignoreligious mm. explanation. Mm. But at the end of the day, mm. when the same people we are killing each other, mm -hmm. we are not able to now use that theory. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I think that shows the poverty. Yeah, yeah, th yeah, 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 yeah. It was. It became grossly inadequate. Yeah, I agree. Again, which is, as we all know, even theory itself is not static. I mean, theory is just a body of explanations. It, it grows, then, but it also wanes. Yeah. So let's uh, move on to um, talking about wh why do we need to focus on causality. Now we've been saying descriptive and causal. Now we want to begin to zero down on what, really what, what our attention will be around for this training, and it's on causal causal uh, uh, studies. This is one guy you will, you will read a number of times. He says, we wish to know not only what happened, but also perhaps more critically, why these things happen. And I have, I, have, I have discovered that even when Nigerians ask questions of what, and Africans generally, they are really sometimes asking questions of why. You know, one, when I suddenly run into a, a traffic where there should be no traffic, my question is always, what is the problem? But am I simply interested in knowing what the problem is? No. I'm also interested in knowing how am I going to get out of here? You know? What is going to cost me to get out of here? So in other words, at the back of that what is the problem description, hmm? is, is, is the intention to understand causation. What is going to get me out? How? By, okay, so we'll talk about the how questions uh, sometime later. So he says, we, we, yeah, we wish to know not only what happened, but perhaps more critically, why these things happen. In other words, we're only interested in, in causal uh, uh, argument. But that is Gehring. Why do you think we want to pay more attention to causal work? in research. We have said, yeah, because we've been doing, largely we've been doing um, descriptive work. Yeah, I agree. But then, that is not the only reason. Why do you, why should we bother about causation as researchers? Yes, Haruna. Uh, if we know the cause, mm -hmm. I think we can go close to the solution. Okay. But when it is just described, uh. I think we are still stuck. Okay. So understanding causation makes it possible for us to make recommendations for the solution of a problem. Okay, good one, perfect. Any other? To prevent further. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. So we can prevent if it's a problem, then we can prevent a further recurrence of that problem. Yes. Irene. Then you are able to eliminate uh, other factors that may be confounding, not necessarily that. Ah, uh, okay. You channel your resources. Yeah, to yeah. Factors. Okay, beautiful, beautiful. I need to warn you, Irene, that many people would think you are a Nigerian from from Delta State. You know, Irene Yamu or or from Edo State. Yeah. I, I will speak the language. Maybe. You have to learn quickly. <laughs> yeah. So, good. Ah, uh, yes. Kechi. That's true. 
mm. now correct some impression. If some researcher has said this caused this, mm. other researcher might research on that and mm. now counter it that it is not this but this. It helps to you know focus on the real cause. Okay, we're able to focus on the real cause. Yes. Yeah. Beautiful. Finally. When, when we are able to describe the cause, we are also able to identify like the parties, the agents, mm -hmm. and all the interacting factors mm. that are actually causing mm. or compounding. Mm. So we are able to identify each of them. Okay. The video we watch, mm. we are able to find the cause, maybe the drilling or mm. the query or something mm. that we know. Okay. Um, men are here, women are here, this is the government's, um, what do you call it, um, contribution to this ATC, but we have to start from it. Okay, so, so doing, focusing on causation can help us to have a comprehensive understanding of, of the situation. Yeah, perfect. Uh, these are all cap captured here. Uh, we are able to understand our social world better if we understand causation. Sometimes, as we'll see later, sometimes we just, if we, because we don't know the nature of causes, then we say, we end up blaming the wrong person for, for, for some, some action. Uh, we are also able to hold people and institutions accountable. Uh, Ronke was saying, so we see the part that government has played, the role that some other people have played, and so on and so forth. Uh, so we can hold government and others accountable to their action. Um, yeah, because we know what really caused what, meaning that we are also able to exonerate others and let them, and, I mean, said, yeah, as we will see later in the famous, one of the famous stories that, that we, have, we have read. Importantly, um, and this is echoing what Haruna said and what Irene said and what Nkechi also said, uh, that we, when we understand, when we focus on causality in research, we are able to provide a basis for well-informed policy actions to address social, social problems. I think of those NGOs that go to Dandora that's a lot of work, a lot of boldness. I mean, I have been to Dandora to do field work, and when we were going, we had to be escorted by armed policemen. There was no other, when, when we were going to the dump. But the dump had become a big city on its own. So the dump also had its schools, its clinics, and when I was going to do observation in the clinic, there was no need to go with the policeman. But when we were going to the dump itself, that the clinic served, it was not, Pascal didn't want to take the risk. Now, I'm thinking of those NGOs going there to talk about maternal, uh, about uh, se sexual education and uh, family planning and all of those and all of those. Sometimes I wonder, how did they get to the, to the conclusion that this is what, what is needed at this moment in this context? They must have thought, taking some critical thinking and maybe causal analysis, or else then it would just be, they say we should do uh, this intervention and we are just doing it. And sometimes government intervention is just, it's just like that. You know, here are people without water, without anything, without, yeah, 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 yeah. and then you say, okay, so my people, uh, what we have promised you to do, we are going to do it. Uh, And then what you are doing is uh, to buy a car for the traditional ruler. Now, but people don't have water to drink. The schools are leaking. People are sitting on the floor. Is that, is that it? Um, so, but I, I think we, it, but if we are not very, don't have a very firm hold on causation, it's difficult to actually influence policy. We'll be saying, well, it looks like, uh, it looks like, it looks like, and again, we'll come back to this uh, a bit later um, to see how our wrong understanding of causes may have misled us in the past into just throwing resources in the, in the very wrong uh, direction. So essentially we're saying doing causality has to do with you know, focusing on what really matters. And focusing on what really matters will 
will follow, will, will only happen if we identify what it is. So it's about saying what, what is that one thing or that one combination of things that is responsible for this situation. Um, that is asking these very key questions and we will return to that uh, tomorrow morning. But now we, we want to move forward, I mean, by talking a bit more about this, this nature of a course. Many times we, you know, we don't understand what, what really is going on. You, you think back and sometimes you are just sorry for decisions you took because, you, because something happens, you know. Something happened and then you are late for work and then you are late for work and then you are trying to hurry out and then you hit something and then you trip. Now, I begin to blame the person who put that something there, right? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Right. But, 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 yeah, so, but is it fair to put all the blame on that person? Yes. Huh? Yeah, it's dire. Yeah, because if you went in a hurry. If I wasn't in a hurry, I probably would have noticed it and push it, pushed it one side. Even play football with it, you know. Some people put something there the other day, your son did it or your daughter, and you say, hey, you put this here, you kick, and then she kicks back, and it became fun. Now she has done it today. <laughs> and then, so here we are saying, yeah, this is, we may think this is the cause, but then, Kai, if we understand the nature of causes very well, we understand this really, really, really is something else, hmm? not the cause. And we will take up this later. But I'm saying it's worth our effort to even think about what, to try to define what a cause is. You know? Because that is what we're going to be blaming for whatever happens, right? So how do you define a cause? This is a very common word. If, you, yeah, if somebody said, define a cause, what would you say a cause is? Yeah, if somebody can say, a cause is something that causes something. You know, I hear that a lot. In my, in my basic reading classes, I always started with students. Define reading. Yeah, they say reading is the process of reading. Books, journals, anything, yeah. So we keep going around. No? You were going to say something, Valence. You want yeah, to define a course? I was trying to look at the Gandola issue. Okay, good. And I was looking at the, the, the way the, the residents in that area are hostile mm. and the situation around the area. Mm. And I was trying to look at the root cause. Mm being the industries that dump the garbage away. So if you can actually have a policy to stop them, mm -hmm. the other people will sort themselves. Because the garbage will not be there and they will not go for it mm. to come there. Yeah, okay, I agree with you. So the cause of this problem, according to you, yeah. industries that are dumping refuse, yeah. the cause it's not that somebody who should have provided a place for the industry refused to produce, provide. It's, that's not the cause, right? Uh -uh. <laughs> we will see a table soon where we will say, look, really, where do you... Yeah, yeah, because the industry will say, look, this is even too far from our factory. We don't like coming here. If we had something else, we'll go there. They will say, yeah, you, why didn't you provide something? And then we will say, eh, yeah, I didn't provide because, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, yeah, so that is another thing. But now, let, let's, just, let's just pause this conversation because it's coming up in two or three slides. Huh? But how would you define... A cost. Let's let's take a look at this this uh, image. What do we see here? Let's call this Bobby Jack. What do you, what do you see? What's this? Broken glass. Okay. What does this look like? And these are like the pieces of the. Yeah, some must have fallen inside, I guess, some outside. If we look at this, maybe it helps us to understand what the cause is. So here I would say, uh, sorry, no, not yet. We would say, um, we we'll represent cause with, with this letter X, just, just to represent it. There is nothing like, okay, so it must be X. There is really no reason why we're using X. 
And we will represent this thing that, ha that has happened as Y. Now we know that this Bobby Jack, no matter what he did, if this was not there, maybe there is a very high chance that this story would have been different. Either he would have used his head, in which case we'll find him stuck here, or he would have found fun elsewhere. Because I suspect that this happened when he was playing food, let's say football. You know, he looks really sorry about it, but what can we do? <laughs> what has been done cannot be, be undone. Now, but let's see how this helps us to define a cause. So we say a cause, which we can also call a causal factor or an X factor, um, then we say a Y is something we call an outcome or an outcome factor. Some we call it dependent variable. So others we call this independent variable. People from quantitative backgrounds like to use these terms. Uh, some, some other people, when they hear dependent variable, independent variable, they need to take a few seconds to say, okay, yeah, now, now, how did they explain it? And almost every time they hear that, they have to do that quick, travel back to year one, and then travel back immediately. Some, so it is not easy for some, it is so very easy for others. Now because we say, I mean we are from different backgrounds, we want to carry everybody along. So we can, if independent variable is what works for you, that's fine. Uh, but if you prefer to say cause, yeah, just simple English, cause is, we call it X, this we call Y. Now we're saying, very often in between a cause and what it produces, there is something else. There is a road, there is a chain of events that, that is connecting them. And that we are saying that is also very key for our overall understanding of causation. Now, with this in mind, uh, you know, all of that, all of these, all of those were represented here as well. Yeah. Now, let's now try to see how we would define, define a cause. So we are saying... To say X is a cause of an outcome called Y. Okay. This one? Yeah, yes. Yeah. So is the road or the chain or whatever that I say is between the X and the Y. Yes. Okay. And. We will really hammer on this as we move on because it is very crucial to our understanding of causation. Uh, okay, so to say X, you know, for instance, hunger um, is the cause of Y, for instance, fainting, you know. These examples, I'm using it to tell you something. I, I didn't eat anything at lunch at break time, so, and now you understand the example, where it is coming from. <laughs> okay, so to say hunger is the cause of why fainting is to say that if we do something about hunger, like if you, you know, now you don't have, if you have one small cake and you throw it to this hungry man, that it is also going to have something, some kind of, yeah, on, 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 on fainting. Yes. Now, in other words, if we flip it, if you keep giving this man food and he still keeps fainting <laughs> every day, then we are going to, what conclusion are we going to reach? <laughs> that, that, yeah, that, that is, the reason he's fainting is not hunger. It may be village people following him, as they say in Nigeria, <laughs> or something. Yeah. Or something else. So we're saying, to say hunger is the cause of fainting, we're saying if we adjust hunger, or if we remove hunger, or if we increase hunger, something else will, will happen to fainting. If you increase hunger, this man will just die forever, or something. If, so, and we're saying, this kind of change, you know, this kind of change, when we do something to hunger and the change is felt in fainting, it's not magic that we, we're saying we should be able to trace a connection between what we have done and what has happened to hunger. And that connection, for want of something, some better name to call it, we just call it Z. That change occurs through Z. And that 
if we really want to fully understand this situation, if we really want to understand it, we need to pretend. Hmm? We need to pretend that X was not even there. Then we'll be able to understand how important X is in generating or influencing Y. We need to imagine what Y fainting would have been if X hunger were not there. The more we appreciate what would have happened, the better we we'll appreciate the role that X is playing in ensuring Y or in producing Y. So now, if I want to, if I want to understand how N power, that 10,000 Naira, is influencing people's business, I need to go and see what their business would have been without end power. If the business would still have been the same, it would have still have been the same two for five naira oranges, two, two for, I be five, five naira, you know how we say, how do we say it in Nigeria? You know, in Yoruba land, they say ice water, tutu, meaning cold ice water. And people wonder, are there hot ice water? <laughs> you know, people who sell this thing. Now, but, so if we can, if I can say that, if I can say that the, the businesses of these people will still have remained the same, even if they didn't get M power. Then I can conclude that M power was not a cause to the growth of their business. So if I see these 10 people who got M power, their business have grown, and I can link this 10,000 Naira to the growth, that link is really where the hard work is. Then I can say M power produced that. Otherwise, then M power, 10,000 Naira, is not the cause of business prosperity. Does this make some sketchy sense? Are this, are this tentative, yeah, some tentative sense? <laughs> yes, Ngozi? Okay, no, it's it, it, it usually sometimes like this. So there is, there is no, just, just smile. I mean, it's, you, you'll be okay. <laughs> So now this 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 is just this is what we're saying. Uh, I was just using the end power to to explain. Recently, our government started giving small amounts of money to business people. Uh, they understand that when this money is big and it's given through the banks and you have to fill all the forms and you have to bring all the shorties, they claim that the very poor people on the road selling cola nuts will not get that money. And I think maybe that is true. So the pre vice president himself went out and was, well, I don't know whether I was distributing. Money money ah, trade that money. <laughs> Thank you. This is how we know who collected what. <laughs> trade that money. Trade, money. trade, that, money. trade, that, trade that. You know trade that. And you know money. Yeah. So, so they call it trade that money. Thank you very much, uh, Rahila. So now, um, so now what, this is what we are saying. Five people collected M power, or some people collected M power. Trader, tr <laughs> trader money. They collected trader money. Now you know recently um, the president, vice president, said, "Oh, those who collected this money are doing well with their business." Ah, that's very political statement, you know. <laughs> now, let's say they are doing well. Let's say their business has increased. So we say the vice president is saying, "Trader money is the cause. Business growth." is the outcome. In our language, trader money is the X, business outcome, I mean, business growth is the Y. And for that to be right, we are saying, number one, it must be that if we increase trader money, this business growth will also increase. That is one way of saying, indeed, X, trader money is leading to hmm, growth. Then we are also saying, for us to capture this thing very well, hmm, we have to imagine what the reality of trader money would have been without, uh, the reality of business growth would have been without trader money. If our conclusion is that, ah, <laughs> without this trader money, these people's business would have reached the floor, then we say trader money is indeed very good. It has helped. So X increases, Y increases, yes. X will not, Y will not have increased without the X. 
Yes. If we have yes on those two notes, oh yeah, good. That imagination, you know that we are dealing with people who have traded money. That, that pretending to see what would have happened if X was not there is called the counterfactual condition. It is called the what if condition. What if condition. And if you remember, Sloman says, actually a good part of our life is run based on counterfactual understanding. So I get to my house and I see this is my bed. And I went down, and I am fine. He said that you will appreciate the meaning of bed. Eh? If you imagine what would have happened if in your absence somebody has removed that bed and you go down like that, say you will thank God for a bed more. Right? He said, so if we want to understand the, how good something is, how strong an X is, how powerful it is, or it is not, let us imagine that it was not there. He said, that imagination, they call it counterfactual condition. Now, this is very general. This is still flying out there. As we move on, also in the electives, we will see how all of these then find their way into the way we understand and explain causation, for instance. They are the principles behind the pure experimental studies that we do. They are the principles behind quasi-experimental studies that we do. They are the principles behind things like even causa, even ethnographic work that we do. It's, if we understand the principle of causation very well, we are going to be able to understand and even, even deepen how, how these things uh, work. The Association of African Universities, AAU, is an international non-governmental organization set up by universities in Africa to promote cooperation among themselves and the international academic community. Uh, my name is Professor Etienne Ewan Eile. I am the Secretary General of the Association of Universities African which is based in Accra, in Ghana. I will talk about the creation of the Association of Universities African. Africaine. Euh, il faut remonter dans les années 60 pour pouvoir comprendre le processus. Déjà en 1960, nos dirigeants estimaient que l'éducation est l'outil majeur pour pouvoir lutter contre la pauvreté et assurer le développement. Je ne suis pas Lamini. I'm the director of ICT services and knowledge management at the Association of African Universities. The Association of African Universities is a network of 400 universities in Africa. The biggest value that the universities benefit from being members of the association is this big platform that allows them to collaborate, allows them to work together, allows them to teach together. Through this platform, a university in North Africa can work with the university in Southern Africa, and also those in East Africa can work with those in West Africa. Founded November 1967 at a conference in Rabat, Morocco, by heads of African higher education institutions, the association is currently headquartered in Accra, Ghana. My name is Maxwell Amohoit. I'm the Director of Finance of the Association of African Universities. The association sustains itself from contributions from member universities and also from other development partners. Some of our development partners include the World Bank, other governmental agencies like the Swedish International Development Agency, UK Department for International Development and other partners. We also receive a lot of support from other governments, especially the government of Ghana. Other partners include the African Union, which is more or less the parent organization of the Association of African Universities. The Association of African Universities hosts the Secretariat for the uh, African Union's 
continental education strategy. And by so doing, we provide coordinating roles for the African Union in helping members achieve their targets. Déjà en 1960, nos dirigeants estimaient que l'éducation est l'outil majeur pour pouvoir lutter contre la pauvreté et assurer le développement. Et rappelons-nous que les années 60, la décade 60, a été une décade où la plupart des pays africains ont obtenu leur indépendance ou ont, euh, disons, pris les dispositions pour être indépendants. C'était donc aussi l'année de développement, dans la mesure où tous ces pays indépendants devaient se retrouver de temps en temps pour parler de comment mettre ensemble leurs problèmes et trouver une solution commune à leurs problèmes. Et dans ce contexte-là, l'éducation était une priorité pour eux. Surtout l'éducation universitaire. Et sur ce plan-là, les universités aussi se sont organisées grâce à l'UNESCO qui a parrainé plusieurs réunions depuis euh, Madagascar jusqu'au Maroc. My name is Jonathan Umba. I'm the director of research and academic planning. The programs and projects that we run at AAU are consistent with our strategic plan and they are implemented for our higher education stakeholders, namely the higher uh, education institutions in Africa. These programs are implemented in such a way that our stakeholders will get the benefit of membership of our association. And our programs also are aligned with uh, a number of uh, global and uh, international agendas on higher education, including the Continental Education Strategy for Africa and the Agenda 2063. So these programs are aligned with uh, a number of uh, international agendas with a view to promoting higher education in Africa. The AAU is the apex organization and principal forum for consultation, exchange of information, and cooperation among universities in Africa. I am Professor Nkusa Mahao, Vice Chancellor of the National University of Lesotho in the Kingdom of Lesotho in Southern Africa. There are roughly uh, 77 universities that uh, are affiliated with the AAU uh, in the region. But as you might be aware, there are a lot more universities uh, that are as yet to take the membership of the Association of African Universities. Well, universities that are not members of the AU are missing quite a lot. First of all, let's appreciate this one point, that uh, the AAU is a main driver from the angle of training and capacitating the human resources of the continent. The agenda of the African Union 2063 so if a, an institution is not on board, it is missing the opportunity to leverage on uh, the uh, opportunities that are provided by the association in the area of uh, training uh, human resource capital, training their own staff and students, um, the opportunities uh, that are provided by uh, the universalization of quality management uh, on higher education uh, on the continent um, and many other opportunities that are provided. Et en 1963, il y a eu une réunion à Khartoum, au Soudan, où les chefs des les institutions d'enseignement supérieur ont décidé de créer euh, l'association des universités africaines. Finalement, la création va se faire à une conférence qui s'est tenue à Rabat au Maroc 
et la création de l'association des universités africaines a eu lieu le 12 novembre 1967. Of Plasma University, Mogadishu, Somalia. We really like to give a call for universities in in Africa, especially in East Africa, those which are not members still in the Association of uh, African Universities. Uh, be, we are calling them because we feel the organization is ours. It represents the voice of higher education in Africa being seen all over the world. Hello Africa, welcome to another edition of AU Talks. Our topic for discussion this morning is the diaspora as a resource to Africa's development. With me in the studio is Kerry, a retired English professor, Cindy, a teacher and entrepreneur, Sharon, legal assistant and family grilled. We'll go for a short break and when we come back we'll continue with our discussion. The University of Khartoum is the oldest university in Sudan. It has a lot of faculties and this includes the science faculty. The science faculty has a lot of facilities and among them is the Microbial Culture Collection Unit, MCCU. The MCCU has two subunits, namely the Molecular Biology and the Microbiology Units. The Microbiology Unit consists of the Culture Room and the Microbiology Lab. The Microbiology Lab is well equipped with state-of-the-art facilities to conduct analysis on bacteria and other microbes. The bacteria are then sent to the culture room for incubation based on two temperatures, that is the cold and the room temperature. There is also a freeze dryer that converts bacteria into powdery forms to be stored over time. The molecular biology unit is where DNAs are extracted using equipment such as microwaves. Other facilities of the unit include a sterilization room where all equipment used in the unit are sterilized. It is also where the microbes used in the various experiments are killed. A cold room where samples such as DNA and media are kept as well as a meeting room where seminars and experiments are done. Welcome back. My name is Irene and I'll be your host for today's program. Welcome to Ghana. How Thank is you. the experience? How is the experience? Wow. So we've been here since Monday. Okay. Um, and it's it's been an amazing experience. The Ghanaian family, we should call them. Mm -hmm. uh, you guys, you have been hospitable, um, but it's just hot. So we left the U.S. and we weren't this hot. We, we're managing to get by, but we are grateful for the love and the kindness that has been shown. Okay. Yeah, so, um, wanted, Sharon, we wanted to talk about your family. Why are you here? Why are you in Ghana? We are here to celebrate my mother, Lucille Myrtle Johnson Simpson Hobson, <laughs> her 90th birthday. Yay. And I did her DNA, and she's actually 20% Ghanaian. Oh, we've seen her. Yes, yes. yes. So we're coming back home. Um, she said, and she had lived to see an African-American president, okay. President Barack Obama, mm -hmm. and she also wanted to travel to Africa That's good. in her lifetime. So we brought her back home. Okay. 
So can you talk a little about your family genealogy since you are the family Yes. Yeah. I have been working on our family history for over 20 years. Mm -hmm. I've been able to track our history back to 1835 on both sides mm -hmm. uh, with the use of Ancestry.com, census reports, medical reports. I am actually at the point that I now have to investigate the slave voyages. Oh. Yes. And, and so it's close. Yes, it is close, but now I have to um, figure out because, you know, they, since they were chattel, mm. they just identify them as male, female, and number of children. Okay. So I have to find out which ship they came over on. Um, one of the things I do know about our history is that um, my great-great-grandfather was taken from um, the islands, from the Caribbean, actually, okay. and they were taken to Virginia. And then they were transported to Alabama and given the surname of Johnson. This is my mother's uh, great-grandfather. Um, so I have to go from that point and then track it back. But it has been an amazing experience because she is Ghanaian. And some people even say that we look like Ghanaians. Mm -hmm. Right. It's sure. And your name, when we trace your name in Ghana, it means you have Fanti because you have the Johnson, the Thompsons, and all of that. Yes. So you, you, are, you are the right place, mm -hmm. maybe from Cape Coast. Oh, oh, wow. Yes. So how, at which places did you go? Have you visited? Since we you went to that? Cape po Coast okay. yesterday. Um, we had lunch at the university. Mm -hmm. Then we drove to Elmina Castle mm -hmm. to see the slave castles. How was the experience of that? <sighs> Heartbreaking. Yes. Um, I don't know. It was, it was unimaginable. Mm -hmm. You know, when, when you go through and you just realize that your ancestors passed through, what they had to endure. We went through the small caves, we yeah. went to the holding caves, we yeah. went to the, 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 the Yes, yes. And it's, I mean, you just had a pensive moment. It, I mean, it almost makes you want to cry because it's, it's very sad that you're not going to return, you're going to leave your family. Mm -hmm. And you think about, and, and it's against your will, you know, it's just not by choice. And just to be ripped apart. And I remember during our family reunion, mm -hmm. When I told it this time, because usually we do a presentation, but when I told it this time, I wanted it to come to life because a lot of the younger generation, you know, they have lost touch. Mm -hmm. You know, they are yielding the benefits of that journey, but they don't understand the journey. Mm -hmm. So this time, um, we had a three-part series, and it was entitled Our Roots Run D Deep. Mm -hmm. This is a picture of our um, brochure. Our roots run deep in our ancestors' wildest dreams. Mm. And the first part, I enacted. So it was like a dinner theater. So I was the connecting point. Mm. And as I told the history, I had background PowerPoint presentations. I actually had um, cotton so they could tell. Mm -hmm. um, I actually had, we had a slave doll. Mm. And just to bring it, to make it come to life. Mm. The second part was called Way Out of No Way. And I had people like my mother's generation mm -hmm. tell their stories about how God made a way out of no way and how they made it through. Mm. And then I had their children read it because you want to cement that. Mm. And then the last part was called Our Ancestors' Wildest Dreams. Mm -hmm. So I had people like my niece, Cindy, mm -hmm. talk about her accomplishments, my daughter, that generation. And Cindy at the time wasn't able to attend, but she sent this amazing video. Mm -hmm. um, and she goes through everything that she's accomplished, and then at the conclusion, she'll go down through the lineage, and then she concludes and says, I am my ancestors' wildest dreams. Mm -hmm. And so we wanted that journey to connect from the roots to the present. Yeah. So. so this is real. This is not being reenacted, but you came to feel it. How yes. important is this journey for you and your family, the trip you took to Ghana? Um, it's very important because so many people, so many African Americans have no desire mm -hmm. to come to Africa. And a lot of people say, well, I don't want to go there. I'd rather go to Greece or I'd rather go to Italy, something like that. And I think the more of us who come here and then we come back and say, it's not what you see on TV. Yeah, right. um, I was very emphatic about bringing my, my granddaughter who was eight mm. so that she will never develop the attitude that the media presents yeah. us with. So she will always, the first thing she said, 
uh, there's going to be lions there. There's going to be. And I had to, yeah, and I had to keep telling her, it's not going to be like that. She said, um, where are we going to sleep? We're gonna, I said, it's not going to be like that. But that's what's portrayed, even at her age, eight. Yeah. Um, she doesn't have that, you know, if you ask her about France or something, she's not going to say anything like that. Yeah. But Africa, this is our home. And this is a real place with real people, with yeah. professions, houses. Uh, and I want her to know that at an early age so she doesn't have to relearn it later. Yeah. She knows now so she can move forward. Yeah, I think mm -hmm. and one thing Ghana especially is doing is opening up to the diaspora so that they come. So last December we had the full circle. Mm -hmm. And then we had all the celebrities coming down to Africa to feel what Africa is and Ghana especially. At least we have a good name. The yes. media hasn't really skewed it so bad for us, mm -hmm. which we are mm -hmm. trying to also project what Africa is like because they will tell you this country is not safe, but it is not the situation mm -hmm. on the ground. And since you are here, you could testify mm -hmm. to yeah. that fact. Mm -hmm. And so going on to our discussion, who are the diaspora? You really want to go deep into that, who are the diaspora? I think the diaspora is anyone of African descent mm. um, that have been taken to other nations, other countries, and that are residing there. So whether or not if you are a in the Caribbean, if you are in Paris, if you're in the United States, Canada, you and you are a person of African descent, you are black, you are part of the diaspora. Yes. So there are so many people like you, you could find your mother's uh, genealogy and you could trace it back to um, Ghana and she's 20% yes. Ghanaian, <laughs> yes. which we accept gladly. <laughs> yes. So I wanted to know what are some of the challenges of people finding their roots back to Africa? Is there some challenges that you face when you want to find your route to Africa? Well, it's, um, it's a cost thing as well. Okay. It's not inexpensive to come to Africa. It's mm. a major um, funds outlay. Mm. Uh, and mm. so a lot of people find that prohibitive. Mm. Um, the other thing mm. is we haven't been taught to love ourselves the way that we should. And um, so then you get the attitude, well, I don't want to go there. Mm. You know. Um, what do, what do you and, the, and the other part is our inability to make that connection, yeah. okay? Only because I did my mother's DNA did we find out more specifically mm -hmm. that she came from Ghana. Mm -hmm. My oldest sister did um, uh, a DNA report previously, and it was just more general. Yeah, that was earlier that was in many, the genome project. That was earlier. Right. And the only thing they could give me was uh, a region. A trace, yeah, a trace of the... Um, migration mm -hmm. across the continent and then but no specifics because mm -hmm. she has more specifics. Yeah and now that you have more specifics you have more interest because as I said you know I'm able to track it and I'm at the slave journals right now yeah. so you have to do a lot more digging and there are resources there are in the uh, libraries there are actual uh, societies mm -hmm. and they've done this before so you know you have to connect yourself with that organization mm -hmm. and and just use Freeman's Bureau there's a lot of resources it's a lot of work though it's yeah. it's not easy but the desire to reach out is so much better when you have that DNA and you mm -hmm. can specifically make that connection mm -hmm. so you can go there you know I was approaching it from this part okay. now I can approach it from mm -hmm. the Ghanaian part mm -hmm. and so yes. and, and that gives me a broader reach yeah. I, yeah, I also feel like the transatlantic slave trade component runs deep. Mm -hmm. And so we've been separated all across the world. And like my mother said, we were literally taught to not appreciate who we authentically are mm -hmm. and where we come from. So therefore, Africa is projected to us in a certain way. So we don't want to claim that's where we're from. Mm -hmm. um, and that has to be renamed and restructured mm -hmm. yeah. so that we can begin to have our ancestry trace. Yeah, I wanted to ask you, Cindy, since you are the younger generation, <laughs> wanted to know, so what are you putting in place? Because 
soon they will be out and then you would start building your generation to what would you do for you those coming after you to have that feel that this is where they belong to and sometimes even resettling to African countries and what do you have in mind what do you plan on doing so my mother when I was in sixth grade so about 12 years old mm. she sent me um, to South Africa with people to people mm. student ambassador and we program and we spent maybe about a month in South Africa at the time and I was only 12 years old that isolated um, memory for me has been lasting and it shaped I'm 35 now it shaped me into who I am today so I've always had this quest for Africa mm -hmm. I ended up going um, to graduate school to study pan-african studies okay. um, I've been to Senegal and now I'm here and so I I have this yearning to find out exactly where I'm from mm -hmm. and to to pass it on to my children mm -hmm. and to end up you know going back or perhaps moving back one day and I think it's my responsibility having had a mother who instilled that into me to pass it on to the children I teach so that they can one day do the same thing so what I do is I am right now actually my students are um, they are studying African fables um, and we've studied Africa mm -hmm. um, and the different continents and tribes and we've taken like Anansi the spider yes. and we're reenacting the, those mm -hmm. things and we, we we're looking at videos of Africa so that they at I teach elementary age um, children at that age can develop start developing their love for it yes. and then it'll grow as they grow mm -hmm. and so hopefully that little part of um, you know interest I invoke into them they it will follow them the rest of their tenure in school yes. so that's, that's very important yes. when we have in the United States I'm sure you have it here too a canon we yes. call it the canon mm -hmm. Um, and it's been very difficult, first of all, to get African American writings into the canon. Okay. And so um, they've been forced into the canon. So now, now that you see what, what you must read to be considered educated, mm -hmm. you know, so we have some African American authors there. But we need some African. Yeah. African, Ghanaian, yeah. we need more names yeah. in the canon that are African. Um, one reason everybody wants to go to London is because most of the authors are English yeah. in the canon. Yeah. Okay. And so that's what you're reading. Mm -hmm. you know? And so what Cindy has done is very important because there are other stories out there, believe yeah. it or not. Yes, yeah, it's true. When she was talking about Spider-Man, right, I exactly. as, as a very rich history mm -hmm. of folklore in Africa right, and right, Ghana for instance right. and we couldn't even develop it to this then to that it is now mm -hmm. foreignized right mm -hmm. exactly. yes. and of course these wow. we have to push these things a lot of right. things mm -hmm. and we mm -hmm. need the wisdom from Anansi and all the things that when right. we were young, we were taught. Yeah. Yeah. And these are some of the things that they are lacking because they are not here with right. us in right. Africa. And that's that's the sad part. Mm -hmm. In America, the children reference Spider-Man, yes. but don't equate it with it being a Nazi to the spider. Mm -hmm. yeah. Another thing that was stolen from Africa mm -hmm. that is claimed as something totally different. Mm -hmm. yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. In case you just tune in, this is AU Talks. We'll go for a short break, and when we come back, we'll continue with our discussion. You can watch us live on Association of African Universities on Facebook and YouTube, and also on TV at aau.org. Stay tuned. Botswana Accountancy College is a business school that was set up over two decades ago to contribute towards the human capital development in Botswana and beyond. BAC has over 20 years diversified its product portfolio to offer accounting, business, leisure, management and ICT related programs at undergraduate and postgraduate levels, as well as consultancy short courses to augment professional skills. In achieving this diversification, the college has partnered with UK-based universities of Durban 
Abbey, Sunderland and Sheffield Hallam University, as well as professional bodies such as SEMA, Beaker, AAT, ACCA, CIA, Cisco, Microsoft, SAP, ESA and SIPS to allow our graduates to have a globally recognized qualification and be globally competitive. To learn more about BAC, contact us on 3953062 in Gaborone or 2410558 in Francistown or visit our website on www.bac.ac.bw. Also, you can visit our social media pages on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. BAC, celebrating over 20 years of creating business leaders. Welcome back to AU Talks. We are talking about the diaspora as a resource to Africa's development. Um, we are talking about you coming down to Ghana and we acknowledge that when the full circles came to Ghana, there was a lot of improvement in our economic resources, especially because they invested in the tourist site mm -hmm. and all of that. And so we wanted to know, are there policies that, that attract you to come to Africa? Or you just come because maybe you found your route, but you are coming to other existing policies like that to attract the diaspora to come and look into Africa over there. Well, one thing, um, a lot of people will c come to Africa, say, on a mission. Mm. Um, and they'll come back and say, well, my church built a well, yes. or, or my church bought mm -hmm. a generator. Um, one thing I would like to see is some kind of central place. For example, when I was coming here, I wanted to find if there was an American church here. You know, the, yeah. some sometimes Americans come here and actually form mm -hmm. congregations, mm -hmm. and so that was I was unable to find that. Mm -hmm. um, someone said, "Well, you have to call every church." I, I wish there was some kind of central place. Um, where there was a listing of what's been done, mm -hmm. also what needs to be done. Yeah. Sometimes the stars come and they say, oh, I went to Africa and I began a school, I started a school. Yeah. Um, so when they say Africa, they're not it's saying, the like, is it Senegal, is <laughs> right. it yeah. Ghana, so is huge, it yeah. where is it, you know? I would like to see, and I also would like to see that central thing because I might want to start to, to fund something. Mm. So I, I live in the United States. I'm, I'm not sure what you need in Ghana. Mm. But perhaps there is something in Ghana that I could actually rally my friends around. Okay. And we could fund that, come here and do that thing. Yeah. And we have no way of knowing um, what we can do. You know. We have resources. I keep telling people African Americans are not poor. Yeah. There was a time we were poor. Yeah. <laughs> um, we are not poor. Yeah. Um, and we can, and there's so many fundraising um, outlets yeah. in America that if we wanted to fund a project, say, like I was thinking about um, the stalls where the, the vendors are, mm. if we wanted to build stalls for them. Um, there should be some way that we connect, could connect with someone yeah. and say, we want to come there and build stalls. Yeah. Who, who do we see about that? How much would that cost? Who would we need? We don't have that kind of resource. I don't know about um, U.S., but I know the foreign affairs have the diaspora section mm -hmm. where they normally organize programs for the diaspora. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether you invested in that area, mm -hmm. at least you will know what is going on and how you could help. So right. the foreign affairs session or the um, have a diaspora mm -hmm. session where you can go and there are so many things that we could do, you could do to help mm -hmm. yes. because um, yeah, as you said, you are very rich <laughs> and we know who very you know. Rich. Okay. <laughs> Not because very rich. Uh, black Americans control the entertainment industry. Yes, yes. Wow. yes exactly. And that's that's yeah. a huge investment. Exactly. Right. Yeah, so you have someone like Oprah comes, yeah. she says, I built a school yeah. in Africa. Mm. And in the African American's mind, that doesn't translate to a country in a city. Exactly. It just con it's just like Africa. Continent. Right, mm. the entire continent. 
you know, it, it, does, it doesn't have the true meaning yeah, and I have, location. I, I find it intriguing when they say I'm going to Africa. Africa yeah, exactly. Right. Mm -hmm. Where right. in Africa? Mm -hmm. right. Right. We have right. about 54 right. states. Right. 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 Exactly. states. Exactly. Where exactly. are you going? And, and you know what else I would like is if there was a connection like for family reunions mm. to come as a group. Yeah, if we could have a central point here yeah. and for people especially when they find out their DNA. Yeah. You know, they can just come and make a connecting yeah. point. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that would just be an excellent uh, long-term, short-term, you know, mm -hmm. trip. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, I know. think that the full circle, I'm, I'm sure it's, it's, it would be a yearly thing. Right. Mm -hmm. I'm sure it's somehow expensive because those who are coming are affluent. Mm -hmm. They have their <laughs> own money. So I'm sure people can get involved with that. Mm -hmm. And so with that, the visa processes and all of that are being relaxed so that they can come and enjoy what is in Ghana. And so since you are here and since you've, you've come here, I would want to ask again, what has been your perception? Has it changed or is it still somehow? Yeah. Well, you know, someone asked me what my expectations were, and I told mm -hmm. them I didn't have any. Okay. okay? I didn't want to come with preconceived, okay. um, because I didn't know. I had no idea what to expect. Mm -hmm. um, I can make a connection of what's happening here mm -hmm. to any city in the United <laughs> States. Okay. Um, just, Cindy and I were talking about it this morning on the way in. Uh, you know, there are sections. There are affluent sections. Yes. There are uh, less affluent <laughs> sections. Um, so, I mean, we can just match mm -hmm. apple for mm -hmm. apple. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it really is the same. It's just the volume of people is different mm -hmm. in the cities. But if we were in New York, it would probably be normal we, for we, them. We were comparing to New York yesterday. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That would be very normal for New York with that volume. So it depends on just like which region you're yeah. in. Um, coming from, I'm in Charlotte now. Okay. So Charlotte is a smaller. Mm -hmm. And Pittsburgh was even smaller. Mm -hmm. Okay. But when my daughter, my daughter went to Columbia. So when I would go in New York... <laughs> it was just like, it was exactly what is happening yeah. every day, every day, even the traffic, the, the, the challenging, the traffic here. <laughs> It's just like, <laughs> I, and that's something I did not expect. I expected to come to a city just like, because I haven't been to Africa before. Yeah. You know, I, those preconceived notions that a lot of um, Americans or people across the world think about Africa than I have. So I just expected to be in a normal city. I did not expect yeah. the traffic. traffic. <laughs> oh I, I did not. You're in the wrong city. Yeah. <laughs> yes. You need to go to the smaller regions, mm -hmm. which the traffic is quite moderate. Mm -hmm. But this is the capital city, and so it is expected. Yes. <laughs> really expected. It's so bad. The traffic is so bad here. But we are improving our road systems. Mm -hmm. And so I'm sure by the time you come back, we'll be good. <laughs> yeah, so anything to talk on that your perception? Is well, it, has it been positive or negative? Oh, well, this is my third trip to the continent. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the first time in Ghana. Um, mm -hmm. But I was impressed okay. with the roads. Mm -hmm. um, because, um, of course, in South Africa, it's a lot like America. But a lot is rural. You know, um, Accra is so cosmopolitan. Yeah. So I was, um, I was really impressed with. I mean, it's a lot of traffic, but the roads are smooth. There's no yes. potholes. I don't even see accidents. The, though. There's, there's very few accidents. <laughs> there should be. I, I'm telling, there I'm should telling be you, when we are driving and we'll go in another lane and come back, I was just like amazed at how close these cars were, and there have been no accidents the whole time. I'm yeah, just we like didn't amazed. Run into anything. And yeah. also, our driver went around the potholes. You guys might not have seen it, but he went around. He was taking very good care of us. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And people are extremely polite yeah. oh my out gracious polite. respectful <laughs> yeah. it is just oh I'm you know I'm I, okay you know, I mean you, you just it's 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 in, it's it, it's a, it's part of the DNA yeah <laughs> it, and it is it, and it feels comfortable it feels normal it's mm -hmm. a, we should be that courteous yeah all the time it shouldn't even when they're this close yes they're courteous. Yeah. right right <laughs> right so that was how we were brought up I'm yes. Sure that is how you're also bringing up your Jota. Uh, not your quite. <laughs> we have something called road rage. Yes. Oh, yes. yes. It's road rage. In the US, road rage. Yes. yes. People actually shoot other people over traffic. Yes. So it's so nice to come here 
and there's no rage. No. No one's giving you the finger. Mm -hmm. No one's hopping out their car and yeah. banging on your window. Yeah. It happens one or twice. Well, right? yeah. <laughs> but we didn't see Not it. Not at all. No. One they or were two. Good for the company. One or two. <laughs> because normally when you hit someone's car, you would be in so much trouble. Okay. You don't uh -huh. want to be spending a lot of money. <laughs> because sometimes the person has not insured the car. You don't want to take that responsibility. Right. And so you need to be careful. Right. Extremely careful. And so AAU, the APES of African Education, Higher Education, we are interested in the diaspora because we know there are things that you can do to help universities. Mm -hmm. How can the diaspora help African education in your own small way, in your own terms? I'm How can we benefit? I'm very interested. So coming here, when I left home, a lot of people said, Cindy, can you please get me some fabric? Oh. <laughs> that everybody wanted fabric. They wanted it from the continent. They wanted fabric. And I said, yes. When we go to these markets, so much stuff. So much beautiful stuff. Yeah. And I think that it's imperative for us studying entrepreneurship mm -hmm. to come to the continent and gift it back. Yeah. Like, because in Ghana alone, you guys are selling everywhere yeah. things that we don't have access mm -hmm. to. And if I could at home get on the internet, yeah. look for a specific company yeah. at the market and order my six yards of fabric and have it sent to me, yeah. I think that will, will help with econ economics, right, yeah. for yeah. your country. And so I think... Um, if we're studying it in college, and it's so much um, like programming in D.C. alone for black businesses and small businesses, mm -hmm. if we give back what we've learned yeah. mm -hmm. and help people set up to be available and have access to you guys internationally, mm -hmm. then that would be a major help mm -hmm. to the African region. Um, you know, my daughter is currently at Harvard getting her MBA, and at the conclusion of her first year, they're going to apply what they learned. They're going to New Delhi. They're going to Thailand <laughs> and Taiwan, and they need to come to Ghana. Mm -hmm. yes, I mean, that yeah, needs exactly. to be one of the one of, the one of exactly. That needs to be. I, I mean, I will talk to her mm -hmm. and see how that can happen. But if you add your name to that list, because yeah. every class, yeah. that's what mm -hmm. they do. She mm -hmm. said, "Mommy, it's 80 percent travel." Mm -hmm. She did go to Egypt, but it was for pleasure. It wasn't part of the curriculum. Okay. But if it's 80 percent travel, you should be part, in that 80 yeah. percent somewhere. Yes. Yeah, yeah, we had a perception about Egypt that, oh, terrorists mm -hmm. working, so you're supposed to be scared, and we had the opportunity to visit there in March, mm -hmm. and it was beautiful. Mm -hmm. We go to the airport and said, are we in Africa? <laughs> because it was beautiful. We thought we were outside. Everything is good. You walk on the street, six-lane street, mm -hmm. flyovers everywhere. So minimum traffic, beautiful buildings, mm -hmm. the architecture is so beautiful. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then we were in our corners thinking that Egypt is scary because yeah. of how the exactly. Western media has painted exactly. Egypt right. to foreigners. And so people are even scared to invest in Egypt. But this is a country where you can freely live and there is no problem. They are an Islamic country. But you are a Christian, you can live like yeah, how exactly. you want to yes. be. There is so much freedom, but they tell us, no, don't go to yeah, Egypt. Right. Right. It's so scary because there has been one or two at the Sinai. But it happens, and where you stay, sure. why is it not painted in that way? And so we would want to encourage, since mm -hmm. you are here, since yes. you mm -hmm. come here, to also spread the good news of Africa. Absolutely, yes, like, for sure. Spread we definitely have to change the narrative. Yeah. Um, yes. And you were asking what could we do, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. one thing you all could do yeah. um, is make sure we get your literature, sure. you know. Um, I don't know. There's a New York Times bestsellers list. Maybe we need an Africa bestsellers yeah. list yeah. Yeah. Um, to make sure that we get your literature because that's how we learn a yes. lot of An things. interesting thing is that our literature is only just about 1.2 million. 
of mm. all the literatures in the world. Yeah, mm. yeah. And that is so scandalous. Yeah. 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 And you can't reference those mm -hmm. because we are not even interested in that. Mm -hmm. We want the Karl Marxists, those who are dead and then don't even know mm -hmm. what is going mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. right. 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 That is what we are looking mm -hmm. at. And so it's time now, I think we look into ourselves mm -hmm. and believe in what exactly. we are doing. Exactly. And so the African Union has the Agenda 2063. They give a, a guidelines to what we want Africa to be in the mm -hmm. next 50 years. And so they titled it The Africa We Want. Mm. It's such an interesting document mm -hmm. that when you go through a hard seven salient point where you could see that they want to bring the realness of Africa yes. right. into that. And so we are encouraged all of us to go read the Agenda mm -hmm. 2063. And that is what the AAU is doing now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We use these talks to promote the Agenda 2063, the Continental. We have our own educational <laughs> strategy, right, right? Right. Yes, which we are doing, but we still talk about the UN goals, the SDGs. Sure. We don't talk about the Agenda mm -hmm. 2063, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so it's like our priorities are not in sync with what we do for ourselves. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And so we are glad that you are here. Yes and to help us. And so, before we go, we'll give you the last words. Okay. We will start with Sharon. Sharon, what do you want to say? The family <laughs> build. I, I like that. Yes. Yes. Well, one of the things I want to say, as, as I listened to my sister and she talked about the information we received, yes. uh, we have to research it ourselves. Mm -hmm. Okay? We have to be the source. We have to take responsibility and get the information ourselves and make the connection because um, it is out there. We are connected, and we can't have anyone else be responsible for our history. Mm -hmm. It is our history, and we have to take ownership of it, and we have to make sure it is uh, expressed accurately mm -hmm. and not skewed. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. I just want to say that to Africans and Africans across the diaspora that we are family, yes. and that we have to redirect our narrative and we have to love ourselves and love the country that we're from and give back to that country and go back to that country. Yes. And in order for us to do that, we have to tell our stories, we have to research our stories, and we have to begin healing. Mm -hmm. And to do that is to lean on one another. Mm -hmm. So don't overlook each other. Mm -hmm. Reach out, love on each other, grab a hand, come back, and serve. And I guess I want to say that we are Africans and we have the best minds. Mm -hmm. yes. We have the best minds out here and if we could just bring our young along, seeing us be our best mm -hmm. um, and, and knowing their history, we could teach them their history. They are the best minds, they come from us. Yeah. Um, we women we give birth to greatness, mm -hmm. and if we know that, we'll take better care of ourselves. Mm -hmm. if, we, if, we, if we put that first, you know, that we are creating the best the world has to offer. And so if we, if we can instill that in our, ourselves and our youth, it would be such a powerful, powerful thing. Thank you so much for coming yeah. and I enjoyed yes. our conversation. We wish you a fruitful stay and we wish that you come during the Christmas so that we enjoy the festivities. Oh, oh, yes. Yes. oh yeah, that would be great. Yes. That'd be great. Interesting. Thank you so much for joining us on AU Talks. You can watch us on our Facebook page, Association of African Universities. Have a good day.
Welcome to Event Update on AAU TV, the voice of higher education in Africa. Event Update brings you information about upcoming higher education events happening in Africa. And it is brought to you by the Association of African Universities. I am Isabella Tetahenakwa. I am Alexandra Ampaba Johnson. Please stay tuned for the updates. Accra Institute of Technology is a top-notch private university in Ghana. The university offers world-class bachelor's, master's, and PhD degree programs. IT and management is one of the good courses I think we should offer these days because I realize that on my years of experience on the IT field, I realize that IT guys find it very difficult to cope with the management aspect. And AIT is giving us the opportunity to do IT and management. We dive into what um, programming, we, I did HR, I did principal management and all this one is giving me the opportunity to be able to communicate with my manager. So when we are talking about IT, I know that I'm talking about something technical and I can also talk about management which is also another dimension of corporate institution. So with all this, I think AIT is giving us a very nice opportunity. We are AIT, the University of the Future. Welcome back. The Association of African Universities, AAU, is pleased to invite all African higher and tertiary education institutions to apply for institutional workshop for the 2019 and 2020 academic year. This activity is implemented by the AAU in its capacity as the apex body and voice of higher education in Africa as well as the coordinator of the higher education cluster of the African Union's Continental Educational Strategy. CESA 2016-2025. Interested universities and institutions can kindly apply online via www.surveymonkey.com slash r slash aau works 19 to 20. Contact Frank Asifwa on fasifwa at aau.org or call plus 233-548-880855 for any technical challenges. And for more details, please visit www.aau.org or www.blog.aau.org. L'Association des universités africaines, AUA, est heureuse d'inviter toute institution africaine d'enseignement supérieur à postuler pour des ateliers institutionnels pour l'année académique 2019-2020. Cette activité est mise en œuvre par l'Association des universités africaines en sa qualité d'organisation fêtière et la voix de l'enseignement supérieur en Afrique, ainsi que le coordinateur du cadre de l'enseignement supérieur de la stratégie éducative continentale de l'Union africaine, c'est ça, 2016-2025. Les universités et institutions intéressées peuvent postuler en ligne via www.cvmonkey.com r aau 19 TO20. Contactez Franck à ses fois sur facifois ou appelez plus 233 548 88 08 55 pour tout problème technique et veuillez visiter www.aau.org ou www.blog.aau.org pour plus de détails. The Association of Commonwealth Universities, ACU, in collaboration with the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology, KNUST, is inviting you to an upcoming workshop under the theme, Developing the Next Generation of Researchers, date 16th to 20th March 2020, venue, Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology, Kumase, Ghana. This workshop will provide an opportunity for senior academic staff and emerging researchers to explore innovative approaches to professional development and collaboration. In addition, the Association of Commonwealth Universities will be launching the Circle Institutional Strengthening Implementation Fund for member universities to apply for financial support to deliver activities to improve support for early career researchers. Please email nextgen at acu.ac.uk for more information. L'Association des universités du Commonwealth, en collaboration avec l'Université des sciences et technologies de Kwame Nkrumah, qui est UST, vous invite à son atelier intitulé « Développer la prochaine génération de chercheurs » du 16 au 20 mars 2020 à l'Université des sciences et technologies Kwame Nkrumah à Kumasi, au Ghana. Cet atelier permettra aux universitaires et aux chercheurs émergents d'explorer des approches innovantes de développement professionnel et de collaboration. En outre, Association of Commonwealth 
University lancera le fonds de mise en œuvre du renforcement institutionnel CECO pour les universités membres afin de demander un soutien financier pour fournir des activités visant à améliorer le soutien aux chercheurs en début de carrière. Veuillez envoyer un courriel à nextgen.acu.ac.uk pour plus d'informations. The Western Central African Research and Education Network, WACRIN, is organizing its sixth annual conference hosted by the Benin Research and Education Network on the theme Digital Transformation for Development. Date 19th to 20th March 2020, venue Cotonou, Benin. This conference is a call for papers and interested authors are to submit their abstracts on these related subjects New Technologies, Innovation, and Fourth Industrial Revolution. E-learning, lifelong learning and education strategy, open science and open access, as well as ethics and governance. Kindly submit all documents online at Wakren 2020 Call for Papers. And for more details, contact Wakren at cfp2020 at wakren.net. Le réseau de recherche et d'éducation de l'Afrique de l'Ouest et du Centre, Wakren, organise sa sixième conférence annuelle organisée par le réseau de recherche et d'éducation du Bénin sur le thème « Transformation numérique pour le développement ». Date 19 au 20 mars 2020, lieu Cotonou, Bénin. Cette conférence est un appel à communication et les auteurs intéressés doivent soumettre leur résumé sur les sujets suivants. Nouvelle technologie, innovation et quatrième révolution industrielle. Stratégie d'apprentissage en ligne, d'apprentissage tout au long de la vie et d'éducation. Sciences ouvertes et libre accès, éthique et gouvernance. Veuillez soumettre tous les documents en ligne via Wakren 2020 Core for PPS. Pour plus de détails, contactez Wakren via cfp2020.wakren.net. كمال محمد عبيد مدير جامعة أفريقيا العالمية أعمل في هذه الجامعة منذ العام 1982 جامعة أفريقيا العالمية كغيرها من الجامعات تؤدي وظائفها الرئيسية التعليم والبحث العلمي وخدمة المجتمع الجامعة الآن دخلت في مشروع جديد بإدخال فكرة الجامعة المنتجة وتقوم بتدريب الطلاب وتقوم كذلك بخدمة المجتمع الجامعة الآن بالإضافة إلى كلياتها في مقرها الرئيسي تنتسب لها أكثر من 17 كلية نظامية في عدد من الدول الأفريقية وخارج أفريقيا يشكل المركز الإسلامي الأفريقي واحد من المؤسسات الرئيسية في الجامعة وهو الذي يهتم بتقديم الخدمة للمجتمع عن طريق تنظيم القوافل والمخيمات التربوية للطلاب لدينا قناتين الآن قناة العالمية العامة وقناة العالمية التعليمية بالإضافة إلى راديو أفريقي ويديرها الأساتذة والطلاب أن تحصل جامعة أفريقيا العالمية على جائزة الملك فيصل في مجال خدمة الإسلام هذا مؤشر لأن الجامعة تعمل في الاتجاه الصحيح تعليم متميز لتحقيق أهداف الدعوة The Makerere University and the government of Uganda are inviting you to join the international leaders and experts for the 2020 World Health Summit regional meetings to address the biggest challenges in global health in the region and around the world. Date 27-28 April 2020, Venue, Speaker Resort and Munyonyo Commonwealth Resort, Kampala, Uganda. Topics to be discussed at the summit are the health of the African youth, Advancing Technology for Health in Africa, Global Health Security, Non-Communicable Diseases, Intersectoral Action for Health, as well as Universal Health Coverage. For more information, please contact Dr. Charles Bate via drcbate at gmail.com or call plus 256-700-800-618. You can also visit www.worldhealthsummit.org. L'université Makerere et le gouvernement de l'Ouganda vous invitent à rejoindre les dirigeants et experts internationaux pour la réunion régionale du Sommet mondial de la santé 2020 afin de relever les plus grands défis de la santé mondiale dans la région et dans le monde. Date 27 au 28 avril 2020, lieu Speaker Resort et Mounionyo Commonwealth Resort Kampala, Ouganda. 
Les sujets porteront sur la santé de la jeunesse africaine, comment faire progresser la technologie pour la santé en Afrique, la sécurité sanitaire mondiale, les maladies non transmissibles, l'action intersexorielle pour la santé et la couverture sanitaire universelle. Pour plus d'informations, veuillez contacter le docteur Charles Batté via dr.cbatté.com ou appeler le plus 256 780 06 18 et vous pouvez également visiter www.worldhealthsummit.org. The Association of African Universities is inviting you to their annual school for African student leaders on the theme Quality Student Leadership and Administration in African Universities. Date 9 to 12 June 2020. Venue The AAU Secretariat. This conference will discover and develop the leadership qualities of the student leaders. Assist them to identify the right environment and conditions under which they operate as leaders and seek to equip both newly elected and current student leaders with knowledge through practical exercises and case studies that will adequately prepare them to efficiently manage their peers and contribute immensely to the overall goals of their universities. Interested participants are to register via the link on your screen. And for more information, kindly contact Mr. Kwesi Akwasam via kasam at aau.org or call plus 233-243-298464. L'Association des universités africaines vous invite à son atelier annuel des leaders étudiants africains sur le thème leadership et administration des étudiants de qualité dans les universités africaines du 9 au 12 juin 2020 au secrétariat de l'AEA. Cette conférence découvrira et développera des qualités de leadership des leaders étudiants et les aidera à identifier le bon environnement et les conditions dans lesquelles ils opèrent en tant que leader. Elle cherche également à doter les leaders étudiants nouvellement élus et actuels de connaissances à travers des exercices pratiques et des études de cas qui les préparera adéquatement à gérer efficacement leurs pairs et à contribuer énormément aux objectifs généraux de leur université. Les participants intéressés doivent s'inscrire via le lien qui s'affiche sur l'écran. Et pour plus d'informations, veuillez contacter M. Kwesi Akwasam via kasam.org ou appeler le plus 233 243 29 84 64. The African Diaspora Nation ADN is inviting you to the Historically Black Colleges and Universities HBCU Africa Homecoming and Recruiting Fair Ghana 2020 on the theme Expanding HBCU Engagement in Africa, date 23rd to 25th July 2020, venue Accra, Ghana. This event will connect U.S. HBCU leaders, governments, stakeholders, influencers, and CSU executives with their counterparts in Africa and the African Union along with the Forum for Traditional Leaders of Africa to establish short medium and long-term collaborative partnerships and solutions for educational, economic, and social leadership exchange. For more information, kindly email info at africandiasporanation.org. La Nation de la Diaspora Africaine, ADN, vous invite à la foire des retrouvailles et du recrutement en Afrique des collèges et universités historiquement noires HBCU, appelé Ghana 2020 sur le thème « Expansion de l'engagement des HBCU en Afrique », date 23 au 25 juillet 2020, lieu Accra, Ghana. Cet événement mettra en contact les dirigeants, les gouvernements, les parties prenantes, les influenceurs et dirigeants de ces suites des États-Unis de la HBCU avec leurs homologues en Afrique et dans l'Union africaine ainsi qu'un forum pour les chefs traditionnels de l'Afrique afin d'établir les partenariats et des solutions de collaboration à court, moyen et long terme pour l'échange d'un leadership éducatif, économique et social. Pour plus d'informations, veuillez envoyer un email à info@africandiasporanation.org. That is all for today's update. Event update is brought to you by the Association of African Universities. Please follow us on our social media platforms at Association of African Universities on Facebook and YouTube, AAU TV underscore African Universities on Twitter, and AAU TV Official on Instagram. You can also visit our dedicated website at tv.aau.org for more of events updates. I am Isabella Tetahinakwa. Je m'appelle Alexandra Mpaba Johnson.
We are live from the studios of the Association of African Universities headquarters here in Accra, Ghana, and this is AAU Talks. My name is Kusi Sam. Today on AAU Talks, we are discussing sustainable job creation for the African youth. And don't forget that you can join the conversation via our social media platforms, Association of African Universities on Facebook and AAU underscore 67 via Twitter. We will go for a short break, and when I come back, I will introduce my guests. Stay tuned. This is AAU Talks. Sacred knowledge is at our very fingertips. Knowledge that can illuminate our lives and the lives of our children and our families. So what are you waiting for? Join the Islamic Online University today and fulfill the prophetic command seeking knowledge is obligatory on every Muslim. You may join the diploma course, which is absolutely free with no hidden costs at all, or the BA in Islamic Studies based on the curriculums of the Islamic University of Medina as well as Al-Azhar University. And join the collective effort in changing the nation through education. Welcome back from the break and viewers, this is AAU Talks on AAU TV and today we are discussing sustainable job creation for the African youth and don't forget to join us send us your comment send us your your views what do you think about the topic for today um, sustainable job creation for the African youth and we are privileged to have two young gentlemen who are brilliant and they are very innovative to help me discuss this subject and the first to be introduced is the chief executive officer of um, Platinum Africa Solutions in the person of Mr. Derek Vomao. Derek, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. Welcome sir. to AU Talks. Thank you very much. Great. And the second um, resource person, or the second guest to be introduced, he is in the person of um, Mr. Prince Apa. And Mr. Prince is also the head of research and public relations at TANO. TANO is the African network of entrepreneurs. Prince, you are welcome. Thank you very much. How are you? Very good. Great. So, gentlemen, finally, you are welcome to AU Talk, and Thank we you. are glad that you could join us today Thank to you. discuss um, a very important topic that has to do with job creation for the African youth. For the past few weeks, I've been interviewing vice chancellors and some seasoned academics on the continent. We are looking at how we can revitalize African higher education to suit the current demand of, of industries and then uh, the, the continent as, as a whole. And the basic thing is that we must ensure that our students are entrepreneurial. We must ensure that our universities are running programs that are in line with, with industry. Let me first take your, your view on, mm. on that assertion from our academics. Mm. So um, a warm greetings to everyone watching. Mm. Um, so I think when it comes to this subject matter, I mean, mm. it's, it's one of the areas that are very, very important. and. Is raising a lot of concerns i mean in our system right now sure. when it comes to bridging the gap between education or the classroom and then industry sure you know and last two weeks I, we had the event together and i told mm -hmm. people that the gap is is you but then now let's look at redefining that gap again mm. okay what is what do we mean by someone being entrepreneurial for me it's just the ability to solve problems mm -hmm. and being paid for it Good. you understand me it's as basic as that it's being able to solve problems and then being paid for it and i keep sharing on most platforms i get a chance to sit on that mm -hmm. ghana is very rich or africa is very rich because we have a lot of problems here sure so um, an undeveloped continent exactly so yeah. every problem poses a business opportunity sure. you know for for entrepreneurs and the moment you, you make a move to solving a problem, then you become entrepreneurial. Mm -hmm. Because even in, in the workplace, I mean, I, one of the, my jobs, my job role is to recruit for companies. Okay. And even in that lane, I don't hire CVs. Okay. I hire people that have the potential of solving many of the problems that my clients are facing. Okay. You understand me? So that is what even um, people are looking at. So for me, entrepreneur, being entrepreneurial doesn't mean necessarily starting up a business, a business, but it's just the ability to solve a problem and being paid for it. 
which is a very very important thing that we have to address mm. and make our students aware of exactly that we are not just supposed to sit in the classroom and then uh, at the end of the four year period you got it with a certificate which probably costs like three cities to print <laughs> <laughs> you understand sure. then it's not enough but during the four-year period what have you built yourself into okay. what 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 has the program that you've studied and um, how has it immersed into you how have you immersed yourself into the program to be able to solve a problem mm. you know and what are the problems you've identified so mm. i think i buy into that that we have to make our students understand the need for them to be entrepreneur from the perspective that being an entrepreneur is the ability to solve problems, Identify not necessarily problem solve it. as a, not necessarily starting up a business like okay. we think. Entrepreneurship is somebody who started a business. Okay. There are people who are we call them intrapreneurs mm -hmm. within an organization. Exactly. You understand? But the way they perform their roles at, in the organization is just like they are solving problems mm -hmm. innovatively. Mm -hmm. You know, innovation plays a key role here. Mm -hmm. So if you've gone to uni for four years or or whatever it is for four years and then you are just coming out with a certificate and you've not been able to become innovative, what is the process of innovation? Mm -hmm. How do you innovate? You understand me? Then there's a problem. So I think it's something that we really we we need to delve in to make people understand the redefinition we are giving to entrepreneurship yeah. great let me take your initial comment especially the difference between uh, buying and selling and then uh, real entrepreneurs that just as you have said i mean like now. first of all it's good that maybe our academic uh, uh, our academic it's now getting to come to terms mm -hmm. about the job creation or the job creation that uh, is currently facing the continent mm -hmm. and trying to see the importance that young people need to start creating not necessarily businesses but uh, creating activities that make them independent maybe after school or that can really sustain them uh, as maybe um, role models to other people as well mm -hmm. uh, but we also have to examine the context in which they are also preaching their exactly sure. Do we have the enabling environment that is going to make sure that all these people that are coming out of school are going to be entrepreneurial? Mm -hmm. Are we sure that the curriculum that we have in school that we are teaching every single day, it's kind of enabling or can give the potential to young people to go out there and create jobs instead of seeking for jobs? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, like, we'll commend the, uh, the uh, academia for what they are preaching, mm -hmm. but we would like to put it to them that they also need to start working on their tools. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, I've been in school, and uh, I know people who are reading business administration, but even in their first year, second year, they don't know anything about business. Mm -hmm. They've not been to the field to study or understand any entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. The only thing that they have to them are resources from, I mean, I mean Europe or in, from America. Exactly. We do not even have resources to even understand the entrepreneurs on our continent to even know how they thrive or how they even start their business. Mm -hmm. So for me, if the academia is trying to preach and um, this message for us to get students to become entrepreneurs, I think they need to do more on their side in helping the students to become entrepreneurs because students are in school to learn a course. For example, I'm in school to learn um, communications, but the school should be able to teach me how successful other people have started companies out of this mm -hmm. for example who are the best communicators in the country and okay. who are the best business people in the country down into communications but the school never teach you that the school is going to teach you about how uh, to get the your cv very well how to get um, the knowledge to just go and be employed but i think if they really 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 want us to to become entrepreneur after school they need to start working on our curriculum, which is very important because that is what is shaping us. Without that, I mean, we will not go anywhere. And the, the perception also that entrepreneurship is some sort of fashion also has to be demystified when it comes to we preaching it. Okay. Um, I see a lot of young people trying to be Bill Gates, but you never see anybody trying to become a despite mm -hmm. because they don't want to start how they started. They want to start with Bill Gates, starting getting the resources and getting other things. We need to... I mean, change the concept in, in which we even preach okay. entrepreneurship to young people now. Because I think it's not helping a lot of people. Okay. Because they see it as a very nice thing, they jump into it, and all of a sudden they get to realize that, wow, it's a hell. And <laughs> the reality is, is Yeah, and then they are trying to see ways in which they can dodge it. But mm -hmm. I mean, you're already inside, and you're, you've already told your family members that you are CEO of this and that. So they want, <laughs> they want to see you to produce results. And sure. you know, in, in this part of the continent, it take you five years to produce the same result that somebody would to take somebody a year mm -hmm. to produce somewhere else. So I think 
for me, I'm excited that they are preaching that message, mm -hmm. but it still comes back to them. Okay. They have a lot of work to do because we don't have any say when it comes to our curriculum or we don't have any say when it comes to what they teach us in school. Mm -hmm. We can demonstrate against it, but I think if it has come to them that mm -hmm. yes, what they are teaching now is not good mm -hmm. or they need to maybe advance it. I mean, they need to do a lot of work for that. And we'll be very grateful if because be the, the, the future of the content is actually us. Yes. So if you're not able to train us now, that means the future that you want your grandchildren to enjoy, I mean, will not be there. Okay. Uh -huh. Now, let me, both of you started your businesses or whatever whilst we're still in school. Yes. Um, let me start with you, um, Derek. How difficult or easy for you mm -hmm. to just go your academics and still start, start up your own business? You are in school. What? How did how did you start it? And mm. what was the the drive, the passion for you? Okay, so let me make it very relatable for everybody watching. Mm. So I, uh, right after senior high, I did my diploma in mm. business studies, which was supposed to be for two years. Okay. I tried for one year, and I, I got a distinction, mm -hmm. and I applied for a job. Okay. okay, my dream job as I then was to work in a bank. Mm. So as at between nineteen twenty, I got my first bank job. So I, when I got into the bank, then I applied for studies to read Banking and Finance, Bachelor of Science, in the evening school. Okay. So I was working during the day. At where? Which school? Yeah, um, UPSC. UPS, okay. Exactly. So I, I was reading Bachelor of Science and Banking and Finance. All right. So I was doing that. And then now, second year, I got out of the bank, and then I had to start my, my company. Mm -hmm. How did I start? I was really passionate about the fact that um, I had a lot of ideas. Strategies came to me naturally. So it just comes to my mind, and I just know, I just knew how to work with money. I just had a connection to solving main, some of the many problems that businesses are facing in, 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 in the world, focusing on Ghana. So I found a need there that, okay, I have these ideas. I could come up with a good plan, good strategy, good marketing, and all of those things for another company. They would be willing to pay for that. So why don't I start this? And I didn't, as, as I did, I didn't have anything. So I, I started with a broad laptop, okay. you know, and then I, I rode my best friend's laptop at the time um, for three months. I, 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 it was tough because no no interest no 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 <laughs> anything. i mean I, I i said i really and i love the whole process i mm. i keep telling people that if i had the chance i would i would love to go back to when i started and like i would not take each day for granted mm. because i felt like that was the time that built i was built into a resilient entrepreneur mm. that moment of my life defined has defined me okay. has made me who i become because i i went through the process of building this company which we say is, is um, my company we are preaching that is uh, we, are, we are hoping to become the most reliable business consultant firm in mm -hmm. africa sure. you understand and we, we are running the company here in ghana and kenya as well mm -hmm. so being able to build it from a broad laptop into what it's become right now mm -hmm. that process has been priceless for me mm -hmm. and for me it has taught me the principle of resourcefulness you understand a lot of patience lots of lots of consistency you know and uh, being able to put your business on the path of sustainability mm -hmm. that years from now because it's not just about starting mostly when i go to events and i have to talk about starting a business i get off because i'm like starting is not the message i will be preaching it's about building this for life mm -hmm. yeah because anybody can just start I, you could google how to start a business and i don't like to talk about things you can find on google mm -hmm. it should be something i have done i've felt i've experienced the passion exactly the that i can you. give out to sure. someone so for me, it was the, the one, and one of the difficult things that I faced was the fact that I was young. Mm -hmm. I mean, this was consulting. You had to do with people that are in this for like years, exactly. But then, some way, some I don't know. This thing just kept coming. So there, I know there are times like Prince said, I was not the kind of entrepreneur that that was looking for an office and all of those flashy mm -hmm. stuff. I I went out. I work in the hot sun. I'll go to Osu. I'll go to companies, restaurant. Tell them that hey, we do this. We do that. Some of them really treated me like so bad mm -hmm. i mean at times i just woke up and when i'm like today i want to be broken let me just go out there <laughs> go to companies i don't know about just tell them i'm here some of them will look at you like where did you come from mm -hmm. i mean how old are you, are you, know, you? exactly and so that was a major challenge i faced the fact that I, I was young and that's one of the problems here in ghana if you are young it looks like you are incompetent you can't do anything mm -hmm. until you are 40. you understand and we are the same people preaching that young people should do this but when the same young people come to you they will start acting up like they are, they are too young. But I'm glad that right now um, some of us have been able to redefine that narrative. Okay. I mean, that's that thing that used to be there. I have companies that have been here for over 50 years that are 
coming to us for services. Mm -hmm. You know, they are trusting us with their money. Mm -hmm. They are trusting us to deliver to them. And I see some of the young people really doing amazing. And mm -hmm. it's always, it's, it shows that we can be trusted. Sure. We are not too young to be trusted. You know, so that was one of the major challenges. And also, I think one of the challenges was, um, I think it was one of the challenges I overcame was the fact that I had to really see a vision for this company. Mm -hmm. You know, where are we heading to? In the next five years, what do we want to become? What do we want to become years after now? What is the brand perception mm -hmm. that we want people to have about us when our name is mentioned? Okay. You know, and these are things that most startup entrepreneurs do not think about, that a brand is not actually the colors or the logo. It is the perception, it is the promise. Okay. You understand me? Right, Derek, let me take you back to yeah. the, the, the school days. Mm -hmm. That is where we have a lot of the problems. Mm -hmm. I have young people who come to me, I, I, I sit down with them, go to their business plans and proposals, and I, I tell them, look, in the next two years, if EcoBank should employ you, you just mm -hmm. throw this business plan somewhere. Mm -hmm. What was your motivation? You see, mm -hmm. how were you, did you have, a lot of us go to school and we are so much bent on making the first class mm -hmm. excel academically, mm -hmm. and if we want to combine anything with it, we are thinking of, oh, will I be able to make it? What was the dilemma for you? That, for that, 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 that point is very important. Very. I mean, I, I kept, I, I shared with some students last last week and I told them that when I was in uni, this is what I did. I personalized every course that I took. Okay. I saw a reason for me to take that course. That, okay, I'm running this company. So I'm doing, um, if I'm doing a course in insurance, mm. I should understand this for me. You understand me? And that's one of the things that sometimes we, we, we fail to understand as students that mm -hmm. this shouldn't just be about studying to go and write an exam, exam. and passing. Mm. My goal was not to make a first class. Okay. My goal was to make sure that I become a first class person here. That I'm not paying school fees for a, a paper. I'm paying the, the lecturers to teach me something I don't know. Mm -hmm. So if, if it's something I already know, then my expectations from them will be high. Because okay. they need to really show me something. And that's one of the problems I have with most of the unions that some of the lecturers are actually teaching courses they haven't done practically. Mm -hmm. Like, you cannot teach me entrepreneurship when you've not started a business. It's the truth. Okay. You won't understand what it means to be an entrepreneur if you've not been there. So you, mm -hmm. you are teaching me theories. But I want something more than what's in the book. Do okay. you understand me? So I had to personalize my courses and that was one of the things that helped me. Like I read programs and I had to like understand it from my perspective that, okay, so if we are doing um, finance, I mean, a business finance is this. So for me, this is what I will, I'll need to apply. And that helped me to explain myself in examinations and stuff, okay. you know? So I, I personalized the courses for myself make sure that I understand what they are teaching. If it's not something I would want to know or possibly something I could get on Google, I wouldn't want to be there. Great. You understand? Yeah. I think so. I have a lot of questions to ask <laughs> you, but let me go to Praise. Sure. Praise, how was your personal experience combining the idea, the passion, the thought of start starting a business in school vis-a-vis uh, -vis your academics as well? So, I mean, I mean, like, I would like to encourage every young person that <clears throat> whenever any opportunity of you starting a business come, take it and grab it and use it because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, it's one of the key things that is needed is the experience. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, even, you know, even if you're applying for a job, everybody wants experience you know, before you can give you something. Mm -hmm. uh, my, my first business that I handed was not my business, okay. but this is one, one of the things that person preached to me, it was uh, Pastor Jude. He said, Prince, I'm glad I'm teaching you how to make money at this age. And I was 19 mm -hmm. and he wanted to start a newspaper and then he wanted a young person to champion it, so he selected me. And I didn't have any business experience. I didn't, the only thing that I did was in high school then was being an editor-in-chief. We started a, a news club on campus, so every Monday and Friday, we were going to read news at Assemble to students. So I picked up some experience from there. And then we started a newspaper. So at the age of 19, I was editor-in-chief of a newspaper. Okay. And what he told me was, I'm glad I'm trying to teach you to make money. But when I started, I didn't have the thing in me that I was in this to actually make money. Mm. I was there just because I was there because of passion. Yeah, I'm passionate about this. And one of the things that we as young entrepreneurs need to, to note is that it's not only about passion that will make you eat in the evening. Mm. It's about adding sense to the passion and making money out of it. Sure. Now, when, when it comes to combining maybe our lifestyles as students and entrepreneurs, I can tell you that it's not easy. Uh, for example, I run a company called Advanced Media, mm. and we are into the ranking of young people and then trying to celebrate them every year. 
So this year, young people in business or yeah, no, question? young people in general. So general, from okay. business to I mean politics oh. Oh. to lifestyle to entertainment. Oh. So one of the key things that I mean this year I was really discouraged to still continue running my business mm -hmm. because it came to a point where uh, when we were supposed to be announcing our winners, it was the same week that I'm supposed to write exams. Oh. So imagine if. I didn't have any commitment or I didn't have any experience to this. I would have filled my paper, my papers, yeah. and I said I filled in my business as well. So as young people, we need to really grow the strategy. I mean, we need to grow ourselves with a lot of strategies mm -hmm. as to how we can survive in business. Because as he said, it's not easy combining being in school and then running a business. It has a lot of clashes. Mm -hmm. And for example, the school doesn't care whether you're in a business or not. All that they care about is you're paying school fees mm -hmm. and you're coming to sit there and write a paper or coming to that and sit in, uh, you're, coming to, you're coming to school to sit in a lecture room and then listen to them or do whatever thing that they ask you to okay. do. So, but for me, I think we need to encourage more young people to, to combine, to take challenges. Mm -hmm. I mean, yes, you have to take the challenges and, and see how best you can manage it because you never know what big opportunities that you have in future that, yes. I mean, we need this same sort of experience for you to, be able to overcome, to overcome this. So I think young people should, should get the opportunity. If, if, they, if, they, if they get it, they should grab it and try and see how best they can motivate. I, mean, I don't think there's any defined formula of how you can juggle maybe entrepreneurship and then, I mean, mm -hmm. schooling at the same time. It comes based on your own commitment. Mm -hmm. And that's how you can be able to stand, stand out okay. uh, in academics and both in your business. All right. Mm -hmm. now, so listening to the two of you, uh, there, there's a simple message um, that you are putting across that has to do with the fact that you can't leave your passion out of it. Mm -hmm. And that is what drives you even to go to the lecture theater. Mm -hmm. I, I, I've been in that situation before where I sit um, doing lectures and my mind is somewhere else. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking of what the lecturer is teaching and what I can make out of, out of it right from the classroom. Mm -hmm. Now, let us situate passion mm -hmm. very well with, bus with as in business success. Okay. Do, do we have any correlation, passion mm -hmm. and business success? Yeah. Yeah, for me, I think um, I'm very blunt when it comes to this. Mm. I'm so passionate about business that it's so obvious. I mean, any anytime I'm talking about it, because I feel like passion is not enough. Okay. It's just like love not being enough to maintain a relationship. Mm -hmm. You understand? Passion is passion. If you don't take care, you end up running something out of passion and out of passion. And trust me, you years down the line, you, exactly, you would, you would, you would, you wouldn't be remembered. Okay. You understand? Yeah, because. Business is, 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 a, is a tough ride. Mm. And I shared in my book what they don't tell you about entrepreneurship in, from my perspective. Right. And I made people understand that it's not, it's not a fun ride like we think. I mean, you are going to be dealing with a lot of drama, mm -hmm. a lot of things. So if passion is just the only thing that's going to drive you, that's then, yeah, then you, should, you, should, you, should, you should just find something else. But, but it, 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 passion is, is, is key. You know, it is a starting point to solving a problem. And that makes you a true entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. A true entrepreneur is someone that is connected to the problem that he or she is solving. Mm -hmm. So because of the problem, they wake up at 2 a.m. cooking up ideas. How do I solve this problem? Mm -hmm. How do I make money out of this? How do I make pe people's lives better out of what I'm doing? Mm -hmm. That makes you a true entrepreneur because there's a connection to the problem. And that's yes, one thing about passion when it comes to that stage. When you are um, connected to the problem, because of the primary connection you have, there will be secondary problems you'll be identifying. Exactly. Um, I mean, other problems you'll be identifying around the major problem. Mm -hmm. For example, someone is starting a food business because people would be hungry to eat. But then again, because there's a connection to the business, the person thinks that at a point, people wouldn't want to come out to buy food. They want to sit at the comfort of their homes, homes. in their offices to buy food. So I have to do free deliveries. Out of that, I can start a delivery firm. So, of course, other restaurants would want to have that service as well. Mm -hmm. You understand? Now, they wouldn't want to call me to, the, to order anymore. They want an app. Let me partner with an uh, IT guy. Mm -hmm. Create an app. People can buy the food online. You understand? Now, at a point, again, they wouldn't want to eat meat. That people want to be health conscious. Sure. So now they want to eat more greens. So because of the connection, you get to have other ideas around the problem. And that makes you a true entrepreneur. And that makes the difference between those that are preaching entrepreneurship to be fancy and flashy 
and the role of a CEO to be bossy and mm -hmm. all beautiful mm -hmm. to those that are actually on the ground solving problems. That makes them true entrepreneurs. And now passion. So passion is a key. It is a key thing. Fine. But then I think it takes a lot of discipline. Okay. Where does it start from? Do you lay your bed when you wake up in the morning? Mm -hmm. Do you have a routine that you adhere to every day? Because mm -hmm. that's where discipline starts from. And that's one of the things I did to be disciplined, to just for my business. That I, when I wake up in the morning, first thing I do, if I don't leave my bed, I don't leave the house. Mm -hmm. I have to read my Bible. I have to read my Bible before I sleep. Mm -hmm. You understand me? This is something I started myself to keep me disciplined. So I know that, okay, um, the rule of um, business entity, that me being a separate entity from my business, that makes you disciplined that you know that, okay, when 10000 is coming to the company, it's not my money. You understand me? I get paid this amount of money. Maybe every contract I work on, I get paid 20%. The company takes 80%. Mm -hmm. It's discipline. And that is how we run the business. That at a point when you are broke, the company is having money. It doesn't mean it's your money. Mm -hmm. You stay disciplined and true to the cause that this is the company I'm running here. It's a business. People are owing you. They, they've got to pay. People need to pay a price for the solutions you have. Mm -hmm. and so if it's just about passion, people will be having it for free. All right. And that is not a business. Mm -hmm. That is a passionate activity mm -hmm. that is a project that is like a service it doesn't but bring any money it, it doesn't mean it's not a business mm -hmm. a business is an activity where somebody is willing to pay a price for another person's solution to their problem okay. so until that link has been established until that grounds has been established and it's fertile mm -hmm. then you're not running the business until somebody is willing and able willing and able mm -hmm. to pay a price for what you have to offer to them without doubting your competence without doubting your delivery mm -hmm. then you're not a businessman or a woman all right let me take business. your 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 comment on uh, this and then i'll go for a short <laughs> break I, I think passion is that thing that just keeps you going okay but for your business to really survive it takes a lot of other factors mm -hmm. and i think derek has mentioned a lot of them because i was discussing with a, a young man recently and he was so focused that he's so passionate about his business. But when he started mentioning his figures, how much he was making, and I started laughing at him. I'm like, passion alone cannot make your business become successful. Make you the Warren Buffett sure. today. Because you have to know that even Warren Buffett studied, uh, did a lot of investing, did a lot of spending, did a lot of mistakes before finding himself in where he is today. Yeah. And I think. There is this perception where every young person is doing business because when you ask them, yes, I'm so passionate about this problem, I want to solve it. Mm -hmm. And it takes a lot more for us to be able to understand that it's not only about the things that we perceive that will make us successful. There are environmental factors that can also make us successful. successful. So okay. if you need to partner with somebody to do it, go ahead and do it. Mm -hmm. If you need to go and take a loan to do something, go ahead and do it. But for, for a lot of young people, I think the idea, I mean, it also happened to me. I was so passionate about, my, I, I was so passionate about things that I wanted to solve. Mm -hmm. And when I started, I got to realize that, no, I can't continue, I can't continue, continue on exactly. anymore. I have okay. to get people on board. I have to get money on board. I have to, I mean, a lot of factors will definitely contribute okay. to making sure that uh, you are able to really sustain your business okay. beyond passion. But I think as young people, we should be able to demystify our, our mindset that passion is, a, is, is the only thing. Okay. It can be the key thing that can keep you going, mm -hmm. but it's not the only it's thing the only yeah. that can so make like your... It's like it's the basic thing, but mm -hmm. it's what they're... they're I, mean, I, I, I mean, I, I like the example he gave about relationship. I mean, yeah. there's love, but like, it's not love that's going to keep <laughs> exactly. you going. <laughs> 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 right. yeah. Thank you very much. We'll go for yes. a short break, and when I return, we'll look at other different types of entrepreneurs. Um, mm -hmm. Are we all supposed to create businesses and then look at why some business startups fail? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. All right. Viewers, this is AU Talks and today we are discussing sustainable job creation for the African youth. After the commercial break, we will still have our, our guest here to discuss this issue into detail. Stay tuned. Join us on our social media platform. Send us your comments and your views and let's read them for you.
welcome back viewers this is aau talks on AE TV, and we are discussing um sustainable job creation for the african youth i still have the two gentlemen in the studio they are doing amazing work that is prince and derek um, let me start with you um the uh, prince let's look at this issue in in detail do we have different types of entrepreneurs um sometimes i get a bit confused everybody parades himself as a as, a, as an entrepreneur do we have different types? are we all supposed to create businesses or what are we all supposed to do okay so i mean from from our perspective uh it's not different type of entrepreneurs but mm. maybe different type of business owners okay uh there's this idea of everybody need to start a business mm -hmm. but from from there's a, there's a perspective that says that it's people that solve needs right. that are entrepreneurs and people who solve problems that are businessmen mm -hmm. so it tends to create a lot of um, misconception or mis uh, the perception a lot of young people have when it comes to that is different okay. uh, when you're talking about solving need and problems for example facebook is never a problem mm -hmm. facebook is not solving a problem without facebook you can still live your daily life but if this chair is broken, it becomes a problem. Without it, we cannot, we cannot sit here. Okay. And it's those people that are rather the businessmen that we see on the streets and all those kind of stuff. Uh, they are the people who are not really the fashionable businesses that we all want to enter into. Right. But when it comes to entrepreneurship, we are all trying to see how we can solve a need. Okay. But the thing is, the need we are solving, how many people have that need? Mm -hmm. that, that's when, for example, you see a lot of Ghanaians creating apps similar to facebook and they're kind of surprised why their apps are not thriving because basically you're solving need but you're solving it to only 25 million people okay. and even for you to even uh, i mean market it it becomes very difficult because it is not solving any peculiar need within like our locality mm -hmm. but for example if you think uh, if you take a lot of uh, business a lot of young people are starting today if you study it you could see that they are becoming more innovative in their thinking. Mm -hmm. For example, you take a company like Haptel. Mm. Everybody is not sending text message. Okay. But think about how easy and how fast you want to send a text message. So they it came up with an idea that they want to create a platform where people can just upload contact and send a text message to a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And they got it right. And because of that, other people are also copying them. So as young people or as uh, people who are eager to start businesses, mm. we're willing to sit down and really study what kind of business do you want to, st do you want to start? Mm -hmm. Do you want to solve a problem or do you want to solve a need? So and I think the, the, the issue has to do with identifying a business problem yeah, and coming or a up need. with a, a need and coming up with a solution. Exactly. And until you do that, you can just be doing shadow boxing. Yeah, I mean, like, there are a lot of young people who are doing it, but, like, it's not really working for them. All right. They are, they don't have, they have, they, some, some of them know the need and they know the problem, mm -hmm. but they don't know the kind of solution that the customer will actually need. All right. That, that will make the person satisfied. So, I mean, when it comes to play, um, and one, one of the key things that I've also, notif I've also noticed is uh, when you are solving, when you're an entrepreneur, you tend to make more money than when you're a businessman. So a lot of young people are focused on trying to become entrepreneurs than businessmen. But one of the things you got to realize is that there, there are a lot of businessmen who are rich in Ghana than entrepreneurs who are actually solving problems that we want to have as, as our fashion. Because most of the times we are reading things like from Europe and from America and other stuff. Mm -hmm. We are not taking time to really study our local ecosystem. Okay. And that's the reason why you see a lot of people starting today and then the next time they are failing because they've not been able to really come to terms into what can actually make their business survive here mm -hmm. or what kind of problems or needs that are peculiar that people over here okay. need. Right. And even before you scale up, I mean, there are people, people start companies and they are thinking, I want to go global, I want to go this. But the thing is, are people in your locality even accepting what you're doing? Mm -hmm. Because if they are not able to accept what you're doing, and identify with, identify with service, you, yes. you don't have any story to go and sell anywhere for mm -hmm. people to be convinced that, okay, you have an, an idea that, that can solve a problem because you solve it somewhere. Okay. So I think young people should really put into terms if they're first, if, if they're solving a problem or a need, and if their locality mm -hmm. really understands what they are solving, because if your local market accepts you, okay. you can go anywhere. That, and that's, that's, uh, that, I mean, that's most of the times we well, we also use the ideas of Facebook and Twitter. Mm -hmm. But you have to you have to think of it that before even Twitter came to Ghana, it was successful somewhere else yeah, it before, before it came here. Okay, okay. So as young people, let's try and see how best 
and see where we can really fit ourselves because all of us have strengths and weaknesses. weaknesses okay. Are you, is your strength in becoming an entrepreneur? Because for becoming an entrepreneur, it takes a lot of time mm -hmm. for you to, even to make the money that you want to make. Mm -hmm. But if you are a business person in Ghana, you are, I mean, you have the enabling environment to make enough to actually spread for yourself. Maybe it might not be as big as somebody who will become an entrepreneur. Okay. How easy was it for you to move from the space of Ghana to Kenya with your business? <laughs> Um, in, in my case, I think um, that move was it was first it was scary, mm. and, and, and each, each time I get asked what has been my greatest achievement on earth, it's not the awards I've been nominated for. Mm. It's the fact that I have won over my fears. That was the first thing I had to conquer. Mm. It was scary, but it worked like that, you know. So sometimes, really, it's, it's not all the time that it will take so much time for it to work. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you may get lucky, you may be graced. I mean, it's favor of God. Mm -hmm. And then, boom, it catches fire. I was able to hold an event in Kenya and preparation stage, I was not there. I did everything online. Mm -hmm. And the ticket prices for the event in Ghana, is we charge more in Kenya. Okay. And we had people attend. And I go to Kenya and my first live television interview was on their biggest TV platform. Mm -hmm. Great. I mean, right. so just that move was, was, was worth it, you know. But just to buttress what Prince said, which mm -hmm. is very important about um, that. Uh, for me, I, practically, I've come to identify various types of entrepreneurs and quickly I'll share. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have sectioned them into, we have true entrepreneurs and regular entrepreneurs. Okay. Out of the regular entrepreneurs, we have the social entrepreneurs, we have the business entrepreneurs. Exactly. You understand me? People that are focusing on solving a societal need, okay. you know, NGOs, foundation and stuff, mm -hmm. and the people are actually into business. You understand me? And one thing he said about need is, one powerful thing I've come to identify with business is, I take my company as a case study. You have to be careful when you are choosing a need to solve or a problem to solve. Mm -hmm. Some needs today may not be needs tomorrow. They may be wants. The question is, will people be willing and able to pay for wants, I mean, once or they want us to focus on their needs okay you understand and i like the fact that we are talking about sustainable job creation mm -hmm. we are thinking about how to start on a path of sustainability mm -hmm. sustainability is not decided today it will happen eventually True. it is the fact that 10 years from the day you start you will still be able to look back and say yes i've built this business mm -hmm. for 10 years it's still running you understand? Even that, you don't get complacent because in business, anything can happen. Right. You have to continually be on that path mm -hmm. and put the, I mean, sustainability principles or strategies, you have to implement them in your company, you know, your, in what you are running. So, I mean, one of the things I've been preaching lately is true entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. True entrepreneurship. That's what we need. We need, we need, I would like to walk into, and that brings me to the question of asking people that, what is your Ghanaian dream? Mm -hmm. Everybody needs to have a Ghanaian dream. My Ghanaian dream is that I want to walk into ShopRite and I want to see made in Ghana milk, fresh milk. I want to see made in Ghana conflicts. I want to see made in Ghana sausage. Because we are facing a balance of payment deficit as a country because we are importing more than Everything. we are exporting. Exactly. Everything we eat, we import. Even fruit, fruits, vegetables. What is the problem? Mm -hmm. So what happens? We are going to have a lot of houses, a lot of money, and no food to eat. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the primary areas we can be focusing on. And anybody that is focusing on solving one of these many problems we are facing in Ghana becomes a true entrepreneur because we are, we are really solving a problem mm -hmm. and a need at the same time which is a problem and a need. And that need will always be a need tomorrow because people will always want to eat. People always want to look good. People always want a good place to sleep. People always want to run their businesses. So you have to be able to be smart with choosing a sustainable path for what you are going to start that. Okay. Would this thing be necessary five years from now? Do you understand me? So yeah, for me, that is my thoughts on um, um, the various types of entrepreneurship and then I mean, how we but, can but, but do, you, do you think that true entrepreneurs are born? And not made. <laughs> are they made, yeah. or they are born? I mean, I mean, it's it, it to depend. Uh, for me, I mean, some people are born entrepreneurs, and mm -hmm. some people have to be made. Some people have to be taught. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Uh, I mean, I don't know. I'm not. I'm not sure. It's genetic. Entrepreneurship is not <laughs> in, in the genes. I mean, there are people who have given their businesses to their children, and the business have failed. Good. It's it's not inside. I mean, it's something that you have to study. Mm -hmm. It's something that you have to experience. If you don't experience it, I mean, if you don't, if you don't, I mean, get into it and learn the nitty gritties because it, it comes down to a lot of strategy. It sure. comes down to a lot of talk. It comes down to a lot of talent. I mean, you have to take a lot to be able to like run a business. It's not just about I'm the C, I'm the son of the CEO of this, this, this. Though I can also run a business. Mm -hmm. I've seen lots of young people trying to do that and. 
I mean, if, if you look at the statistics, most people, most successful, successful entrepreneurs mm. don't give their business to their children to run. They rather allow them to even go and start their own thing or get employed somewhere else. I mean, just do a case study about mm. how many entrepreneurs that you've seen, even, even locally, that's mm. hand over their business to their children. So I don't think it's genetic. Okay. You have to be made. You have to go to the meal. I mean, yeah. you have to to develop it. If you if you don't do it, I mean, you end up failing. And it goes down to a lot of people that even though if even if it's in your gene, mm -hmm. try to take experience from wherever you are studying under. Okay. I mean, if 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 you don't, I mean, I know for example, like uh, Kwame Despite, the son is currently the one in charge. But if you go back to really understand the guys, you go, you go to realize that from when they were young. They've been in the business. Mm -hmm. They've been understanding someone. They've they've, gone, they've to gone to serve someone. Yeah. But we have we have a lot of young people who think like, okay, no, I can I can go to Harvard, and the next moment I made CEO, I yeah. made CEO of a, without going through any experience. Okay. Yeah. And that's the reason why we get to adv advise a lot of entrepreneurs that mm -hmm. even if you want to involve your family in your business, don't give them top leadership positions. Mm -hmm. Let, Let them, them go, through the, go through the process. Let them get to understand that, okay, this is how it works from the grounds. So Before mentorship, um, grooming, training, everything is important. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, if, if you don't get it right, mm -hmm. I mean, you're you going to get right. it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> you're going to get it wrong <laughs> at, the at the top. And yeah. it's very scary. Okay. And uh, we've seen a lot of business collapsing, in, even in Ghana, mm -hmm. where we've seen f uh, the founder's children handling them at the forefront, mm -hmm. and you, ne you never hear of them handling any branch manager position. But at, all of a sudden, they are CEO, CEO yeah. of the company. Yeah, and this, at, this, at, this, at the next CEO moment, yeah, at, at the next moment, it's a very, it's a very uh, crucial thing. I mean, it's something we really need to make people understand. That it's, exactly. not, it's not a fancy thing. I'm the boss. Yeah, the I'm, I'm the boss of. And, and one of the problems of, with these people is that the reason why, one of the, one of the reasons why they fail is the fact that they are not good with people. Mm -hmm. You know, you are into solve problems for people. If you are not good with people, you cannot do anything good for people. Exactly. And that is where the business starts to fail. Because mm -hmm. that moment, you've lost connection with your audience, mm -hmm. your market. Your market are not machines. They are human beings. Mm -hmm. You understand me? So once you are bad with people, you cannot be good as a business person. And yes, um, I believe that entrepreneurs are great. It's just like greatness. Mm -hmm. um, you, 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 fine, you may be born, born into in royalty. Made. But yeah, some may be born. But I, I believe that the, 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 the really... S um, strong ones, like resilient ones, are made. They are people that have grown into the process. Okay. They've been through the process, and then it, the process makes them mm -hmm. a great entrepreneur. Okay, yeah, that, that's beautiful. Let, let's go to the last part of a mm -hmm. segment where we are looking at sustainable mm -hmm. businesses. Mm -hmm. I, I I can name or list the number of young people who started and they are nowhere to be yeah. found because of the fact that I mean, you you share your experience, mm -hmm. the the kind of hardship or the the the, the limited resources you have to work yeah. with. Not everybody can go through the yeah, process because they want to be seen flashy with all the cars and yeah. money and everything. <laughs> How do we ensure, and I don't want us to go with the government, um, the government, government, government. As, as a young person, how will I be able to make sure that I create a business and the business is sustainable to even employ others? Let me start with, with Prince. Well, I mean, starting a business, first of all, is like, I mean, I always keep saying that it's an experience. Mm. Um, but in starting a business, you need to have a vision. Mm -hmm. And we tend to see a lot of businesses in Ghana not surviving beyond five years, beyond 10 years. Mm -hmm. And we have to ask ourselves why. I mean, even though it's beyond government, we, we need to f like really phantom the vision. Mm -hmm. What is the vision of the company? Because that's what carries the company wherever it to go. Mm -hmm. But you can see that there are a lot of businesses in Ghana that do not have a vision. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of young people who are starting businesses because they are passionate about it, but they don't have any vision for it. So for us as young people, in starting a business, we should try and table in the next five years, in the next ten years, where do we want to go? But it's not only about having a dream by having a vision. Mm -hmm. It's also about doing the work. And you have to come to terms with it that doing the work is not going to be smooth it's going to be very rough. Mm -hmm. And I like what Derek said, that uh, starting a business like giving birth to a baby, where you know that definitely the baby will fall sick. Mm -hmm. But you tend to see people, whenever their businesses are in shambles or their business are experiencing some small problem, then they tend to give up. Okay. And that is what really affects other businesses growing beyond even their vision or growing beyond mm -hmm. how long they want to survive. So for us as young people, uh, I always tell people that it's very good and we are very blessed 
that as young people, we have come to this term where we know about how to start business or how to even run business. Mm -hmm. It's not even just that maybe we'll run business for the rest of our lives. It's possible that sometimes we just need it to go and run somebody else's business. Because I see a lot of young people in Ghana now who have business, who, are, who have run businesses and are giving up sometimes for the good reason, sometimes also mostly for the bad reason. And, and as, as I said earlier on, it's not just about starting a business, but it's about gaining experience. Mm -hmm. Because you have to know that we want, we, want to, we want to have thought leaders on business and entrepreneurship in the country. But how are we going to get those people? Is the people that have gone through the mill. Is the people who have, who have failed have started again. Is the people who have failed and have stopped or have given up. Mm -hmm. I, I, I recently shared a story of uh, my first field business. I want to start a barbering shop mm -hmm. uh, back in my village. I want to employ young people. I had this big idea. Mm -hmm. I mean, like in the next two years, I will, will open shops all over because <laughs> we make a lot of money. Mm -hmm. But I came to tell them that, no, I didn't have things in place to really even keep my dream going. Mm -hmm. I didn't have a team that would take me forward. I didn't have money that I'm sure that, okay, even if something fails, I mean, I'll be able to, and we realized that even after setting up the whole business, putting up the structure and everything, mm -hmm. there was nobody that we could even employ, and nobody was willing to work with us. <laughs> and for me, it was not that, just, just that we gave up on our business. Mm -hmm. For me, I realized that it was also a good moment for me to learn, so that I can be able to get handle other businesses, businesses very well. Great. Thank you so much. Prince, let me, let me take over. Derek. Uh, Derek yeah. Let me take over. Yeah, so um, I think um, building a sustainable business, mm -hmm. right? Yes, um, one, like Prince said, the vision is important. So that's well said. And the second thing is uh, I believe in corporate culture. Mm -hmm. You know, a corporate culture. A culture is the is is a way of life. Yeah. Okay. Is the reason why you become what you become, mm -hmm. and you get what you get. Because if you keep doing what you always do, you keep getting what you always get. And that is one of the things that uh, most startups do not think about. That what is my culture? How do I respond to emails? Mm -hmm. How do I respond to telephone calls? How do I? How do the people that work with me represent the company? Mm -hmm. Do they understand what we are about? Do they understand the meaning of our logo? Do they understand the meaning of our colors? Do they know why we say cheers? Mm -hmm. Do they know why we say no? Mm -hmm. You understand me? And these are the, it's, it's like a, it, the team. You know, if, if it's going to be sustainable, I always use God as a best example. Mm -hmm. Like I said, he, there's a man that created the world in six days and now has over 7.5 billion people working for him. What did he do? He duplicated himself in us. So we have been made like him. Mm -hmm. We are creators just like the creator. Mm -hmm. And that is one of the principles of sustainability. That don't, it's, it's not, the vision is not just for you. When the vision is just for you, then you're not in a path of sustainability. Sure. Then when you die or when you leave the, the scene, dies also. exactly, it, things, things slow down. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's, it's powerful that you are not in the country and your company is still running, clients are still coming in as though you are here. Mm -hmm. You understand me? And that should be the goal of every startup entrepreneur. That how do this keep running? even in my absence. Mm -hmm. Would this still make sense five years from now? What is the culture that I've put in place that myself and the people that I work with would grow into? Because just like the role of the CEO, mm -hmm. a corporate culture is not just adhered to, mm -hmm. it is grown into. into. It okay. takes time, people grow into it, and then it grows into the people. Right. And why do teams win? Why do teams lose? Mm -hmm. Because of the culture, because of the way they do things. So once there's a way that, a structured way of doing things, then you know that you are positioning your company on the way of sustainability. And the second thing, um, getting ready for sustainability, you have to look at even your, aside your team, your clients. because. Mm -hmm. The kind of clients you render services to or you sell to will determine whether you are going to be here for the rest of the uh, for the rest of the, the year or the rest yes, of the years the ahead of you. Okay. You understand me? So you have the power to choose. And I always make people understand that there is a natural power we have. Mm -hmm. The power to decide what we want, when we want it, how we want it, and who Where? we want it with. Mm -hmm. You understand me? So that natural power must be applied in, in your business here, even as on, you are on the path of sustainability, that you have the power to decide what product am I, what product am I bringing out, mm -hmm. when am I releasing it, when is the right time, who is this meant for? Because one of the things that is also killing business is the fact that people are targeting the wrong people for their products and services. So Not make, everybody on social media is important. for you. Exactly. You understand me? Mm -hmm. What is my target market demographics? What does my potential customer look like? Mm -hmm. What What is his, his or her possible name?
him? Where would he be hanging out on a Friday night? Where, where would he be spending more time on social media, Facebook or Instagram? If it's a makeup business, your customer is on Instagram. Mm -hmm. If it's a product you're selling, people are on Facebook. You understand me? So you have to get your market right because that is one of the key drivers of sustainability. Mm -hmm. The reason why you be sustainable is when you are needed. Why will you be needed? When you are relevant. Mm -hmm. Why will you be relevant? Because you set a need for a certain targeted customer range. Do you understand me? And just like ice cream, not everybody likes ice cream. So not everybody's going to like what you do. And sometimes people need time to accept you. So it may take a year, two, or three. You, don't, you just don't give up. It's like a relationship. Mm -hmm. You have to take time to know the person. So it's just like that. People need to take time. Or they need some time to have a connection with, with your you. business. Because the reason why somebody will buy a Chanel bag costing $25,000 over a locally manufactured bag is because of their perception, because of the connection they have with the product. That mm -hmm. I want to have the feeling of knowing that I have a Chanel bag. It's customer loyalty, and it's, it's brewed from perception. Mm -hmm. You understand me? So also, now we come to the matter of perception. If you're going to be sustainable, what is the idea people would have about you? Okay. You have to define that idea. Mm -hmm. You have the power to define your brand. Because what you say your brand is becomes your brand, just like life. What the meaning you give your life becomes your life. So the meaning you give your business becomes your that business. Becomes your image as well. Exactly. Thank you so much. Let me take a final one. Very quick one. Um, Oh, okay, so um, as young people, for me, I'll keep on saying it again, that experience is very important. Mm -hmm. Don't be afraid of starting. And when, when is it necessary for you to give up to, I mean, try and wait and see if whether it's for the good or it's for the bad. And I mean, we have a lot of things that we have to share with the future. And mm -hmm. we have a lot of things that we cannot give us excuse because we've not done. Mm -hmm. This is a task. For us, we are young. We have the energy. We have the time. We have the resources now to be able to make, make mistakes the and correct them. Exactly, and to make the best out of whatever we do. If we are going to commit mistakes, we are going to fail, we are going to succeed. Mm -hmm. And I want young people to have story. If you grow up one day, what story are you going to tell people? Sure. So I see a lot of young people trying to, I mean, not start anything at all because they are afraid that something, something, something might happen. But I think that we all need a story so that one day, we can look back and tell ourselves that we've done well or we've not done well. So as young people, not give up and let's just keep on doing uh, what we are passionate about. And I mean, even though we know that passion alone will not take us there, so we add more things passion to it. Passion is a basic thing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me take you. Yes. So um, final words, uh, I'll look into the camera so I'll talk to them directly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so final words to everyone, I, I mean, I'll go back to the basics, okay? 